Light and Truth, in December 1832, three months after the priesthood revelation, Joseph received a lengthy, conglomerate revelation that took two days to complete, begun during a meeting in the translation room above the Whitney store in one of the three rooms where the Smiths were living. It broke off about nine o'clock. The minutes report that the revelation not being finished the conference adjourned till tomorrow morning nine o'clock a.m. The next day, Joseph proceeded to receive the residue of the above revelation. When he mailed it to William Phelps in Missouri, Joseph called it the olive leaf which we have plucked from the tree of paradise. Like other revelations, the olive leaf moves from subject to subject. Nothing in 19th century literature resembles it. The writings of Swedenborg come closest, but they were much less concerned with millenarian events. The olive leaf runs from the cosmological to the practical, from a description of angels blowing their trumpets to instructions for starting a school. Yet the pieces blend together into a cohesive compound of cosmology and eschatology united by the attempt to link the quotidian world of the now to the world beyond. The revelation offers sketches of the order of heaven, reprises the three degrees of glory, delivers a discourse on divine law, offers a summary of the meta-history of the end times and then brings it all to bear on what the saints should do now. Among the provocative passages in the olive leaf is a brief metaphysical discussion of light and matter. Joseph's earlier revelations had employed the light metaphor in the usual sense of Christ lighting the way to salvation. The passage in the olive leaf extended the metaphor into a physical description of the universe. Christ, the revelation explains using a phrase from the Gospel of John, is in all, and through all things, the light of truth. This is the light of Christ, as also he is in the sun, and the light of the sun, and the power thereof by which it was made, as also he is in the moon, and is the light of the moon, and the power thereof by which it was made, as also the light of the stars, and the power thereof by which they were made, and the earth also, and the power thereof, even the earth upon which you stand, and the light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God, to fill the immensity of space. The light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God, who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. The radiant energy proceeding from the presence of God enters every particle of the universe, giving life and intelligence to all existence. The elders sitting in the Whitney's storage room were told that if your eye be single to my glory, your whole bodies shall be filled with light, and there shall be no darkness in you, and that body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. Everything was charged with divine intelligence, putting God into every leaf, every stone. The elders themselves were to be illuminated by the blazing light sustaining all existence. This conception of a divine light permeating every particle of matter could have turned Mormon theology toward nature. If the light of Christ activates both the human intellect and the natural world, a medium existed for finding God in the planets or in plants and animals. For centuries, alchemists, hermeticists, and finally Emanuel Swedenborg had pursued illumination through knowledge of nature. Hermeticists sought power over nature through divine knowledge, encapsulating their hopes for divinization in the figure of the Magus who tried to reunite with God by knowing and manipulating nature. Swedenborg believed he could find higher levels of meaning in nature by grasping the correspondence of natural objects with spiritual truths. Through nature humans could rise to the spiritual or intellectual and finally to the celestial and God. Four years after Joseph's revelation, Emerson would write in his seminal essay Nature that the noblest ministry of nature is to stand as the apparition of God. It is the organ through which the universal spirit speaks to the individual and strives to lead back the individual to it. Though Joseph's light of truth doctrine pointed that way, he did not follow the transcendentalist's path to spiritual enlightenment. A revelation in May 1833 put Christ, rather than nature, at the center of salvation. The incarnate Christ, the revelation said, received not of the fullness at the first, but received grace for grace. Eventually he received all power, both in heaven and on earth and the glory of the Father was with him, for he dwelt in him. The saints were to follow the same course. If you keep my commandments you shall receive of his fullness and be glorified in me as I am in the Father. Therefore, I say unto you, you shall receive grace for grace. The fullness promised to humans, in other words, 
was the same as the fullness bestowed on Christ, all power, both in heaven and on earth. The saints were told to follow the path of Christ toward this fullness, not to search nature for signs of divinity. The fullness theology bore some resemblance to the perfectionist theology of the revivalist Charles Finney and other contemporaries. Through the 1830s, various zealous souls asked if moral perfection was possible through the grace of Christ. By the 1840s many perfectionists concluded that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. The next step after conversion was complete sanctification, as Finney said, entire sanctification, in the sense that it was the privilege of Christians to live without known sin, was a doctrine taught in the Bible. Phoebe Palmer, a powerful Methodist preacher, thought that once faith was on the altar, unbelief was sinful. Failure to go on to perfection nullified previous regeneration. Though similar in intent, Joseph's May revelation differed from standard perfectionism in defining fullness as truth rather than holiness, returning to his earlier doctrine of light. Protestant perfectionists strained toward moral sanctification, Joseph toward a perfection of knowledge. Christ received a fullness of truth, yea, even of all truth, the revelation said. The saints were enjoined to obey and sanctify themselves, but to the end of being enlightened, he that keepeth his commandments receiveth truth and light, until he is glorified in truth, and knoweth all things. The choice of words to describe perfection gave a distinctive cast to Joseph's revelations. The perfectionist's words were holiness and sanctification. The governing words in the May revelation were truth, light, and intelligence. Joseph's revelation declared that the glory of God is intelligence, or, in other words, light and truth. To become like God, as the word fullness implied, was to grow in light and truth, to be filled with intelligence. Holiness was not an end in itself but the avenue to intelligence. One kept the commandments in order to receive truth and light. This was not the truth of science or the knowledge found in libraries, although Joseph would include these in the larger category of truth. Truth is knowledge of things as they are, and as they were, and as they are to come. Intelligence was a capacity for comprehension and insight, accounting for past present, and future, grasping the moral and spiritual meaning of things, and radiating power. The uneducated Joseph Smith used the word intelligence to describe the glory of God. That capacity for seeing and comprehending supernaturally, with the spiritual mind, as he called it, was to him the zenith of human experience. Joseph combined words, truth, light, intelligence, to encompass his vision, but words still fell short. He was caught in the narrow prison of a crooked and broken language, as he had complained to Phelps. In the May 1833 revelation, he recorded pointed aphorisms without elaboration, as if to point at the truth without fully explaining it. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence, or the light of truth was not created or made, neither indeed can be. All truth is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it, to act for itself, as all intelligence also otherwise there is no existence. Behold here is the agency of man, and here is the condemnation of man because that which was from the beginning is plainly manifest unto them, and they receive not the light. And every man whose spirit receiveth not the light, is under condemnation, for man is spirit. The elements are eternal, and spirit and element, inseparably connected, receiveth a fullness of joy, and when separated, man cannot receive a fullness of joy. The exact meaning of the passage is elusive, and interpretations differ. What does it mean that intelligence, or the light of truth was not created or made? Is intelligence an independent principle like a law of nature, or does intelligence refer to individual human intelligences? The implication seems to be that man himself is eternal. The revelation states that Christ was in the beginning with the Father, and so were the saints, ye were also in the beginning with the Father. This seems to be saying that Christ's spirit, and the spirit of each human, went back to the same beginning. A few Protestant theologians had speculated that the human spirit was created at the same time as the rest of the universe, but these passages of Joseph's imply that spirits existed before the earth, in the beginning when God and Christ conceived the universe. The revelation states that the elements are eternal. Was individual intelligence eternal too? The revelation suggests more than it precisely defines. In later years, Joseph would elaborate these hints into a doctrine of the free intelligence. Human beings in their essence were uncreated intelligences as eternal as God, 
and so radically free. In choosing the word intelligence to characterize this primal individual, Joseph invited comparison to the Enlightenment conception of the autonomous, reasoning individual. The individual, as conceived by Enlightenment thinkers, was autonomous because he or she possessed reason and therefore could choose. The individual had the right to consent to government, as the Declaration of Independence insisted, and to worship as he or she chose. In Enlightenment religion, even God respected reason. For people to believe, they had to have reasons. In one variety of Enlightenment religion, miracles like the parting of the Red Sea provided a reason for belief, in another, creation itself was the greatest miracle and the evidence that God existed. Given one or another form of proof, the reasoning individual could believe and worship. Like the autonomous, reasoning individual, Joseph's free intelligence had powers of mind. As the word intelligence implied, its great capacity was to grasp truth. But by using the word intelligence rather than reason to characterize this being, Joseph's revelations bound the free intelligence to God rather than setting it free to reason for itself. For God was the source of light and truth, and his light and truth were to be gained only by obedience. The idea of free intelligence combined the moral being of the Bible with the reasoning individual of the Enlightenment. In Joseph's revelations, truth could not be discovered in rebellion and wickedness. That wicked one cometh and taketh away light and truth, through disobedience. The test of one's humanity was not whether one would abide by the independent dictates of one's own reason, in accord with the Enlightenment ideal, but whether one would accept the light coming from God. By the time of the May 1833 revelation, a variety of meanings clustered around the idea of exaltation. The vision had introduced the term fullness into the conception of celestial life. The revelation said the saints would inherit a fullness of God's glory. All that the Father had would be theirs. The texts put no limits on the extent of this fullness. The revelation on priesthood said that all that my Father hath shall be given unto him. These passages altered the idea of salvation from making peace with God to becoming like God. The words salvation and exaltation contained a world of difference. One implied escape, from sin or hell or Satan, and 1830's exaltation also meant intelligence, equated by the revelations with light and truth. In a sense, the central purpose of life was to absorb light and truth, the basis of judgment. Rejecting light was the great error. Living in darkness meant living on the side of evil. Light and truth forsaketh that evil one. Since the glory of God was intelligence, growing in intelligence was progress in godliness. Later in Norvu, Joseph would use the word intelligence as a name for the primal essence of the human spirit, and would elaborate the history of God and the free intelligences. In a characteristic transition, the concluding verses of the May Revelation descend from the heavens into the everyday concerns of Joseph and his friends. The Lord scolds them for not keeping order in their families. Joseph is told, you have not kept the commandments and must needs stand rebuked before the Lord. Sidney Rigdon and Newell Whitney are admonished for not keeping better track of their children. Ordinary daily concerns mingle with the grand structure of the universe. While taking care of their children, it was implied, the saints could be growing in glory and intelligence. The School of the Prophets, the practical point of the olive leaf revelation of December 1832 was the organization of a school for training the elders for the next spring's missionary work. They were to study doctrine history, politics, and more, in classes with instructors and books. Besides suggesting a curriculum and school regulations, the revelation set the school in a broad framework of history and metaphysics that focused the powers of heaven on the elders at their studies. The school has been represented as an early adult education effort, but the name the School of the Prophets indicated a higher purpose, by alluding to the bands of prophets who received instruction under Samuel, Elijah, and Elisha. It implied preparation for a holy work. Missionaries had been going into the field without instruction, in the school, they were to teach one another the doctrine of the kingdom, and virtually everything else things both in heaven, and in earth, and under the earth, things which have been, things which are, things which must shortly come to pass. They were to study languages, tongues and people and wars and the perplexities of the nations. There seems to have been no limit on the knowledge needed to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. The olive leaf placed as much emphasis on spiritual preparation as on subject matter. Sanctify yourselves, yea, purify your hearts, and cleanse your hands and your feet before me, that I may make you clean.
They were told to be careful about idle thoughts and excessive laughter. They were to cease to be idle and stop sleeping longer than was needful. Lustful desires, pride and light-mindedness, and all wicked doings had to be abandoned. The school required spiritual and a moral discipline along with study out of the best books. Learning and sanctification went together. Little was said about engaging a teacher. The pupils were to instruct one another, pooling their knowledge taking care that only one speak at a time while all listened that all may be edified of all, and that every man may have an equal privilege. The revelation envisioned egalitarian rather than authoritarian instruction. To that end, the revelations concluded with instructions on how to mold the elders into a brotherhood. Above all things, clothe yourselves with the bond of charity, they were told, and, to give that injunction form. A ritual was established for welding the students together. The president was to enter the schoolroom first and pray. As the students came in, he was to greet them with uplifted hand and the words Art thou a brother or brethren? I salute you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in token, or remembrance of the everlasting covenant, in which covenant I receive you to fellowship in a determination that is fixed, immovable and unchangeable, to be your friend and brother through the grace of God in the bonds of love. The brethren in turn were to lift up their hands and repeat the covenant or say Amen. The school of the prophets tells more about the desired texture of Joseph's holy society than anything he had done thus far, and more of what he was up against. The directions to quell excessive laughter and all light-mindedness implicitly reflect the rough-hewn characters who had joined him in the great cause. Few were polished, and he would never teach them gentility, but he wanted order, peace and virtue. One verse said to organize a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. That succession of words captured his hopes for the whole society he was attempting to create. Zion was to be orderly, godly, and brotherly. At the center was learning, about God, creation, and the world. One verse in the olive leaf was repeated later in other of Joseph's scriptures. Seek ye diligently and teach one another words of wisdom, yea, seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom, seek learning even by study, and also by faith. The school of the prophets was the prototype for the good society, a fraternity united by study and faith. It met again in 1834-35 and 1835-36, then the school fell into abeyance for decades until revived periodically by Brigham Young and John Taylor. Perhaps not surprisingly for the 1830s, women were conspicuously absent. It was a decade before they were formally included in the holy sodality. The perfection Joseph sought was physical as much as spiritual. The September priesthood revelation had said priesthood holders would be sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of their bodies. A few months later, a revelation promised that their bodies would be filled with light. To refine their bodies, a revelation received a month after the school of the prophets began advised the men to give up tobacco and alcohol. During the conferences, they had smoked and chewed tobacco. Emma may have objected to the stains on the floor and the smell in the room and asked Joseph to do something about it. If so, she was not the only one disgusted by tobacco chewers. Francis Trollope, the British traveller, castigated American men for soiling the carpet and dirtying the ladies' long skirts with their spitting. The Revelation counseled a diet of wholesome herbs, fruits and grains, and spare use of meat. Hot drinks, later interpreted to mean tea and coffee, were eschewed. All who conformed were promised health in their navel, and marrow to their bones. Their bodies would be vigorous and their minds active. The word of wisdom, as the Revelation was later called came at a time when temperance and food reforms were flourishing in the United States. In 1835, Sylvester Graham lectured in New York and Philadelphia against tobacco, tea, coffee, and alcohol, advocating a diet based on whole grains. Graham presented his teachings as science. Joseph linked his version of reform to the doctrines of exaltation, giving dietary counsel a scriptural basis. Quoting Isaiah, the revelation promised the observant they will run and not be weary and shall walk and not faint, but also, they would find wisdom and great treasure of knowledge. As in ancient Israel, treatment of the body was combined with ministration to the spirit. The saints differed over how rigorously to apply the word of wisdom. 
some were inclined to make exact compliance a requirement of membership, others were more relaxed. Joseph drank tea and a glass of wine from time to time. It was left to a late generation of saints to turn the principle with a promise into a measuring rod of obedience. The underlying idea of the word of wisdom was not to escape the physical, as hermetic and mystical philosophies taught, but to preserve and purify the flesh. Joseph's religion made the body essential to human fulfillment and godliness. The exaltation revelations had told the saints that the spirit and the body is the soul of man, and only when joined eternally could a person receive a fullness of joy. When separated, man cannot receive a fullness of joy. Joseph exalted the body rather than seeking to free the spirit from the flesh. Dead souls considered the long absence of their spirits from their bodies to be a bondage. The highest reward for a worthy spirit, the olive leaf had said, was to receive a natural body. Even God and angels, Joseph would later teach, had bodies of flesh and bone. The school of the prophets added bodily discipline to the student's spiritual purification. Minutes were not kept after the initial meetings, but the students later recalled the routine. They met at the Whitney store early in the morning and continued until late in the afternoon, often fasting through the day. New members were added to the original class of 14 until the number rose as high as 25. In the school's first term in the winter of 1833, English grammar, taught by Orson Hyde, was the chief subject under discussion a reflection on the educations of the pupils. Joseph was told to become acquainted with all good books, and with languages, tongues and people, and the curriculum of the school doubtless was to follow along the same lines. It was to provide all the training needed for the immense task of conveying the gospel to the world. A spiritual outburst on January 22, 1833 foreshadowed what lay ahead for the school of the prophets. A conference was suddenly visited with the gift of tongues. Joseph spoke in another tongue, followed by Zebedee Coltrane and William Smith, and finally all the elders, along with several of the members of the church both male and female. Much speaking and praying all in tongues occupied the conference before adjournment at a late hour. The next day, the men came together again and started speaking praying and singing, all done in tongues. Lucy Smith remembered hearing of the spiritual outpouring while she was baking bread. She dropped her work and rushed to join the meeting. Joseph loved these times when the Spirit enveloped the saints in long absent blessings, proof that New Testament religion had returned. In another return to primitive Christianity, the brethren began the washing of feet. The elders washed their own feet, and then Joseph knelt before each one and washed. When he came to his father, Joseph Jr., asked for a blessing and was promised he should continue in the priest's office until Christ should come. After he had passed around the circle, Joseph's feet were washed by his friend and counselor Frederick G. Williams as a token of the latter's determination to stand by Joseph in life or in death. Joseph told the brethren the washing had made them clean from the blood of this generation. Having been cleansed and sealed up to eternal life, they were to sin no more or Satan would buffet them. Joseph wanted these rough men packed into a tiny room over the Whitney store to understand they could be pure and holy. He was convinced that their tawdry appearance and ragged manners did not disqualify them for godliness. In January, two of the students wrote to the Missouri church that the Lord has commanded us to purify ourselves to wash our hands and our feet that he may testify to his Father and our Father to his God and our God that we are clean from the blood of this generation. The smallest and weakest among us, Joseph told his people, shall be powerful and mighty. In April 1833, the school disbanded, and the elders went out again to proclaim the gospel. 11. Cities of Zion, 1833, let them importunate the feet of the judge, and if he heed them not, let them importunate the feet of the governor, and if the governor heed them not, let them importunate the feet of the president and if the president heed them not, then will the Lord arise and come forth out of his hiding place, and in his fury vex the nation. Doctrine and Covenants 1835, 97 hours 12 minutes, the school of the prophets was a huge success, in spite of the occasional arguments during the meetings. When the members finally dispersed in April 1833 to attend to spring work, the two dozen students had received their first training in preaching the gospel. Earlier missionaries had taught from their own experience, full of notions and whims, as David Whitmer put it. No one had summarized the message or defined the key doctrines. After listening to Joseph and comparing notes for three months, 
the missionaries must have come closer to a unified message. The school's meetings through the winter of 1832-33 were held in the crowded translating room above the Whitney store. No other meeting space was available in Kirtland. On Sundays the 150 or so church members crowded into private houses or small rented spaces. Characteristically nonchalant about weekly congregational worship, Joseph failed to mention regular Sunday worship in his history much less an adequate meeting space, until late 1833. Perhaps his own meeting-free childhood kept him from feeling the need. Converts from more conventional Christian backgrounds, however, looked for a solution. In March, Jared Carter raised $30 to build a meeting place, prompting discussion about frame versus log construction, but by then, more ambitious plans were maturing in Joseph's mind. He was thinking of a structure that would solve the space difficulties in a grand manner. Temple, the first hints of a great building had been given months before in December 1832 in the revelation on the School of the Prophets, when the saints were told to establish a house of God. The name could have referred to a meeting house with the chapel serving as a classroom, but that was not Joseph's intention. He envisioned a larger, more ambitious building a curious edifice that he called a temple. The word temple had no single meaning for Americans. Its application to buildings and churches of every kind emptied the word of any distinctive architectural significance. James Fenimore Cooper spoke of the Hudson River mansions as temples sitting on their mountaintops. Greek temples, epitomizing high architectural beauty for this generation, were widely imitated in American banks and churches, and Greek revival influences can be seen in the pilasters window trim, and columns in the Kirtland Temple too. But Joseph's idea of a temple did not come from classical civilization, he omitted Greece and Rome entirely from his many recapitulations of world history. He was familiar with masons who met in buildings called temples, but Freemasonry was not an attractive model in the aftermath of anti-Masonic political campaigns, and Masonic temples were non-existent in areas where Joseph lived. Country masons conducted their rituals in the upper rooms of taverns that weren't built to be temples. It is not likely that Joseph ever saw a Masonic temple before he began building in Kirtland. Not only did he lack models, temples were foreign to the low church Protestants he was familiar with from childhood. Temples were associated with the animal sacrifice of the obsolete Mosaic law. Presbyterians and the Methodists might casually refer to their meeting houses as temples but only to add a little dignity to ordinary chapels. Joseph turned quite naturally to the Bible for inspiration. In the Book of Mormon, Nephi built a temple after the manner of the Temple of Solomon. Chica County's Chardon Spectator reported that the Mormons contemplated erecting a building of stone on a magnificent plan, to be called, after the one erected by King Solomon, the Temple. The Kirtland Temple did not resemble the Temple of Solomon, it had the outward appearance of a large, vaguely neoclassical meeting house. But the pair of auditoriums, one on top of the other, were called inner courts, suggesting biblical antecedents. By seizing upon the temple rather than the church for a center of worship, Joseph put aside Christian tradition in favor of ancient Israel. During the course of his life, he never built a standard meeting house, even in Nauvoo, where the Mormon population exceeded 10,000. Although Sunday services were held regularly, the Nauvoo saints met in houses, public buildings, and an outdoor bowery. Wherever Joseph lived, in Kirtland, Independence, Far West, or Nauvoo, his architectural imagination focused on temples. Where he did not build a temple, he planned one. Having Christianized the Hebrew prophets in the Book of Moses and the Book of Mormon, he turned to the Old Testament for inspiration. Gathering Israel to temples was in keeping with the Old Testament character of the entire Zion project. Joseph had only vague ideas about the purpose of the temple when the revelations first mentioned the idea. In the Book of Mormon the idea of worshipping in temples appears only dimly. After the church's organization, temple first came up in a revelation about Christ appearing, I will suddenly come to my temple, Joseph was told in late 1830. Otherwise, Temples had no purpose when a site was designated for one at the center of the city of Zion in 1831. Temples at first were an empty form, awaiting content. By spring 1833, however, when plans were laid for the Kirtland Temple, its value as an all-purpose church building had become evident. The main floor was for worship services, the second floor would house the School of the Prophets, and the attic would contain offices for the presidency of the church. 
along with the practical purposes, the idea of the temple as a holy place and dwelling for God was not forgotten. In the temple, the long-awaited endowment of power was to take place. Joseph hoped his saints would face God as Moses' people never could. At the completion of Solomon's temple, God came in a cloud of glory. A fall 1832 revelation said that when the Kirtland temple was finished, a cloud shall rest upon it, which cloud shall be even the glory of the Lord. In May they were promised my glory shall be thee, and my presence shall be there. Plans moved ahead speedily. Frederick G. Williams was appointed to supervise the brick making, until September 1833, when a switch to stone facing led to quarrying just south of Kirtland. A committee to purchase land agreed to pay $5,000 for the Peter French farm and sited the temple on the bluffs overlooking Kirtland Flats and the Chagrin Valley. In May, a revelation showed the dimensions of the temple's inner court, 55 by 65 feet, a cavernous space. The same revelation called for a second temple, never built, of exactly the same dimensions, to serve as a printing office. On June 1, a building committee of Hiram Smith, Reynolds Cahoon, and Jared Carter began a subscription list among the branches. To raise funds, the temple was presented as a place for preparing the elders to go out among the Gentiles for the last time. Everyone was to contribute. Economically, the temple was a disaster. The temple diverted funds needed for the city of Zion to a huge costly building project. Construction artificially boosted the Kirtland economy for a time and then knocked out the props when the temple was completed. The project was far out of proportion to the church's pitiful resources. Joseph Smith went deeply into debt and was hounded by his creditors ever after. But the economic realities gave Joseph no pause. In his determination to follow his inspiration, he extended himself and the church far beyond their capacity. Beginning in Kirtland, temples became an obsession. For the rest of his life, no matter the cost of the temple to himself and his people, he made plans, raised money, mobilized workers, and required sacrifice. A revelation told Joseph in June 1833, Let it be built after the manner which I shall show unto three of you. Years later, Truman Angel, who supervised construction in Kirtland, said that plans for the Kirtland temple came to Joseph, Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams in a joint revelation. These three, constituting the first presidency, saw the exterior from a distance and then looked inside the building. From then on, they judged the actual construction by its conformity to this image. Joseph gave no account of receiving the plans in vision, but a revelation said the temple was to be built after the manner of God, not the world. While the exterior gave the impression of a large New England neoclassical church with Gothic windows, the interior was Joseph's own. The inside stacked two meeting spaces, the lower and upper courts, on top of one another. These assembly rooms had the uncommon feature of two front walls. A set of pulpits stood on both the west and the east walls. Movable chairs in pews allowed hearers to rotate when addressed by speakers from opposite pulpits. In addition to that peculiarity, the pulpits at each end ascended in four levels, each assigned to particular priesthood offices exhibiting the hierarchical structure of the priesthood. On the west wall was the Melchizedek, or higher, priesthood. A top bank of pulpits was for the first presidency, below them was another for the three members of the bishopric, the next down for the high priests, with the elders at the bottom. On the opposite wall, the Aaronic, or lesser, priesthood was similarly divided into four levels with the presidency of the Aaronic priesthood on top, and the priests, teachers, and deacons in order below. The main court on the first floor could be divided into temporary rooms by lowering curtains with a system of pulleys and ropes, just as veils divided the Temple of Solomon. Joseph was apparently fascinated by separate compartments. He believed that the body of the church functioned best in quorums, the subdivisions of the two priesthoods, suggesting a segmented conception of ecclesiastical society, more Catholic than Protestant. Groundbreaking began June 5th. 1833. Members dug a trench in a wheat field on the Peter French farm, and hauled stone from the quarry for the foundation. By July 23, the cornerstones were in place. From then on, every member was asked to contribute funds or labor. One day in seven was the rule for labor. On June 25, Joseph sent plans for a similar temple to Missouri, along with a letter of instructions and answers to questions. The Missouri temple was to have a simple shed-like exterior 
but the interior had the same plan as Kirtland's. The fledgling church with only a few thousand members planned for two large temples for studying good books and receiving revelations from God. City plans, construction of a temple in Independence as well as in Kirtland added to the complexity of overseeing two Mormon centers. During the early 1830s, Joseph had managed affairs in Zion from a distance, even though the numbers in Missouri in June 1833 approached 800 while many few lived in Kirtland. The long-distance government rarely worked well. The letters are a record of turbulent feelings. Joseph usually wrote Phelps, the newspaper editor, rather than Bishop Partridge, the man in charge of dividing properties in Zion. Joseph blamed the leadership in Zion for not making the consecrated properties system work. He also resented the criticism and innuendos in letters coming from Zion. Hiram Smith and Orson Hyde referred to charges against Joseph for seeking after monarchal power and authority. Joseph, who disliked criticism of any kind, told Phelps we have the satisfaction of knowing that the Lord approves of us. Tensions with Zion relaxed, however. After Hiram and Hyde wrote a conciliatory letter to Missouri in January 1833, one can imagine Hiram, the wise elder brother, protecting Joseph from his own impulsive nature. Hiram was reason and sympathy where Joseph was will and energy. In February, the Missouri leaders wrote a conciliatory reply that the Kirtland Council found satisfactory. Joseph toned down his writing and expressed his understanding of the strain of much business. A revelation noted that the brethren in Zion begin to repent and the angels rejoice over them. By late June, Joseph could reveal his plan for Zion, confident the saints that could be trusted to carry it forward. With the design for the temple, Joseph included a plat for the city of Zion, a layout for an entire city with temples at the center. In the plat's margins, the draftsman, Frederick G. Williams, described Zion's major features. The city was to occupy one square mile the size of the sections being laid out in the West by the United States government. An amended plan expanded the size to a mile and a half square. Ten-acre blocks, divided into half-acre house lots, surrounded public squares at the center. City planning, while unusual for a minister, was common for utopian and religious visionaries. In many respects, the Zion format, with its square blocks and central squares, resembled plans devised by other town founders in these years. But the Zion plan had singular features. Joseph's house lots were set at right angles on alternate blocks. On one block the long, narrow lots fronted the east and west sides of the block. On the next block, the lots faced north and south. Consequently, houses did not look across the street at other house fronts, but into the long back gardens of the lots across the street. Walking down a street, Residents would see house fronts on one side and back gardens on the other. The most unusual aspect was the three public squares at the center with 24 temples, 12 to a block, standing on two of these squares. According to the description, the temples would serve as houses of worship, schools, etc. One can imagine a town hall, a courthouse, and perhaps stores among the temples, much like the public buildings around the green in a New England town. But the names assigned to the temples do not support this simple reading. The temples were grouped into threes and assigned to priesthood quorums, the organizations of the various levels of priesthood. One group was to be called House of the Lord for the Presidency of the High and the Most Holy Priesthood after the Order of Melchizedek, which was after the Order of the Son of God. Another was the Sacred Apostolic Repository for the use of the bishops, and still another group the House of the Lord for the Elders of Zion, an ensign to the nations. And so on down to House of the Lord for the Deacons in Zion, helps in governments. Those elaborate titles do not relate to any standard functions of public buildings. Stores lined the main streets of most American towns surrounding a courthouse or jail at the center. But neither commerce nor civil government is given architectural form in the city of Zion. Everything is subsumed under priesthood quorums, which presumably absorbed all other institutions. The plan specified that underneath must be written on each house, Holiness to the Lord. The unusual temple names transformed a standard plat into a plan for a holy city. The presence of temples and the absence of ordinary civic buildings suggest a higher purpose. Speaking of the United States as a whole, Gary Wills has noted there is no more defining note to our history than the total absence of a sacred city in our myths. The only exception, he noted, is the Mormon's temple, fetched, like Jerusalem's, from heaven. 
the American landscape dispersed religious energy widely through the society into thousands of churches, Joseph City Platt concentrated holiness in one place, in a sacred city and its temple, where religion absorbed everything. However culturally anomalous, the city of Zion occupied a central place in Joseph Smith's design for world renewal. He conceived the world as a vast funnel with the city at the vortex and the temple at the center of the city. Converts across the globe would be attracted to this central point to acquire knowledge and power for preaching the gospel. Trained and empowered in the temple. The missionary force would go back into the world and collect Israel from every corner of the earth. The city, the temple, and the world, existed in dynamic relationship. Missionaries flowed out of the city and converts poured back in. The exchange would redeem the world in the last days. Joseph's plot has been explained as a remodeled New England town carried over from his childhood, and the city is an effort to recover order and peace in a world being shattered by industrialization. But that gloss fails to note that the plans called for a population of 15,000 to 20,000 people, a city, not a town. Only seven cities in the United States in 1830 had more than 25,000 inhabitants and only 16 had populations between 10,000 and 25,000. St. Louis had around 10,000. Zion would have dwarfed every city west of the Mississippi. Moreover, the straight streets, square blocks, and public squares followed an urban aesthetic rather than the casual layouts of New England villages. Joseph wanted everyone, including farmers with lands outside the plotted area, to live in a city. Contrary to his own upbringing, he would urbanize society. As the explanation said, when this square is thus laid off and supplied lay off another in the same way and so fill up the world in these last days and let every man live in the city for this is the city of Zion. Zion was to be the capital, but Kirtland was to be a city too, implying an expandable network of urban places, with Zion first among many. People could gather to any of these cities, not to Zion alone. Joseph thought of the church as an assemblage of cities, rather than a scattering of parishes and congregations. New converts met in branches, but only temporarily until they could gather to a city. When Joseph formed parishes in Norvu, he called them wards the term used for urban political divisions. Joseph called this entire process the work, meaning the work of the Lord. Building cities was like building temples. Wherever Joseph lived, he prepared a blat. Hounded out of Kirtland, he planned Far West, Missouri. After Far West, Norvu was next, the only city he came near to completing. After Joseph's death, Mormons in the Mountain West based the scores of towns they founded on the original plan for Zion. Only in the New World could such a scheme have been conceived, much less carried out. In the more tightly packed societies of the Old World, only kings and nobles dreamed of founding new towns, while in the United States, speculators laid out hundreds of towns on the millions of acres stretching westward from the edges of settlement. The open landscape unleashed Joseph's imagination. He became a developer promoting the church's land in Missouri and, later, Illinois. American conditions allowed him to move beyond the organization of a church toward the creation of a society. Rather than establishing beachheads in the form of church buildings all over the country, he took over a complete city, occupying all its space, consecrating every activity to God. The conception of a church of cities rather than a church of congregations had wide-reaching, and disastrous implications for the Mormons. Even in America, the scheme was doomed. No American community was ready for that degree of religious rejuvenation. What would happen to citizens who refused to put holiness to the Lord on their storefronts? Zion could not be forced on a settled area without meeting resistance. Church leaders could not take over city planning, require holiness, equalize property, and control politics without making enemies. Wherever the saints settled, conflict followed. In the thrall of his visions, Joseph overlooked the practical obstacles. In mid-1833, he was unprepared for the storm about to burst upon him. Having made peace with the leaders and dispatched plans for city and temple, he had high hopes for Zion. A revelation on August 2 painted a bright picture. Parley Pratt was commended for opening a school to study the scriptures. The people were told to build the temple speedily that they may be perfected in the understanding of their ministry. If they kept the temple holy, the pure in heart that shall come into it, shall see God. If the saints followed instructions, Zion shall prosper and spread herself and become very glorious. 
even the nations of the earth would say surely Zion is the city of our God. Persecution, on August 9, 1833. Oliver Cowdery arrived in Kirtland with bad news. Jackson County citizens were demanding that the Mormons leave, and, under pressure, the church leaders had agreed to go. Within six months, the saints were expelled from Jackson County with no realistic prospect of returning. Zion was suddenly abolished. Conflict had been brewing for over a year as alarmed locals watched the growing Mormon numbers. Non-Mormon citizens threw rocks and bricks at Mormon houses or burned haystacks. Mormon children began to wake up with nightmares about the mob coming. As Parley Pratt noted, the Jackson County inhabitants became jealous of our growing influence and numbers. Political demagogues were afraid we should rule the county. An unanticipated consequence of gathering was the build-up of Mormon political power. By summer 1833, the Mormons, numbering nearly a thousand, were a third of the county's population. Soon every office in the county would be at the disposal of the Mormons. John Corrill, a Mormon leader on the scene, agreed with Pratt's analysis. The settlers saw that if let alone they would in a short time become a majority, and, of course, rule the county. The revelation calling for gathering to Missouri used the word enemies to describe the current residents, and indeed they were becoming so. The Mormons spoke of the land being redeemed by its rightful inheritors. The Evening and Morning Star wrote matter-of-factly about taking possession of this country. Josiah Gregg, a merchant living in Independence, said the Mormons grew bolder in their predictions as their numbers increased. At last they became so emboldened by impunity as openly to boast of their determination to be the sole proprietors of the land of Zion. By summer 1833, the saints held over 2,400 acres of land in and around Independence and threatened a complete takeover. Opposition burst into the open in July 1833. William Phelps published an article in the Evening and Morning Star about the legal requirements for bringing free Negroes into the state and locals interpreted the description as an invitation. Phelps quickly disavowed any such intention, insisting he was actually warning future immigrants against importing free blacks, but the damage has been done. On July 15, the local citizens posted a manifesto, with a copy presented to the saints, signed by about 300 residents, it called for a mass meeting on July 20. An important crisis is at hand, as regards our civil society, the manifesto declared which the arm of the civil law cannot redress. Although the Mormons had broken no law for which they could be prosecuted, they presented a dire threat. Locals felt they must resort to the time-honored American tradition of vigilante action, which went back to a tax on stamp tax distributors in 1765 and the closing of courts to prevent debt collection during Shays Rebellion in 1786-87. Following this long line of precedents, the Jackson County citizens believed they could act legally against the Mormons. They were not a mob but the people in action. The men who signed the manifesto listed themselves as jailer, county clerk, Indian agent, postmaster, judge, attorney at law, justice of the peace, the most respectable characters in the county. They met on the courthouse steps to make plans. In their manifesto, they pledged our lives, fortunes, and sacred honors borrowing the famous last line of the Declaration of Independence. According to the response of the July 20 meeting, a committee of twelve was commissioned to wait on the Mormon leaders and inform them that the press must close and every Mormon leave the county. When Phelps and Partridge asked for ten days to consider, the meeting unanimously resolved to raise the printing office and Phelps's house, which resolution was, with the utmost order, and the least noise or disturbance possible forthwith carried into execution, as also some other steps of a similar tendency. The steps of a similar tendency were to tar and feather Bishop Partridge and church member Charles Allen, and dump the goods from Sidney Gilbert's store in the street. The report was signed Richard Simpson, Chairman, and S. D. Lucas and J. H. Floor Anoy, Secretaries. The group charged the Mormons with religious fanaticism. Mormons pretended to speak in tongues claimed communications direct from heaven, attempted to heal the sick, and tried all the wonder-working miracles wrought by the inspired apostles and prophets. Nearly as bad, Mormons were the very dregs of society without property or education, elevated but little above the condition of our blacks. So close to the slaves were the Mormons that the non-Mormons suspected them of tampering with the labor force and of bringing free blacks into the county. The manifesto authors envisioned an amalgam of slaves 
free blacks, and impoverished religious fanatics taking over their society. Where would it all end? The day is not far distant, when the civil government of the county will be in their hands. When the sheriff, the justices, and the county judges will be Mormons, or persons wishing to court their favor from motives of interest or ambition. Another religious group might be permitted this degree of control, but not Mormons, what would be the fate of our lives and property, in the hands of jurors and witnesses, who do not blush to declare and would not upon occasion hesitate to swear, that they have wrought miracles, and have been the subjects of miracles and supernatural cures, have converse with God and his angels, and possess and exercise gifts of divination and of unknown tongues. In their minds, the horrors of domination by pretenders to the powers of apostles and prophets staggered the imagination. The non-Mormon settlers claimed that decisive action was necessary to protect the good society, public morals, and the fair prospects of the county. The committee demanded that half the Mormons, including most of the leaders, leave the county within six months and the rest by the following April. The citizens reported that on July 23rd their committee had entered into an amicable agreement with them as if the two parties had politely agreed on a mutually acceptable arrangement. The secretary did not mention the destruction of the Phelps family's house or Partridge's burns from a corrosive agent in the tar, but fastidiously noted that no blood was spilled, nor any blows inflicted. Had the Mormons not yielded, they faced whippings and wrecked houses. The Mormon presence in Jackson County, as in every other county they occupied during the next fifteen years, tested democracy. The Mormon case illustrated an underlying democratic dilemma, can a majority, in defense of the public good as they see it, strip a minority of its rights? The Jackson County citizens believed their procedures were democracy in action. The citizens came together to prevent a social and political disaster of alarming proportions, in their view, they acted purely in self-defense. But for Mormons, Jackson County democracy meant repression and expulsion. Under the terms of the agreement, Mormons could not vote, could not own property, could not print a newspaper, and could not work in the county. The July 23 agreement gave Mormon leaders time to consult with Joseph in the six months they were given before they had to leave the county. Joseph may have already anticipated the mounting hostility. Letters sent from Missouri in early July, now lost probably carried news of growing opposition. Perhaps in response to these rumors, a revelation on August 6 counseled moderation, be not afraid of your enemies. Instead of fighting back, they were to renounce war and proclaim peace. Avoid retaliation, they were told, and rely on God. Whether they were forewarned or not, Calgary's arrival in Ohio with news of the citizens' ultimatum threw Kirtland into an uproar. An emergency council first advised the Missouri Saints to look for another home, assuring them that another place of beginning will be no injury to Zion in the end. The council agreed with the decision to leave. There was no other way to save the lives of all the church in Zion. Joseph, devastated by the news, tried to comfort the brethren with a plaintive postscript wishing he was there to share the suffering. My spirit would not let me forsake you unto death. Be of good cheer, he urged. O oh God save my brethren in Zion O oh brethren give up all to God forsake all for Christ's sake. As the days passed, Joseph became more and more troubled. On August 18, he wrote the most anguished letter of his life, all of it in his own hand, addressed to brother William, John, Edward, Isaac. John and Sidney, the Missouri leaders. He was driven nearly to madness and desperation, he said, not understanding why the grand plan for Zion, the heart of the whole restoration movement, had been set back. God will speedily deliver Zion for I have his immutable covenant, but he keeps it hid from mine eyes the means how exactly the thing will be done. Joseph scarcely knew what to say or do. The letter commiserated with the brethren in one line, promised them deliverance in the next and condemned their enemies a few lines later. The letter opens with a prayer to thou disposer of all events asking for some kind word to these my brethren in Zion. They had sacrificed for Zion, why must they suffer? O Lord what more dost thou require at their hands before thou wilt come and save them? Joseph prayed that God's anger might consume their enemies and render quick punishment. They will go down to the pit and give place for thy saints. He promised that the cloud shall pass over and the sun shall shine as clear and as fair as heaven itself. They had his support. There is not one doubt in my heart not one place in me but what is filled with perfect confidence and love for you.
A few practical suggestions emerged from the letter. They should start a newspaper in support of the current administration in Washington and then appeal for protection. Meanwhile, he advised a more unyielding stand than Cowdery had proposed a week earlier. Cowdery had told them to look out another place to locate on. On August 18, Joseph told the Missouri Saints they must not sell one foot of land in Jackson County, for they would never get it back. They must act secretly, for the residents would immediately suspect them of reneging on the agreement, but the Saints must stand firm. He was less certain about using force to counter attacks. On this delicate question we wait the command of God to do whatever he pleases and if he shall say go up to Zion and defend thy brethren by the sword we fly and we count not our life dear to us. The question of an armed defense plagued Joseph for the next six months, and for the rest of his life. The conflict in Missouri changed Joseph's politics dramatically. For the first time, government figured in his thought as an active agent. The revelations had never before acknowledged a nation or government, not even the Constitution. Zion had been considered a society unto itself. There is and can be no ruler nor lawgiver in the kingdom of God save it be God our Saviour, Sidney Rigdon wrote in 1831. But the Jackson County attacks made government an essential ally in recovering the saints' lost lands. The moderate revelation on August 6 advised the saints to befriend constitutional law. The rights and privileges in the Constitution, the revelation said, belong to all mankind and were justifiable before God elevating those principles from the national to the universal. As you know, Joseph told his Missouri brethren in his August letter, We are all friends to the Constitution yea true friends to that country for which our fathers bled. From then on, Joseph was never far removed from politics. For a decade, he sought protection from the government, usually without success, until finally, frustrated by his inability to rally government to the saints' side, he ran for president. In the long run, the appeals to government had an unexpected effect on the church's self-image. The need to gather support for their petitions led the saints to tell their story not as a narrative of revelations, but as one of persecutions. By the 1840s, when Joseph wrote about the Jackson County expulsion in great detail, he had perfected the form. The story of the church had become an account of wicked, outrageous and unlawful proceedings. The history of Missouri featured beatings of women, and children driven or frightened from their homes, by yells and threats. As the persecution and sufferings mounted through the years, the Mormon story became more heart-trenching. When Joseph received visitors, he was as likely to describe the mobbings as he was to explain his revelations. In this boasted land of liberty, the saints were brought into jeopardy, and threatened with expulsion or death because they wished to worship God according to the revelations of heaven. The constitutions of their country and the dictates of their own consciences. O oh liberty, how art thou fallen! This persecution story, even without rhetorical embellishment, was persuasive. People who had no respect for the saints' theology, including much of the Missouri press in 1833, recognized the injustice of their treatment. The persecution was all the more poignant because it happened in a land presumably free. The success of the appeal changed the saints' relation to the world. The customary language of conversion and gathering implicitly conceived of non-Mormons as potential converts who accepted or rejected the missionaries' message. When a town rejected them, missionaries washed the dust off their feet and left that people to their fate. The persecution story, by contrast, recognized an unbaptized sympathetic middle group, not joiners or enemies, but somewhere in between. Accounts of persecution, paradoxically, bridged the gulf between the saints and the unbelieving world by envisioning a body of sympathizers with whom friendly relations could be established without converting them. The church came to conceive of itself differently too. A general appeal from the Missouri Mormon leadership in July 1834 claimed the Mormons were fulfilling biblical prophecy in gathering to Zion as if they alone were carrying out God's mission, but when the appeal switched to the Mormons' right to worship God according to the dictates of our own consciences, Mormonism became one religion among many. The Mormon paper pointed out that if a majority may crush any religious sect with impunity, any religion could suffer, the fate of our church now might become the fate of the Methodists and then the Catholics. By asking for toleration and the right to worship, Mormonism had to present itself not as the one true church but as one church among a society of churches, all on an equal plane. Redress. Within a few months of the July agreement, 
church leaders had adjusted to the setback in Missouri. Even though the Missouri Saints remained in Jackson County, by the fall of 1833, the Kirtland Brethren were already shifting emphasis to Ohio. The Evening and Morning Star, now under Oliver Cowdery's editorship, was moved to Kirtland and converts were advised to remain in Kirtland rather than move to Independence. The migrant stream was diverted from Zion in Missouri to the stake of Zion in Kirtland. After his first agonized letter, Joseph spoke more philosophically about the disaster. In September, he told a suffering Missouri saint that he was not at all astonished at what has happened to you neither to what has happened to Zion. The shift did not mean the church was giving up on Jackson County, although the Mormons had been warned that any attempt to obtain redress would put their lives in jeopardy. They submitted an unsuccessful petition to Missouri Governor Daniel Dunklin in September 1833, asking for protection. The governor assured the saints that the justice system would enforce the law without the backing of troops. Dunklin thought that a complaint brought before the circuit judge or justice of the peace would produce a warrant against the attackers, ignoring the fact that the court officers themselves were deeply involved. To pursue every possible redress, the saints hired four non-Mormon lawyers from Clay County just north of Jackson, for the exorbitant fee of a thousand dollars. When this news leaked out, the old settlers were outraged. For seven days and nights, from October 31st to November 6th, they lay siege to the saints. Believing the Mormons had gone back on the July 23rd agreement, the non-Mormon citizens were determined to evict them immediately. In keeping with the unwritten rules of vigilante action, the Missourians at first tried to avoid bloodshed mainly attacking property. They threw stones at houses, stuck long poles through windows, and tore off roofs. Several Mormons were whipped or beaten, and one had his head creased by a ball from a pistol. The mob tore down part of Sidney Gilbert's store, broke windows, and scattered inventory. Throughout the Mormon settlement, houses and furniture were ruined. The attacks escalated after an exchange of fire in which a Mormon and two Missourians were killed. Bloodshed removed the restraints on mob tactics. Some old settlers believed the Mormons planned on butchering us all, and began attacking persons as well as property. A clergyman on the Jackson County side learned of Mus who were determined to kill. Mormon leaders had to be held in prison for their safety. Under dire threat, the saints agreed to give up their arms. From then on, the Mormons were helpless. No massacre occurred. But Missourians went from house to house forcing out women and children and demanding to know where the men were hiding. Fearing their husbands would be murdered, the women fled. By November 7, most of the saints were camped on the southern bank of the Missouri River, awaiting ferries to Clay County, where the citizens had granted them temporary refuge. In recounting the story in the 1840s, Joseph emphasized the feeble efforts of the government to aid the saints. One justice of the peace refused to book a Missourian court in the act of throwing bricks at Gilbert's store, and a few days later charges were brought against Gilbert for false imprisonment of the culprit. Fearing the mob, another justice refused to issue a peace warrant. While depredations were occurring all around, militia colonels Lucas and Pitcher disarmed the saints and then stood by while they were evicted. At first, the Saints placed their confidence in Lieutenant Governor Wilburn Boggs, a large landholder in Jackson County, thinking him their protector. Five years later, as Governor of Missouri, he issued the notorious order requiring Mormons to leave the state. In light of this later history, Joseph's account of the 1833 expulsion castigated Boggs, all earth and hell cannot deny that a baser knave, a greater traitor, and a more wholesale butcher, or murderer of mankind, never went untried unpunished, and unhung. News of the violence reached Kirtland on November 25th. This time Joseph had little to say. Nothing had come from heaven. An October revelation, the only one that fall, dealt mainly with a mission to Canada and only incidentally promised that Zion shall be redeemed, although she is chastened for a little season. Frederick G. Williams wrote in early October that we have received no revelations for a long time. A December 5th letter from Joseph could only say the destinies of all people are in the hands of a just God. He repeated the previous counsel to hold on to the lands and seek redress from the government. Zion was not to be moved. Five days later another letter said, I cannot learn from any communication of the Spirit to me that Zion has forfeited her claim to a celestial crown.
Joseph had to deduce God's will from what was not revealed. Meanwhile he searched the old revelations for light and seized upon a passage in the dedicatory revelation about glory coming to Zion after much tribulation. Distraught and confused, Joseph began to murmur against the Lord. He asked how long Zion's tribulation would last, and was told, Be still, and know that I am God. Considering all that he had been blessed with, Joseph knew he should not complain. I am sensible that I ought not to murmur and do not murmur only in this, that those who are innocent are compelled to suffer for the iniquities of the guilty, and I cannot account for this. He agonized that the bad news from Zion weighs us down, we cannot refrain from tears. When government fails you, he wrote, and the humanity of the people fails you, and all things else fails you but God alone, rely on him to execute judgment. Joseph ended the December letter with a long prayer asking God to restore the saints to their Zion. Finally, after months of silence, the Lord spoke. Oliver Cowdery is reported to have dramatically announced, Good morning brethren, we have just received news from heaven. Like biblical accounts of Israel's defeats, the revelation blamed the losses in Missouri on Zion's own sins. God suffered affliction to come upon the saints in consequence of their transgressions. But, again like Israel, the saints were not cast off. Yet, I will own them, and they shall be mine in that day when I shall come to make up my jewels. They were not to give up Zion but to purchase even more land in Jackson County. Joseph gradually regained his footing after December, but the events of 1833 cast a long shadow over Mormon history. For the first time, the saints felt their helplessness before popular enmity. While the government looked on and did nothing, they were driven from their homes. The saints learned that the mobs were the people and the people were the government. No law officer or court would come to their defense. In a destructive irony, the people of Jackson County, in the name of democracy, deprived the Mormon people of their democratic right to live, work, and vote in the county. The only recourse in 1833 was to flee. But what about the next time? Was flight their only option? Forming a private militia had no part in the revelations, but self-defense required one. How else could they react to depredations? The seeds of Mormon militarism were sown in this moment. The Mormons were later accused of threatening the peace with violence born of religious fanaticism. But their resort to militias was the result of being treated violently themselves. Violence originated in the democracy, not in religion. From 1834 onwards, Mormons uneasily experimented with various forms of self-protection. Most Mormons were pacific by nature but a fierce minority longed for battle. They pressed Joseph to declare war on their enemies. Events of the year initiated a spiral of suspicion, resistance, and persecution that resulted a decade later in Joseph's death. 12. The Character of a Prophet, 1834, Behold I say unto you, the redemption of Zion must needs come by power, therefore, I will raise up unto my people a man, who shall lead them like as Moses led the children of Israel, for ye are the children of Israel and of the seed of Abraham, and ye must needs be led out of bondage by power, and with a stretched out arm. Doctrine and Covenants 1844, 101 to 3. From the moment Joseph began receiving revelations, people were curious to know more about him. Believers and unbelievers came to inspect him and report their impressions. His own followers were sometimes disappointed. He was a lovely fellow, one said. He looked green and not very intelligent wrote another. Others were struck by his charisma. Mary Hales said that on shaking hands with Joseph Smith, I received the Holy Spirit in such great abundance that I felt it thrill my whole system, from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. I thought I had never beheld so lovely a countenance. Nobility and goodness were in every feature. Some doubted his capacities. One genteel visitor to Nauvoo found his language in the manner were the coarsest possible. A few skeptics found his personal power surprising. In 1834, Joseph's character became the subject of public debate. Dr. Philastus Hurlbut, the man who discovered the Spalding manuscript, tracked down neighbors in Palmyra who remembered Joseph Smith and his family. Hurlbut collected a batch of disparaging affidavits, which Eber D. Howe, the Painesville editor, published. Joseph's character has been a matter of dispute ever since. Given the name Doctor because he was a seventh son with presumed healing powers, Hurlbut, a former Methodist preacher, had joined the Mormons in March 1833, at age 24. Three months later he was tried by a bishop's council for unchristian-like conduct with a female sex. 
On appeal to a council of high priests presided over by Joseph Smith, Herbert was forgiven after liberal confession, but two days later, after new testimony was received, he was excommunicated. Furious, he returned to Pennsylvania, where he had once preached for the Mormons, and began lecturing against them. Herbert collected the affidavits while returning from his search for Spalding's supposed manuscript source of the Book of Mormon. His search had been funded by a group of Campbellites who were still smarting from Sidney Rigdon's defection and hoping to discredit Joseph. While lecturing in Palmyra, Herbert met people who described the Smiths as lazy, money-digging liars. During November and December 1833, Herbert collected 15 statements that he exhibited when he lectured in Kirtland and surrounding towns in January 1834. One Ohio Mormon reported that the ridiculous stories gathered in New York had fired the minds of the people with much indignation against Bro Joseph and the church. Joseph said Herbert was ling in a wonderful manner and the P.O. Pla running after him and giving him money to break down Mormonism which much endangers our lives at present. In the ensuing battle of words. The impassioned Herbert threatened to wash his hands in Joseph's blood. The reason for Joseph's four-week breaching mission to New York and Upper Canada in October and November 1833 may have been to escape Herbert. Upon his return, Joseph appointed bodyguards and filed a complaint in court, perhaps remembering the dowering and feathering in Hiram two years before. In his journal, Joseph wrote out a prayer, offered with five of his friends asking that the law of the land may be magnified in bringing Herbert to justice. After his experience with the impotent Missouri courts, Joseph could not take justice for granted. He prayed the Lord would destroy him who has lifted his heel against me even that wicked man Dr. P. Herbert. To Joseph's relief, the court placed Herbert under a $200 bond to keep peace for six months. Discredited, Herbert gave up his campaign and sold the depositions to Eber D. Howe who included them in his History of the Mormons published in November 1834. Mormonism Unveiled presented Herbert's speculation about Solomon Spaulding's authorship of the Book of Mormon and printed the 15 negative depositions along with other derogatory reports. Joseph was less troubled by the Palmyra neighbor's critical comments than by Herbert's threats on his life. After the court restrained Herbert, the Mormons felt that his influence was pretty much destroyed. He disappeared from the scene and Joseph turned his attention back to rescuing Zion. But Herbert's depositions left an indelible mark on Joseph's reputation. The former neighbor's sworn statements allowed Howe to claim that these witnesses counterbalanced the eleven witnesses to the gold plates. Colorful and detailed, the neighbor's statements paint a less than ideal Joseph. Joshua Stafford remembered the Smiths as laboring people in low circumstances who in the early 1820s commenced digging for hidden treasures and soon after they became indolent, and told marvelous stories about ghosts, hobgoblins, caverns, and various other mysterious matters. Eleven citizens of Manchester said the Smiths were a lazy, indolent set of men, and their word was not to be depended on. The statement closed with happy relief, we are truly glad to dispense with their society. How and Herbert brought the money digging Joseph back from the past to trouble the Joseph who was now a prophet. In 1832, a year before Herbert came on the scene, Joseph had written a history of his life covering the same period described by the affidavits. Though not written as a defense, the history does serve as an implicit rejoinder. Joseph had tried to keep histories before 1832 but with poor results. Neither Oliver Cowdery nor John Whitmer, who were appointed to keep accounts of church events, did an adequate job. After looking over Whitmer's record in 1832, Joseph decided to tell his own story and launched a history of the life of Joseph Smith Jr. The six-page narrative began with his birth and stopped as he was about to translate the Book of Mormon. To improve records in the future, he began a diary in November 1832, which ran for a few months, faltered, and then picked up a year later and lasted for a longer time. By 1835 clerks were recording his day-by-day -day activities, and these raw materials helped him compile a history beginning in 1838 and published serially during his lifetime. The two accounts, the neighbor's affidavits and the 1832 brief history, show how differently a man's life could be represented. The Palmyrans never knew the Joseph of his own history. They saw him as a careless, indolent treasure seeker. Joseph remembered growing up anguished and searching, 
anything but slack and careless. All of the familiar visionary events of his early life are seen as struggles. He comes across as a restless, yearning soul. Not even his own family knew this Joseph. His mother remembered a boy who brooded a lot but she had no idea of his adolescent anguish. The failure of religious people to follow a holy walk was a grief to my soul. He became concerned with the wickedness and abominations and the darkness which pervaded the minds of mankind. Exceedingly distressed, he feared the world was lost. Everyone had apostatized from the true and living faith, leaving him to mourn for my own sins and for the sins of the world. After his bout with skepticism as a teenager, the affirmation of his belief in the God of creation did not calm him. He cried unto the Lord for mercy for there was none else to whom I could go and obtain mercy. The vision of God in a pillar of light was pacifying, but soon after, his transgressions and sins again brought a wound upon my soul, and the persecutions and afflictions suffered by his family left him in need once more. Another prayer brought the vision of Moroni and instructions about the Book of Mormon, but his sharpest memory was his inability to get the plates from the hill on the first try. I cried unto the Lord in the agony of my soul why can I not obtain them? Rather than rejoicing in the marvel of seeing gold plates, he remembered primarily the angel's chastisement. By his own account, Joseph frequently felt cast down, lacking, or falling short, never enjoying all that he needed whether wealth or spiritual assurance. He spent more time recounting Martin Harris's loss of the first translated pages than he did describing the translation itself. He remembered the chastisement and how he regained the plates only after much humility and affliction of soul. Joseph was capable of gratitude. He opened the history with a phrase saying he would give an account of his marvelous experience and of all the mighty acts which he doeth in the name of Jesus Christ but his voice was not triumphant. He broke off the narrative with a sentence about the poverty he and Emma suffered when her father threatened to turn them out of their house, I had not where to go and I cried unto the Lord that he would provide for me to accomplish the work whereunto he had commanded me. Joseph's history contains more pleading with God than excitement about revelation. The entries in the journal that Joseph started in November 1832 were written in the same spirit. At the top of the first page, he noted the book was to keep a minute account of all things that come under my observation, and then lapsed into the yearnings of his earlier writing. O oh may God grant that I may be directed in all my thoughts so bless thy servant Amen. The next entry, November 28, 1832, noted that he had spent the evening reading and writing and then observed my mind is calm and serene for which I thank the Lord. On December 4, he happily reported feel better in my mind than I have for a few days back, but not knowing how long the peace would last, he added, O Lord deliver thy servant out of temptations and fill his heart with wisdom and understanding. The journal entries, usually five or six lines jotted down casually when he had a spare moment, reveal a striving young man uncertain of his standing with God, yearning to be worthy, grateful when he finds peace. He often included small prayers. O oh may God bless us with the gift of utterance to accomplish the journey and the errand on which we are sent, reads one. His appeals were sometimes specific and material. It is my prayer to the Lord that 3,000 subscribers may be added to the star in the term of three days. Often he prayed for family, O oh Lord bless my little children with health and long life to do good in this generation for Christ's sake Amen. Without God's help, his own powers fell short. The forced exodus from Missouri in 1833 set Joseph to praying once more. Oh my God have mercy on my brethren in Zion for Christ's sake, he wrote in January 1834. Perhaps to strengthen his prayers, he joined five friends in a petition that sounded like a formal appeal to the government. In the first clause, they asked the Lord to watch over our persons and give his angels charge concerning us and our families. Then they prayed for their economic organization, the United Firm, asked for success in the suit against Hurlbut, sought means to discharge the church's debts, and requested protection of the printing press from the hands of evil men and for the deliverance of Zion. The items were listed and entered in the journal as a record of their desires. Zion's camp, Joseph's confidence gradually returned in the winter of 1834, when two emissaries from the Saints in Clay County, Missouri, arrived in Kirtland in February, he took action. After hearing the report, 
Joseph declared that he was going to Zion to redeem the land and called for the council's assent. The members agreed unanimously, nominating Joseph as commander-in-chief of the armies of Israel. Provoked by the outrages in Missouri, another side of Joseph's character surfaced. In place of the struggling Christian stood the militant leader of Israel's armies. The revelations did not explain how the saints were to respond to violence. The Book of Mormon contained examples of extreme pacifism and equally vigorous militarism. Joseph's early revelations had a pacifist side. The saints were told to obtain Zion by purchase, not violence, for if by blood, as you are forbidden to shed blood, lo, your enemies are upon you. The first rumor of anti-Mormon action in Missouri in the summer of 1833 had brought a revelation telling them to renounce war and proclaim peace. But the same revelation explained that the saints were expected to forbear only so long. If smitten once, twice, or thrice by their enemies, they were to bear it patiently and revile not against them, neither seek revenge. After that, resistance was justified. If their enemies repeatedly injured them, armed defense was justifiable. One historian sees in the revelation on submitting to three attacks the basis for an independent, militant kingdom under the umbrella of the United States government, with power to make war on its own authority. Joseph's designation by the Kirtland High Council as commander-in-chief of the armies of Israel strengthens the impression of a military operation. But this peculiar elaboration of church organization only reflected the position in which the Jackson County expulsion had placed the Mormons. The mob had treated them like an enemy nation. The citizens did not prosecute the saints in court. They attacked them like Indians and drove them out as if they were wartime foes. What could the Mormons do but defend themselves like a nation, organizing an army and preparing for war? The only alternative seemed to be slaughter or expulsion. A revelation at the time of the February 1834 council meeting told the saints that the redemption of Zion must needs come by power, and the Lord would raise up unto my people a man, who shall lead them like as Moses led the children of Israel. That sounded like a call to action. But the comparison was to Moses leading Israel out of bondage and not Joshua invading Canaan. The comparison left some question about the nature of the power by which Zion was to be redeemed. Was it the power of arms conquering an enemy, or the power of God opening the sea? The saints were promised they would possess the goodly land, a clear reference to Canaan, and told to assemble as many as five hundred men. But how these men were to engage the enemy is not explained. If attacked in Zion, were they to fight? The revelation said to avenge me of mine enemies, but nothing about fighting. The saints were to curse them, not shoot them. When the little band finally reached Missouri, it was disbanded before a shot was fired. Joseph's military flourishes usually stopped short of battle. The Mormons had no intention of invading Jackson County. The saints believed that Governor Daniel Dunklin had promised to escort them back under armed guard when he brought the state's witnesses to the trial of the Jackson County perpetrators. The Mormons became vulnerable only at the trial's conclusion. Dunklin said he lacked authority to maintain a permanent militia attachment to prevent further depredations. To protect themselves, the Mormons were encouraged to organize a militia and acquire public arms, a possible invitation to war, but the only course Dunklin could suggest. He could call out the militia only in a time of public danger, he said, and the Mormons' distress did not qualify. The U.S. Congress, however, did have the authority to call out the militia to execute the laws or suppress insurrection. Taking the hint, the Mormons appealed to President Andrew Jackson but were turned down because no federal laws had been broken. With neither federal or state government able to maintain the peace, the Mormons organized themselves as Dunklin recommended. They wrote him in April that a number of our brethren, perhaps two or three hundred, would remove to Jackson Co., with the object purely to defend ourselves and possessions against another unparalleled attack from that mob. Since the governor lacked the authority to protect them, they said, we want therefore the privilege of defending ourselves. Through the spring of 1834, Joseph raised men for Jackson County. Two days after the council meeting resolved to go to Zion, he set out with Parley Pratt on a month-long recruiting tour of Pennsylvania and New York while three other pairs of elders recruited elsewhere. The February revelation called for the enlistment of 500 men if possible and 100 minimum. Back in Kirtland in March, Joseph continued the campaign circling out to the branches near Kirtland and writing letters to the saints about the importance of obtaining a place of refuge and an inheritance upon the land of Zion. The camp would depart in May. On the way to a conference at New Portage, 
Ohio, a few weeks before the camp's departure, Joseph stopped in Norton with Cowdery, Rigdon, and Zebedee Coltrane. After getting settled, the four went into the woods to pray. Their written prayers constituted the longest entry in Joseph's journal that month. They asked God to give Joseph strength, and wisdom, and understanding sufficient to lead the people of the Lord. He needed assistance to gather back and establish the saints upon the land of their inheritances. Somehow he had to organize them according to the will of heaven, that they be no more cast down forever. All the tasks were more than he could handle alone. After the prayers, Joseph asked the others to lay their hands on his head and confirm all the blessings necessary to qualify him to stand before the Lord in his high calling. Then each of the men in turn received a blessing for his particular responsibility. Having been fortified, their hearts rejoiced, and we were comforted with the Holy Spirit. The initial company of what became known as Zion's Camp or the Old Camp set out from Kirtland on May 1st. Joined by Joseph in New Portage on May 6th, the company totaled about a hundred men, the number eventually doubling as other parties of Mormons trickled in from Midwest branches. Hiram Smith and Lyman White recruited a company that rendezvoused with Joseph's group north of Street Louis. The departure of so many Kirtland males attracted the attention of the vigilant Eba D. Howe who wrote a humorous report in the Painesville Telegraph's May 9th issue. His story was an early warning of the fears the Mormons would arouse whenever they appeared militant. Even before the march began, Howe characterized the expedition as a fanatical, if slightly ridiculous, military campaign. The Mormons had done nothing warlike save to set out for Missouri, and yet Howe discerned at once a holy zeal for combat. He named all the weapons they had been accumulating, dirks, knives, swords, pistols, guns, powder horns, have been in good demand in this vicinity. Some have equipped themselves with four or five pistols. The prophet, it is said, has a sword over four feet long. Though writing sarcastically, Howe portrayed the Mormons as a band of zealots, armed to the teeth, ready to draw blood. He likened Joseph to Peter the Hermit, in the days of the Crusades. Zion's camp did attempt a mild military order, but Joseph was short on military discipline. The company which included women and children, averaged about 25 miles per day. The men were organized into companies of 12 with a captain over each, but their duties were to cook, make fires, prepare tents, fetch water, and attend to horses, more like trail companies than a military troop. The officers were quartermaster and historian, commissaries of subsistence, adjutant, and captain of the guard. This regimen was accompanied by morning and evening prayers and weekly Sunday services. Zion's camp set a guard each night, worried about being spied on by the enemy. They feared that the Jackson County citizens would use force to stop the Mormons en route. After it became known that a Mormon company was coming, the Jackson citizens had burned over a hundred abandoned Mormon dwellings. Once the camp conducted a sham battle as a diversion while they waited for one of the men to buy a horse and after crossing into Missouri, the camp attempted a more military style. Joseph was acknowledged as commander-in-chief, Lyman White, one of the more militant converts, was general of the camp. According to White, Joseph called him to the position while recruiting in New York State. At Father Bosley's farm, Joseph ordained me to the office of Benemy Sick in the presence of an angel. Joseph was given the name Borak Gale the officer of the highest rank in the army of the strength of the Lord's hosts and Benami is an appendage thereunto. Joseph chose twenty men for his bodyguard, fearing that he was a particular target for the Missourians. To give some small measure of discipline to this odd lot of men, Joseph held an inspection of firearms and had them discharged to be sure they worked, and then White marched the men about in platoons for half a day. Joseph went no further toward turning the camp members into soldiers. He seemed more intrigued with military flourishes like appointing to himself an armor-bearer who carried a brace of silver-mounted brass-barreled horse pistols that Joseph discharged from time to time. It is hard to know what the camp experience meant to Joseph as he traveled the nearly thousand miles from Ohio to Missouri during May and June of 1834. His journal for those months, kept by camp historian Frederick G. Williams was lost. A brief account prepared during Joseph's lifetime was not printed until after his death. The expanded account in the official history of the church was the work of clerks who borrowed from the notes of participants such as Heber C. Kimball, George A. Smith, and the conscientious diarist Wilford Woodruff. In the expanded version, 
Clarks combined all the available sources of information into entries that sounded as if Joseph himself wrote them. Where he was in this welter of sources is hard to know. Much of the Zion's camp story in the later accounts came from George A. Smith. Joseph's admiring younger cousin who went on to become a leader in the church hierarchy. George A. was nearly 17 when the camp left Kirtland in May 1834, a plain country boy with weak eyes, wearing a crushed straw hat and striped ticking pantaloons, too short for his long body. Joseph sent him out when the camp passed through towns to answer questions the townspeople might direct to a simple boy rather than a more forbidding adult. Joseph invited George A to sleep in his tent and assigned him to carry water for their irascible cook, Zebedee Goldrin. George A. made note of food and saw feet. Forced on one hot day to drink slough water, he learned to strain wigglers with his teeth. He was grateful to Joseph for lending him a pair of his own boots to ease his painful feet. He watched the prophet bear up under hardships along with everyone else. When Joseph was given sweet bread rather than sour like the others, he asked for the sour. He walked all day rather than riding because the wagons were overloaded with supplies. Joseph had a full proportion of blistered, bloody and sore feet, which was the natural result of walking from 25 to 40 miles a day in a hot season of the year. George A. picked up the camp law and especially the feeling of divine protection. Though apparently on their own as they trudged along the famed National Road to the West, the camp members believed heaven watched over them. A revelation had said an angel would go before them like Israel in the wilderness, and one camp member, Heber C. Kimball, said angels were seen. When a man turned over a spadeful of earth and found water, some exclaimed that it was as much of a miracle as when Moses smote the rock and water came out. Happenings like this led Levi Hancock to say, truly we had seen the hand of God in our favor all the way. George A. Remembered an occasion when onlookers were unable to gauge the camp's numbers, in passing through the village of Middlebury an attempt was made to count us and we were declared to be 450, those who counted said they did not think they included all, there were not in reality 100 of us. Joseph made the same observation to Emma, in counting us they make of our 170 men from 5 to 700, he wrote in early June. The exaggeration benefited the saints, Joseph thought by intimidating the Jackson County spies. In George A. Smith's retelling, supernatural power focused on Joseph. George A. noted the times when Joseph's greater wisdom prevailed over the foolishness of camp members. When some feared they would take ill from milk, Joseph calmed them. If they would follow his counsel and use all that they could get from friend or enemy it should do them good and none be sick in consequence of it. George A. Happily reported that although we passed through neighborhoods where many of the people and cattle were dying with the sickness, yet his words were fulfilled. Mormons inherited the Puritan habit of seeing providential interventions in everyday events. When an argument broke out involving Sylvester Smith, a perpetual troublemaker, Joseph warned that they would meet with misfortunes, difficulties and hindrances, as the certain result of giving way to such a spirit and said, you will know it before you leave this place. George A reported that the next morning almost every horse in the camp was so badly founded, that we could scarcely lead them a few rods to water. When he learned of the problem, Joseph told the men to humble themselves and the horses would be restored by noon. George A. happily reported, they were as nimble as ever, with the exception of one of Sylvester Smith's which soon afterwards died. Like everyone else, Joseph wanted evidence of God's backing. The expulsion from Zion had shaken his confidence. Although he never doubted his revelations, he was less certain about everyday events. The periodic instructions from heaven were beacons for the church, but Joseph was on his own in carrying out the commandments. When reporting the magnified camp numbers to Emma, he saw God's hand in it. The Lord shows us to good advantage in the eyes of their spies. A rather prosaic idea of prophecy lay behind the camp's attention to Joseph's sayings. Everyone thought a prophet should foretell the future, and Joseph's accuracy in even small matters confirmed their belief. Joseph's gifts, however, were of a different nature. In early June when several camp members stopped near the Illinois River to investigate a mound, they came across three piles of stones that looked like possible altars, with bones scattered on the ground nearby. Digging down about a foot, they found a skeleton with an arrow point stuck in its ribs. According to the account prepared under his direction, Joseph said, 
the visions of the past being opened to my understanding by the Spirit of the Almighty. I discovered that the person whose skeleton was before us was a white Lamanite, a large thick-set man, and a man of God. Named Zelf, the man fought for the great prophet Onondagus, who was known from the hill Cumra, or Eastern Sea, to the Rocky Mountains. According to Joseph, Zelf had his hip broken by a rock flung from a sling during the last great battle between Lamanites and Nephites. Stories like this perplexed Levi Hancock, who later noted, I could not comprehend it but supposed it was all right. George A. Smith understood that Joseph saw himself as the camp's instructor. The camp members were prayerless, thoughtless, careless, heedless, foolish or devilish and yet we did not know it. Joseph had to bear with us and tutor us, like children. Joseph told the men around him to cultivate through life a modest and graceful demeanor, avoiding vulgarity, a hard lesson for these rough-cut men. He told them to be careful about their posture while praying. When we kneel to pray we should be in a graceful manner such as would not cause a disgusting impression to arise in the mind of any spectator. On another occasion, Joseph taught a little millennial ecology. He stopped some men from killing three rattlesnakes by telling them, when will the lion lie down with the lamb and the venom of the serpent cease, while man seeks to destroy and waste the flesh of beasts, waging a continual war against reptiles, let man first get rid of his destructive propensities and then we may look for a change in the serpent's disposition. They avoided killing snakes from them on, said George A., and shot wild animals only for food. A month into the trip, Joseph wrote to Emma that a tolerable degree of union has prevailed among the brethren. Were it not for the absence of their families, he told her, wandering over the plains with these social honest and sincere men would be as a dream, and this would be the happiest period of all our lives. He saw the camp as a rehearsal for a future journey to Zion when all would come peacefully in the enjoyment and embrace of that society we so much love. The harmony did not last. On June 5th, the day after Joseph wrote home, Sylvester Smith, captain of one of the companies, began an argument that lasted three months. It started when Sylvester marched his company smartly into camp to the sound of a flute, and a dog given to Joseph by a camp member snapped at the men. Sylvester berated Joseph and threatened to kill the dog. The next morning, Joseph mimicked Sylvester's wrath, saying, If a dog bites me I will kill him, if any man insults me, I will kill him if any man injures me I will injure him. This spirit keeps up division and bloodshed through the world. That a soft answer turneth away wrath was a worthy principle, but then Joseph contradicted his own lesson by snapping at Sylvester, if you kill that dog I will whip you. He predicted that if Sylvester did not get rid of that spirit the day would come when a dog should bite him, and gnaw his flesh and he would not be able to resist it. Furious, Sylvester spat back, you are prophesying lies in the name of the Lord. In mid-June. A disagreement over a campsite sparked another outburst between the two men. On a night when they feared an attack by Miss Orians, Joseph thought they should camp on the prairie where approaching forces could be seen. Sylvester, backed by General Lyman White and others, preferred to remain hidden in the trees. As the company pulled out onto the prairie, Sylvester placed himself in its path and shouted, Are you following your general or some other man? All but about twenty men followed Joseph. And when the smaller group caught up the next morning, Joseph called them together and reproved them for tarrying behind and not obeying his counsel. That was George A.S. polite account. Actually a shouting match ensued in which Joseph was said to have thrown the camp bugle at Sylvester. Lyman White backed down immediately, but Sylvester, in George A.S. tactful phrase, manifested refractory feelings. Disputes within the camp were matched by troubles with Missourians. The approach of the camp threw Jackson County into a frenzy. Sentries were placed along the south bank of the Missouri to warn the county of the approaching invaders. On June 6, Governor Dunklin appealed to state militia Colonel John Thornton of Clay County, where most of the displaced saints resided, to effect a compromise between the warring parties. Dunklin acknowledged the right of the Mormons to their lands and their constitutional right to arm themselves in self-defense, but thought they were better advised to settle elsewhere because of the eccentricity of their religious opinions. He urged the Jackson County leaders to buy out Mormon property. On June 16, with the camp getting closer, more than 800 people gathered at the courthouse in Liberty to settle the differences with resident Mormons. Probably as a result of the governor's initiative, 
Judge John Rilland in neighboring Ray County called together representatives of both parties. Sidney Gilbert, the Mormon storekeeper who handled the negotiations along with the Mormon's attorneys, Alexander Donifan and David Rice Acheson, warned the judge that the Mormons would never sell, but that was precisely what the Jackson County Committee proposed. Donifan thought the Mormons had the right to oppose mob violence. If they don't fight they are cowards. One account of the June 16th meeting had him saying, on the other side, a Clay County minister said that the Mormons must either clear out or be cleared out. Calmed by the church's attorneys, the Jackson County Committee finally proposed to purchase all Mormon lands at double the market value with payment due in 30 days. As an alternative, the Saints could buy all Jackson County lands on the same terms, double the fair price. For the Saints, the terms were impossible. As Gilbert wrote to the attorneys, to sell their inheritances in Zion would be like selling our children into slavery. As for the alternative, how could so much money be raised so quickly to buy out far wealthier settlers? The offer could only have been made in full realization of its impossibility. The Mormon counter-proposal a few days later was to buy out the Jackson County citizens at full value, not double value within a year and not to return until full payment was made. The cost of damages to Mormon property would be deducted from the price. In the meantime, a catastrophe killed all hope for compromise. Returning to Jackson County on the evening of the June 16th meeting, seven citizens, most of them members of the committee, crossed the Missouri River on William Everett's ferry. Although the ferry was believed to be in solid condition, it sank about 200 yards from shore. Five men drowned including Everett and two ferrymen. An investigation found nothing suspicious, but rumors quickly circulated that the Mormons had bribed one of the drowned men to bore large holes in the gunwales of the boat. Joseph was grimly satisfied with the ferry disaster. James Campbell, one of the victims, was reported to have sworn at liberty that the eagles and turkey buzzards shall eat my flesh if I do not fix Joe Smith and his army so that their skins will not hold shucks, before two days are passed. In his history, Joseph happily repeated the story that Campbell floated down the river some four or five miles, and lodged upon a pile of driftwood, where the eagles, buzzards, ravens, crows and wild animals eat his flesh from his bones, to fulfill his own words, and left him a horrible-looking skeleton of God's vengeance. To the end of his life, Joseph took dismal pleasure in stories of Jackson County suffering. A furious storm a few nights later, on June 19 showed God exacting vengeance once again. Camped between two branches of the fishing river, the Mormons learned from five men who rode into camp that they would see hell before morning. Two hundred Jackson County men, to be joined by sixty from Ray County and seventy from Clay, were crossing over to attack. Not long after the advance party rode off, the Mormons discovered a small black cloud rising in the west, and not more than twenty minutes passed away before it began to rain and hail. Drenched and pelted by hailstones, the Mormons barely got through the night. Exposed to the fury of the storm, the Jackson men were unable to cross the river. Joseph said that the wind and rain, hail and thunder met them in great wrath, and soon softened their direful courage, and frustrated all their design to kill Joe Smith and his army. Joseph was sure the battered attackers had learned that when Jehovah fights, they would rather be absent. The gratification is too terrible. If the storm slowed the mob, it also slowed Zion's camp, with the direct route to Jackson County temporarily flooded, the men marched north around the headwater, stopping on a plain in Ray County for a few days while Joseph considered his next move. The camp had learned on June 15th that the governor would not escort them back to their lands, they would have to fight their way into the county, that was a setback, they had never envisioned a bloody battle. Joseph told mediators from Ray County that the camp had assembled only to assist their abused brothers and sisters. It is not our intention to commit hostilities against any man, or set of men, it is not our intention to injure any man's person or property. He admitted they were well armed, but added that we have every reason to put ourselves in an attitude of self-defense, considering the abuse we have suffered. Although Joseph felt he had won over the Ray delegation, there was no chance for a settlement. After the sinking of the ferry, the Jackson citizens refused to deal. On Sunday, June 22, the Mormons' attorneys made their counter-proposal for purchasing the Jackson County lands to Clay County Sheriff Cornelius Gilliam, who published the plan in their, Liberty, Missouri Inquirer. By then, however, the negotiations were dead. That same day, Joseph, 
still well outside of Jackson County, received a revelation telling the camp to disband for the time being. On Monday, their lawyers advised them to give up any ideas of military action and depend on the courts for redress. With no practical alternatives, Joseph agreed. The more bellicose camp members were unhappy. George A. Smith said that several of the brethren apostatized because they were not going to have the privilege of fighting. John Whitmer felt hopes were blasted at least for a season when the decision was made to disband. These militants had marched to Missouri expecting to redeem Zion by force. Now they were told to abandon the campaign. The June 22 revelation forbade aggressive action. Before the army of Israel could become fair as the sun, and clear as the moon and her banners terrible unto the nations, she must be sanctified, and the saints were far from that state. The failure to redeem Zion, the revelation made clear, was ultimately the saints' responsibility, not that of the Jackson citizens. The Missouri saints had refused to impart their substance to the poor, and the church at large did not volunteer enough men for the camp. Before they could succeed in Zion, the saints must learn to consecrate. For now, the elders were to gather up their money purchased land, and only then might they be found throwing down the towers of their enemies and taking possession. But firstly, let my army become very great, and let it be sanctified before me. The revelation was not a signal to retreat, foreshadowing an abandonment to the gathering. Next year in Zion remained Joseph's motto. But the revelation did reroute the Zion impulse. By making sanctification the answer for Zion, the revelation united the church's two programs the gathering to Zion in Jackson County, and the exaltation of the saints. Zion could not go forward until the saints were sanctified. The elders must know more perfectly, concerning their duty, and the things which I require at their hands, the revelation said, and how were they to learn all they must do. This cannot be brought to pass until mine elders are endowed with power from on high. The endowment of power, central to the exaltation of the saints for the past three years became the first step in the redemption of Zion. Both depended on construction of the Kirtland Temple, where the endowment was to be given. The day after the revelation was received, a council appointed the first elders, as they were called, to receive their endowment in Kirtland with the power from on high and to assist in gathering up the strength of the Lord's house, and proclaim the everlasting gospel. Fifteen leading men from Zion were named. In the meantime, the saints in Clay County, the June 22 revelation said, would to lie low, not talk of the judgments on the land, and to make friends, sue for peace, not only to the people that have smitten you, but also to all people. Lift up an ensign of peace, and make a proclamation for peace unto the ends of the earth. That was the hope, but for the moment, the saints knew no peace. Seeing a man with cramps earlier in the week, George A. Smith suspected Asiatic cholera, a plague that had ravaged the country in recent years. During the week beginning June 23, one member after another of the now demilitarized camp was struck with terrible stomach pains. On June 25, the first death occurred, followed a half hour later by the second. Sixty-eight members of the camp contracted the disease during a four-day siege, and fourteen died. George A and others rolled the dead in blankets and buried them without coffins in the bank of a stream. Among the fatalities was Sidney Gilbert, the storekeeper who had managed the negotiations for the Mormons over the past few weeks. When struck blind while praying, Heber C. Kimball saw no way whereby I could free myself from the disease, only to exert myself by jumping and thrashing myself about, until my sight returned to me, and my blood began to circulate in my veins. Jesse Johnson Smith another of Joseph's cousins, died on July 1st. The last entry in Jesse's diary read, The journey was long and tedious temporarily speaking. But we believed it to be according to the mind and will of the Lord. Long afterward, Joseph remembered the suffering that week. While some were digging the grave others stood sentry with their firearms, watching their enemies. The camp was trapped between the hatred of the Missourians and the onslaught of cholera. Responding to the shrieks of pain that filled the camp, Joseph gave the victims flour and whiskey and ministered by laying on hands. Nothing worked. Each time Joseph laid hands on a victim, the disease passed into his own body. I quickly learned by painful experience. He later wrote, that when the great Jehovah decrees destruction upon any people, makes known his determination, man must not attempt to stay his hand. Why else would God punish camp members for seeking relief? Joseph remembered the unsettling contradictions. Elder John S. Carter was the first man who stepped forward to rebuke it, and upon this, 
was instantly seized, and became the first victim in the camp. The men who buried Carter united, covenanted and prayed, hoping the disease would be stayed, but in vain, for while thus covenanting, Eber Wilcox died. Pleading with God attracted a bolt of lightning. Joseph had warned the brethren of punishment for their contentious spirit, and now their bickering brought misery and destruction. No revelation told Joseph that God had sent the cholera. He read his own ideas about deity into the event. In the retelling, Joseph called him Jehovah, whose Old Testament character punished recalcitrance with suffering and death. In the camp's extremity, Joseph seems to have called up a God out of his Puritan past, a God who would destroy his own people if they neglected his commands. This was the God, we must assume, to whom Joseph felt responsible for establishing Zion and preparing his people for exaltation, a God harsh and implacable, inflicting punishment on those who failed. Ravaged by disease, Zion's camp broke up. On June 25th, Joseph wrote his attorneys that the camp was separating into bands and dispersing about the countryside. The campaign was over. George A. Smith received his honorable discharge and a dollar sixteen, his share of the common fund into which all had deposited their money at the outset. Joseph reorganized the Clay County Saints with David Whitmer as president of the council and spent a week giving instructions. On July 9th, Joseph started home with fifteen brethren including George A. The company trudged east through the oppressive summer heat. Crossing one stretch of prairie, they took turns driving off green-headed flies reputedly able to kill a tethered horse in thirty minutes. During the arduous three-week journey, the company's problems were more physical than moral or spiritual. Only once did Joseph detect disunity among the group. Rather than contention, George A. remembered maggot-ridden cheese and watered milk. On July 27 in Indiana, the party divided. Joseph and three others climbed on a coach, leaving the rest of the party to trail along on foot and horse. He arrived in Kirtland around August 1st, George A. got home three days later. At the door of his house, George A. overheard his father praying for his safe arrival. The expedition to Missouri in 1834 has been called Joseph Smith's first major failure. Nothing that Joseph aimed to accomplish came about. Several hundred men spent three months walking 2,000 miles, 14 of them never came home. Nothing the camp did improved the situation in Jackson County. The Saints were still refugees, living in Clay County as barely tolerated aliens. Hoping to pacify the Clay people. The Mormons agreed among themselves to abstain from voting and not to hold public meetings, all to no effect. Four years later, Missourians combined to drive the Mormons across the Mississippi into Illinois. Was Zion's camp a catastrophe? Perhaps, but it was not the unmitigated disaster that it appears to be. Most camp members felt more loyal to Joseph than ever bonded by their hardships. The future leadership of the church came from this group. Nine of the church's original twelve apostles, all seven presidents of the seventy, and sixty-three other members of the seventy marched in Zion's camp. Joseph's own devotion to Zion and the gathering grew more intense. When the Jackson County Committee gave the saints an opportunity to sell out, cut their losses, and start again elsewhere, he refused. A revelation had designated independence as the place for a temple and no other would do. After experiencing Jackson County anger and backing off, Joseph still predicted a return within two years. Charges, not everyone was happy when Zion's camp returned. Within two weeks after getting back from Missouri in early August 1834, Joseph was brought before a high council by the quarrelsome Sylvester Smith. Smith brought charges of criminal conduct against the prophet for mismanagement of monies and properties and was even more angry about the rebukes he had received. The property issue was soon cleared up, but the council spent days investigating Joseph's correction of Sylvester. A settlement reached on August 11th broke down when Sylvester disavowed the decision, and a second council meeting called on August 28th to review the case did not end until almost three in the morning on August 30th. Meanwhile, Reports circulated that Joseph had maligned Sylvester with insulting and abusive language in a manner out of harmony with Joseph's profession as a man of God. Jacob Bump admitted that his mind had been agitated by what he had heard. To clear Joseph's name, the Evening and Morning Star printed the council's findings for the benefit of the church. Everyone wanted to know how their prophet behaved and if he lived in accord with the true principles of his profession as a man of God. On one of the occasions when Joseph was supposedly out of control, 
he was said to have rebuked Sylvester for refusing bread to Parley Pratt, not one of Sylvester's company. Probably wanting to husband the meager supply for his own men, Sylvester told Pratt to look elsewhere for food. Joseph, who could not abide stinginess, was irate. A year before he had criticized Sidney Gilbert for not extending loans to poor migrants in independence whether or not they were credit risks. A continuing theme in the revelations was the requirement to look after the poor. Incensed by Sylvester's refusal, Joseph gave him a tongue lashing. Luke Johnson thought at the time the reproofs were rather severe. Sylvester came in for chastisement again over the incident with Joseph's dog. Joseph threatened to whip Sylvester after Sylvester threatened to kill the dog. According to Brigham Young, Joseph backed off quickly from this heated exchange and asked the men standing nearby if they were not ashamed of such a spirit, confessing that he was. He must have recognized that he had lost control. Young said Joseph's explanation satisfied the men, implying that at first they were shocked by the exchange. David Elliott admitted the occurrence gave him some disagreeable feelings, in a third incident the one involving disagreement over a campsite when an enemy attack was expected, the witnesses testified about the degree of Joseph's anger. When Joseph chastised Sylvester and Lyman White for disobeying orders, Sylvester claimed Joseph had thrown the camp bugle at him. Luke Johnson, who saw it all happen, doubted the charge because the two were so close that Joseph could easily have hit Sylvester had he tried. Johnson thought Joseph had thrown the horn to the ground. Johnson noted somewhat ambiguously that Joseph's reproofs were no more severe than he had often heard him give previously, and that he did not consider him mad as he has been represented. Reproof was to be expected, rage was off limits. Sylvester had hardly brought the charges against Joseph when the hearing turned into a trial of Sylvester himself for bringing false charges. The men hearing Sylvester's complaints composed themselves into a council with Bishop Newell Whitney presiding. The question became what was to be done to arrest the evil, meaning the circulation of false reports about Joseph. Isaac's story, believing the plaster ought to be as large as the wound, urged that an apology from Sylvester be published in the Evening and Morning Star. That opinion prevailed, and an article was prepared announcing that after thorough investigation the council had determined that during the journey to Missouri, Joseph acted in a proper manner and in every respect has conducted himself to the satisfaction of the church. Fifteen men, not council members but present at the proceedings, signed a statement attesting to the justice of the results. But the case was not over. A few days later, Sylvester reneged on his agreement to publish a confession in the Star, and his retraction required a second and more laborious investigation, which again concluded with a requirement that he confess his wrongs against the Prophet. Sylvester signed a single sentence confession and then wrote below signed for fear of punishment, a grudging concurrence at best. His departure from the Mormon fold seemed imminent, but surprisingly he stayed on. On October 28, he published the irksome confession and attested that Joseph had conducted himself worthily. He told the saints everywhere that he sought to put a final end to all evil reports. The camp incident triggered strong feelings. While Sylvester was raging and the members gossiping about reports from the camp, Joseph wrote the Missouri saints that he was met in the face and eyes as soon as I had got home with a catalogue of charges that was as black as the author of lies himself the cry was tyrant, pope, king, usurper, abuser of men, angel, false prophet, prophesying lies in the name of the Lord. The list showed Joseph understood how he looked to his enemies, but the charges infuriated him. He told the Missouri saints he had been unable to regulate my mind sufficiently to give them counsel but was sure his accusers were meat for the devourer the shaft of the destroying angel. If the Sylvester Smith case brought Joseph's leadership into question, it also vindicated the procedures he had put in place for dealing with controversy. The long debates in council settled the great difficulty, as Joseph called it. Sylvester stayed on to become a president of the soon-to-be-appointed Seventy and act for a time as Joseph Smith's clerk. Looking back, Joseph concluded that such experiences may be necessary to perfect the church. A council with many church members present had heard both sides, deliberated, and decided. The fifteen outside members attested to the results and assured the church that every appearance of evil is, in this place, searched out, by implication meaning purported evil in the prophet himself. The high council hearings, along with events during Zion's camp, revealed Joseph's weaknesses along with his strengths. He was a man of strong feeling and will, 
as was apparent in his commitment to this risky and difficult venture in the first place. He would not be defeated by the Moors in Jackson County or the resistance of the Missouri government. Supported by militants like Lyman White, Joseph even showed a willingness to make the military gesture. He spoke of the armies of Israel and gave himself a military title. Some have argued he later made a war department a permanent feature of church organization. But when it came to military action, he backed down. The revelations authorized the saints to defend themselves but made peace the better course. When an actual battle with the Missourians loomed, Joseph negotiated, as he was to do later in Missouri and again in Illinois. His own nature and the military culture of his time prompted militant rhetoric, but he stopped short of bloodshed. As Sylvester Smith learned, Joseph did not like to be crossed. His own followers were sometimes shocked by his flashes of anger. But in the end they backed him. The High Council found Sylvester Smith at fault, not Joseph. They sensed that their prophet had the right to rebuke his followers, fiercely if necessary. Their dismay at his anger was balanced by their love of his good nature. Joseph enjoyed the comradeship of the march and bore the discomforts of the trek without complaint. They knew he did not elevate himself above the ordinary when hardships were involved. He joked and laughed and enjoyed their company. His warm-hearted friendship more than compensated for the occasional tirades. Probably no one in the camp sensed the anxiety under his confident exterior. It was the anguished Joseph of the 1832 history who walked with Zion's camp. Probably referring to the threatened loss of Zion, Joseph wrote to Emma on the way to Missouri, You know that my situation is a very critical one. He might fail. He realized that our numbers and means are altogether too small for the accomplishment of such a great enterprise. He hoped at best to deter the enemy, and terrify them for a little season. Emma's affection sustained him through the difficult time. I hope you will continue to communicate to me by your own hand for this is a consolation to me to converse with you in this way in my lonely moments which is not easily described. The bonhomie and business of the camp could not salve his sorrows. He ended one letter, from yours in the bonds of affliction. He told Emma to comfort the family and look forward to the day when the trials and the tribulations of this life will be at an end. 13. Priesthood and Church Government, 1834-35, the decisions of these quorums are to be made in all righteousness, in holiness and lowliness of heart, meekness and long-suffering, and in faith and virtue and knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness brotherly kindness and charity, doctrine and covenants 1835, 311, Mormonism succeeded when other charismatic movements founded on disputes and irreconcilable ill feelings partly because of the governing mechanisms Joseph put in place early in the church's history. The Sylvester Smith case, involving the prophet himself, showed the strength of the councils and conferences that governed the church. When the charges brought before the August 11th meeting proved serious, the men knew how to form a council. They had been gathering for years into councils of seven or eight men to decide on mission calls and handle transgressors. During the course of Sylvester Smith's hearings, 28 men spoke their minds, some as members of the council, others as observers in the meeting. By the end of the hearings, all sides having spoken, Joseph could say, I now swim in good clean water, with my head out. The characterization of Joseph Smith as the prophet with no gift for administration whose inch 08 movement was saved by the genius of Brigham Young, misses the mark. Joseph did not attend to details the way Young did, but he could certainly organize. Almost all of his major theological innovations involved the creation of institutions, the church, the city of Zion, the school of the prophets, the priesthood, the temple. Joseph thought institutionally more than any other visionary of his time and the survival of his movement can largely be attributed to this gift. Soon after the church was organized Joseph adopted the practice of bringing councils together. Rather than restricting himself to the Methodist pattern of quarterly conferences of elders, Joseph convened conferences or councils. The words were used interchangeably at first, whenever there was business to conduct. Attended on average by eight elders, the meetings were run by a moderator with a clerk taking minutes. In one particularly intense period between the end of August and the middle of November 1831, twelve conferences were convened in addition to the General Church Conference on October 25 and 26. The conferences considered priesthood ordinations, the settlement of church disputes, decisions about who was to go to Zion, the construction of the temple. Ezra Booth was silenced from preaching on September 6 as he slid into apostasy. On October 10, 
Arrangements were made to manage Frederick G. Williams's farm. A conference on October 21st took up an accusation against two brethren for offering abuse to Newell K. Whitney's little child, resulting in a charge to Joseph and Sidney Rigdon to ask the two men to acknowledge their sin or be dealt with according to the law of the church. One conference sent out six elders to visit the several branches of this church setting them in order suggesting how congregational organization was handled. Joseph was not always in charge of the councils he attended. The group itself chose the moderator, shifting the responsibility from one to another of the more experienced men like Sidney Rigdon or Oliver Cowdery, but sometimes turning to new converts like William E. McClellan. Since Joseph received revelations right in the conferences, reports of how revelations came were common. In some respects, Revelation became part of the routine. Joseph could absent himself from these meetings without crippling business. He left Kirtland for months at a time, and the councils carried on in his absence. The men in Missouri managed their affairs without him for years. In 1831, when Oliver Cowdery and John Whitmer stopped in Indiana on their way west with the Revelations, they held two long conferences in Randolph County, Indiana to settle a controversy over common property. Councils made the church self-governing. The process seems incongruous in an organization led by a man who was believed to receive revelation from the mouth of God. How could any opinion but the prophets count? The incongruity brings us back to the conundrum of Joseph Smith's Mormonism. How could an authoritarian religion distribute so much power to individual members? Just as every member was expected to speak scripture by the Holy Ghost, so individual priesthood holders were allowed a voice in church governance, giving them ownership of the kingdom to which they had subjected themselves. The array of governing bodies and relationships formalized in 1834 and 1835 was among Joseph Smith's greatest achievements. In July, after the Clay County High Council was organized, he told it that he had now completed the organization of the church and made it independent enough to function without him. He was premature in proclaiming an end to organizational development, but the statement underscored his belief that organization was crucial to his mission. A revelation told him that this shall be your business and mission in all your lives to preside in council. In many ways, the organization of church government revealed Joseph's thought as much as the doctrine. He believed the structure he created followed the order of heaven in ancient councils. In a time when Protestant churches had lost interest in organizational forms, save to democratize them as far as possible, Joseph built an ever more elaborate structure in emulation of the ancient church as he understood it. While other churches were simplifying and flattening their structures, he erected complicated hierarchies. Layers. In March 1835, the newly called Twelve Apostles asked Joseph for a great revelation to enlarge our hearts, comfort us in adversity and brighten our hopes amidst the powers of darkness. In response, Joseph received the great revelation on priesthood now recorded in section 107 of the LDS Doctrine and Governance. A hundred verses long in the modern edition, the revelation summarized and regularized all the governmental forms that had developed over the past five years, the high councils in Zion and Kirtland, the traveling twelve apostles, the presidency of the church, the division into Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthoods, the quorums of elders, priests, teachers, and deacons the appointment of evangelical ministers or patriarchs. This culminating statement of Joseph's church, building project looks like a blueprint of church structure, but any effort to extract an organizational chart ends in confusion. The overlapping parts and peculiar extensions cannot be sorted out on the basis of the revelation alone. It is best understood as an archaeological site, containing layers of organizational forms each layer created for a purpose at one time and then overlaid by other forms established for other purposes later. The totality has the appearance of an ancient city occupied by a number of civilizations yet composed into a unity by the harmonizing effects of time. In practice, the pieces came together into a complicated but coordinated whole. Picking through the revelation, the limits of Joseph's vision when he organized the church in 1830 quickly become evident. At the outset, he envisioned a simple structure. The statement of beliefs and organization prepared by Cowdery and Joseph in 1829 and 1830 listed a set of officers much like the officers in other churches, elders, priests, teachers, and deacons, 
and closely following the church described in the Book of Mormon. Joseph and Cowdery were the first and second elders like the elders in congregational or Presbyterian churches. The officers had familiar duties like baptizing, blessing the sacrament, and preaching. Very little distinguished them from parallel figures in other denominations. General supervision was exercised by quarterly conferences made up of elders representing their home churches. Nothing in this initial organization would have surprised a Methodist, save for the absence of a bishop to superintend the whole. In 1830, the church was organized as a church like other churches. Priesthood was not mentioned, even though priesthood authority had been given by John the Baptist a year before. In the beginning Joseph and Cowdery did not seem to grasp the importance of the ordination they had received. It took a year or more before the priesthood principle had much effect. This simple plan was soon expanded. Within six months, the initial organization was inadequate for the complicated program Joseph had launched. The Society of Zion in his millenarian world involved operations unknown in ordinary churches, including the Zion economic system that called on immigrants to deed their property to the church and receive back a stewardship proportionate to their needs and talents. A bishop, the missing Methodist officer, was named to accept the consecrations and reassign them according to individual wants and needs. Step by step, the hierarchy unfolded as doctrine and program required new officers. The designation of gathering cities in Independence and Kirtland created a need for governing bodies for each municipality and high councils were formed to serve the purpose. The High Council to regulate Kirtland was organized on February 17, 1834, with twelve high priests called as standing members, contrasted to the earlier ad hoc councils that were composed of whoever was available. Twelve men were named to constitute the council, and the high priests, elders, priests, teachers and deacons that were present who had not been nominated as councillors were then asked to pass their vote whether they were satisfied with the appointment or nomination of the twelve to compose the church council. They agreed unanimously, and the first high council came into existence. Rules were laid down for trying transgressors and handling other church business. Although stationed in Kirtland, this council sowed as a council for the whole church. Kirtland was the seat of government, Joseph explained as Jerusalem was for the New Testament church. Five months later, Joseph organized an equivalent council in Clay County for the saints expelled from Jackson, appointing David Whitmer as president. By the end of 1834, the two councils in Kirtland and Clay had become city councils for the two gathering cities. By implication, the number of councils could then be expanded as more cities were founded. Each new city of a stake of Zion would have its high council of twelve high priests and a presidency of three members. The two councils were a response to a geographical concept emerging from the church's missionary program. Implicit in revelations received in late 1830 and 1831 was a world divided in two, into the mission field and the Zion cities. Missionaries went out into the mission field and brought Israel back to Zion. There was an outside and an inside. In 1834, the portion of the globe considered to be Zion and its stakes came under the jurisdiction of the high councils, providing the stakes with a regular form of government. But the remainder of the world, where there were only scattered branches of the church, remained unorganized. At first Joseph seems to have felt that worship in the mission field would occur spontaneously under the supervision of whatever priesthood was on the scene. Branches by their nature were ephemeral, they were temporary holding tanks where members prepared to gather to Zion. An elder or high priest could call on local members to preach and administer the sacrament and they did. No more organization was necessary. Joseph became more aware of the branches in 1833 and 1834 during his journeys to recruit men and money for Zion's camp. He realized then that these scattered little groups were essential to the church. He needed their men for Zion's camp and their funds to purchase land and pay for temple construction. The branches were not interim places of worship for the scattered saints, but resources to be organized and mobilized in support of the church centers. The responsibility for regulating them fell to the Council of Twelve Apostles whose calling had been foreseen in a revelation in 1829 before the church was organized. The formation of this council met the need for worldwide direction of the church. In February 1835, the apostles were chosen from the Zion's camp men, a group for whom Joseph had particular affection. He prefaced the selection of the apostles with an account of the trials and sufferings of the camp and said God had not designed all this for nothing. 
the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon called out the twelve men and gave each one a blessing, emphasizing the role of the twelve to go forth and gather the elect, implying they were to be the core missionary force. In a sermon after the blessings were completed, Oliver Cowdery told them to bid a long farewell to Kirtland even till the great day come. They would be about their missionary business till your heads are silvered over with age. A few days later, Joseph selected another body of men, largely out of the Zion's camp contingent, to be the Seventy, a title borrowed from several obscure biblical references. Seventies were traveling quorums, as the priesthood units were called, also called to preach the gospel, and to be a special witnesses unto the Gentiles and in all the world. Although charged to preach the gospel of the Son of God to the nations of the earth, the Twelve, in Joseph's conception, fulfilled a second important function of regulating the mission field branches as the high councils regulated Zion and the stakes. Joseph told them they were to preside over all the churches of the saints among the Gentiles. At a meeting in May just before the Twelve left Kirtland, he drew the line more sharply. The Twelve will have no right to go into Zion or any of its stakes and there undertake to regulate the affairs thereof where there is a standing high council. But it is their duty to go abroad and regulate all matters relative to the different branches of the church. By the same token, no standing high council has authority to go into the churches abroad and regulate the matters thereof, for this belongs to the Twelve. The world was divided between the two types of councils, traveling and standing rounding out the plan for church government. A purely expedient method for conducting business had been transformed into a system for governing a world divided between the cities of Zion and the mission field for the time it met the need, though later Joseph gave the twelve supervising authority over both stakes and mission field. So far as the records tell, the idea of councils did not originate in a standard revelation. The councils in Kirtland evolved over a three-year period. The founding document for both high councils appointed in 1834, and for all future high councils, was a set of minutes composed by Clark Orson Hyde for the February 17, 1834, meeting of one of the ad hoc councils. The minutes regularized and extended procedures that had been developing for years. Ad hoc councils had been meeting since the fall of 1831, and one such meeting, on February 17, created the High Council system. The minutes of the meeting were revised by Joseph Smith and then discussed, amended, and approved by the council itself. The council served as a kind of constitutional convention for church government. Speaking of the occasion, Joseph's history said the minutes were read three times and unanimously adopted and received for a form and constitution of the High Council of the Church of Christ hereafter. The priesthood holders plus fourteen private members ratified the decision. The procedure set a startling precedent for the Church. The establishment of a basic governing body by the members of the Council themselves gave their work the status of revelation. The minutes of the Council were included in the Doctrine and Covenants alongside revelations coming directly to Joseph Smith. By putting the work of the councils on the same plane as his own revelations, Joseph set a precedent for inspiration other than his own, revelation through a council. The more formal March 1835 revelation, ratifying the past year's developments in church government, came at the end of the process rather than at the beginning. Joseph acknowledged the inspiration of the council in the provision that the president of the council was to receive revelation. In case of doubt about true policy, the minutes said, the President may inquire and obtain the mind of the Lord by revelation. That was nothing new so long as Joseph Smith presided at the Council, he had frequently received revelations in Council meetings, but the policy applied to Frederick G. Williams or Sidney Rigdon when they held the chair in Joseph's absence, and to David Whitmer running the High Council in Clay County. These Presidents could learn the mind of the Lord as could any president of any high council in any stake of Zion. Joseph told the high council in clay that through them the will of the Lord might be known on all important occasions in the building up of Zion, and establishing truth in the earth. Rather than monopolizing inspiration, Joseph spread it widely, always with the proviso that revelation at one level did not regulate the authority above. In his concluding charge to the twelve apostles, Joseph admonished them to record their decisions. If a more complete records had been kept of previous council meetings, he said, the minutes would decide almost every point of doctrine, which might be agitated. The Apostles' minutes, he said, will be one of the most important records ever seen. Such decisions will forever remain upon the record, 
and appear an item of covenant or doctrine. Those words were weighted with meaning because doctrine and covenants was the title for the compilation of revelations Joseph was preparing for publication. His charge implied that the twelve apostles as well as the prophet would be a conduit for revelation. Joseph seemed surprisingly eager to reduce his own part in receiving revelations. He seemed uneasy about constantly appealing to heaven for direction. He told one inquirer that the Lord should not be petitioned for every little thing especially if revelations on the same subject had already been given. It is a great thing to inquire at the hand of God or to come into his presence and we feel fearful to approach him upon subjects that are of little or no consequence especially about things the knowledge of which men ought to obtain in all sincerity before God for themselves. They should search out their instructions and rely more on their own judgment. Years before, Edward Partridge had been told in a revelation that it is not meet that I command in all things. That reluctance, contradictory as it might seem in a man who gained great authority from his revelations, became more pronounced in 1835. After the organization of the Twelve Apostles, the frequency of canonical revelations dropped precipitously. The commandments to particular people, included among the revelations in the early years, were omitted from later compilations. Instead, Joseph's history was filled with the minutes of the Twelve Apostles' meetings as if they had become the source of inspiration. The Acts of the Apostles from the New Testament, a history of their activities, became the pattern for revelation rather than the visions of Moses on Sinai. At a moment when Joseph's own revelatory powers were at their peak, he divested himself of sole responsibility for revealing the will of God and invested that gift in the councils of the church, making it a charismatics bureaucracy. Priesthood the great revelation of March 1835 actually combined two revelations, the latter half, comprising verses 59 to 100 in the current LDS Doctrine and Covenants, was received in November 1831, and the first half, verses 1 to 58, three and a half years later, in connection with organizing the Twelve in February 1835. The earlier revelation, as would be expected, emphasized the offices known up until 1831, elders, priests, teachers, and deacons, from the original simple organization, plus a bishop for the city of Zion, and high priests as revealed to Joseph in June 1831. The 1835 portion contains the passages on councils, a later development. One verse mentions the standing high councils, at the stakes of Zion, another the high council in Zion, and a third the twelve traveling counselors called to be the twelve apostles, or special witnesses of the name of Christ in all the world. These were the councils formed to govern the gathering cities on the one hand and the mission field on the other. Besides these two organizational layers, a priesthood strata runs through the 1835 revelation. In its schema, priesthood infuses the two preceding layers, the simple church of April 1830 and the councils for managing the cities of Zion and the branches. The importance of priesthood was not primarily organizational but grew out of its part in exaltation. Priesthood administered the critical ordinances of baptism and laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. The higher priesthood, the priesthood of Melchizedek, held the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. One revelation said its power was to have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, to have the heavens opened unto them, to commune with the general assembly and church of the firstborn and to enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father, and Jesus the Mediator of the New Covenant. But priesthood with its mysterious exalting power was also integrated into the organizational structure. The mystical powers of priesthood blended with the everyday business of running the church. The president of the high priesthood was the president of the church. The bishop, whose office was basically for managing property in Zion and caring for the poor was made president of the Aaronic priesthood. High councils were composed of high priests. It took nearly two years for priesthood to emerge as the ruling principle of church government. The ordination of high priests in June 1831 had a huge impact on Joseph's conception of priesthood. The extraordinary experience of having the powers of God and of the adversary manifest on the same occasion was not soon forgotten. But the governing scheme laid out in 1830 of first and second elders aided by quarterly conferences of elders, left no room for high priests in the management of church business, even though after June 1831 they were the ranking priesthood officers. High priests administered spiritual blessings, 
But what was their role in church government? The first revelation of their leadership function came in November 1831 with a commandment calling for one to be appointed of the high priesthood to preside over the priesthood, and he shall be called president of the high priesthood of the church. At the time, the revelation had surprisingly little effect. The office of president remained in the background for more than a year. Joseph was running the church through his informal councils, each chaired by a moderator chosen for the occasion. He did not preside in these councils in any formal sense, although his influence was paramount. The 1831 revelation calling for a president of the high priesthood was not even included in the first batch of revelations prepared for publication that fall. As much as Joseph valued his revelations, he did not ascribe much importance to this one, so far as can be told. The 1831 revelation received little public attention until he attached it to the great revelation on priesthood given to the Twelve Apostles in March 1835. He showed no eagerness to grasp the power that the presidency of the high priesthood seemingly granted him. Not until the spring of 1833 did the presidency of the high priesthood register as a notable office in church government. The Grand Priesthood Revelation of 1835, however, indicated that the very nature of the Melchizedek priesthood was administrative and presidential. The Melchizedek priesthood holds the right of presidency, and has power and authority over all the offices in the church, said the priesthood revelation, and by 1835, priesthood controlled the entire structure of church government. This blending of priesthood and administrative authority extended down through the ranks to the extremities of the church. Every priesthood holder, virtually every male member, held membership in a quorum, a word meaning a select company. Deacons, teachers, priests, and elders were formed into separate quorums made up of between 12 and 96 members, each with its own presidency. In their quorums, the men received instructions from their presidencies on the duties of their offices. The combination of sacral priesthood power and church government was unusual in the visionary tradition. The Shakers, like the Mormons in many ways, also had authoritarian leadership and structured organization to go with their ecstatic visions, elders and eldresses governed families of a hundred or so, and deacons and deaconesses managed temporal affairs. The mature men, a kind of council, played a leading role. Strict obedience was required of all members. But no sacral priesthood exercised leadership or held office. In emphasizing priesthood, Mormonism moved to the other end of the religious spectrum toward Roman Catholicism with its sacraments and the mysterious power of the priests to transform bread and wine into Christ's flesh and blood. The sacral and the ecclesiastical combined in Mormonism as in Catholicism, adding to the strength of church government. This vision of priesthood governance was crystallizing in the spring of 1833 when Joseph and Frederick G. Williams were planning the temples for Zion and Kirtland. The potency of the priesthood was manifest in the altars really banks of seats and pulpits constructed in the assembly rooms of the temples. At one end of the room, altars were provided for the president of the high priesthood and his counselors, for the bishop, for high priests, and elders, all offices of the higher priesthood. At the other end, the presidency of the lower priesthood, the priests, the teachers, and the deacons each had an altar. The priesthood structure stood preeminent among the governing agencies of the church. The councils that managed the day-to-day -day business had no place on these stands. No seats were set aside for the high councils or the twelve apostles. The presidency, the bishop, and the priesthood quorums were the primary structures of church government. Judging from the temple altars, the names of the temples in the city of Zion, and the constitutions given by Revelation, the church as a whole was conceived as an organization of priesthood. All other authorities, or offices in the church, the 1835 priesthood revelation said, are appendages to this priesthood. Absent from these leadership positions was a place for women. They were unrepresented on the stands and in church government, except to the extent that their husbands and fathers stood in for them. Women had no equivalent to the quorums for men. The organizational plan would continue to evolve but at this point women were subsumed under the men, the same assumption prevailing in the American political system in 1835. Mormon women received instruction from their fathers and husbands, spoke their minds in the family, and exercised spiritual gifts in public meetings. Family. Winding through the great priesthood revelation of 1835 was a fourth theme that would in time bring women into priesthood government. In addition to the simple church, the councils for the city stakes of Zion, and priesthood, 
The final layer was lineage and family. A passage in the 1835 revelation on bishops provided that no man has a legal right to this office, to hold the keys of this priesthood, except he be a literal descendant of Aaron. Claiming an office by virtue of descent struck a dissonant note in a Protestant and Republican world where calls to the ministry came from God and public office went to the meritorious. The idea went back to monarchical society with its hereditary titles and to ancient Judaism and with its tribe of hereditary priests, the Levites, and the requirement that priests should be sons of Aaron. The return to ancient lineage priesthood appears to be another manifestation of Joseph's penchant for Hebrew religion and no more than a gesture, considering that the next verse provides that high priests may fill the office of bishop as they may officiate in any office. The assignment of the bishopric by lineage had no practical effect if high priests could occupy the office regardless. Yet the idea was not allowed to drop. Later in the 1835 revelation, the principle of descent in the office of bishop was restated with greater emphasis, for unless he is a literal descendant of Aaron he cannot hold the keys of that priesthood, immediately qualified again by the provision of high priests qualifying to be bishop. With little chance of actually installing descendants of Aaron as bishops, since none were known in the church, Joseph seemed to be highlighting the general principle of descent through bloodlines as if that had some importance in itself. Appointment by lineage governed appointment to another of us first announced in the 1835 revelation. The twelve apostles were authorized to appoint evangelical ministers in large branches of the church and told that the order of this priesthood was confirmed to be handed down from father to son, and rightly belongs to the little descendants of the chosen seed. The title evangelical minister quickly went out of usage in the church, replaced by the term patriarch. Why evangelical minister was ever used, considering the title suggested a gospel preacher, was never explained, though it probably was based on the use of the word evangelist in the New Testament. The model for church organization patriarch much more accurately conveyed the duties of the office, which were to bless people as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob blessed their offspring and prophesied their futures. As was true for the ancient patriarchs, the priesthood office of patriarch descended from father to son. The office emerged out of the practice of public blessings administered by Joseph and by various fathers, most notably Joseph's own father, Joseph Smith Sr. Gradually these spontaneous blessings evolved into more systematic blessings of comfort and direction and were regularized in the office of patriarch. At the School of the Prophets in January 1833, as Joseph was about to wash his father's feet, he asked for a father's blessing. Joseph Sr. laid his hands on his son's head and promised that he would continue in his priest's office until Christ come. The following fall, Joseph began blessing the men closest to him, Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams and others. Joseph wrote down meditations on their characters that melded into blessings. Williams, Joseph felt, is not a man of many words but is ever winning because of his constant mind. God grant that he may overcome all evil. The next month he entered similar blessings for his father, mother, and sisters, his brothers Hiram, Samuel, and William, and Oliver Cowdery. Of his father, Joseph wrote that when his head is fully ripe he shall behold himself as an olive tree whose branches are bowed down with much fruit. In these early meditations, he wove blessings, family, and the Old Testament patriarchs into a fabric of clan, spirituality, and priesthood. In late 1833 or 1834, Joseph ordained his father as patriarch, there is a dispute over whether it was December 1833 or December 1834. Although couched in formal language, Joseph's blessing on Joseph Sr. expressed the feelings of a son for a father who had suffered repeated defeats. This was a man who had lost one farm when his storekeeping business failed, who had been reduced to tenancy for 14 years while his children were young and then lost a second farm when he missed the mortgage payments. Fifty-eight years old when the church was organized, Joseph Sr. was back in tenancy, with no house or land to call his own. Defeated by the rigors of the economic order, he was told by his son he would be a prince over his posterity. Blessed of the Lord is my father, Joseph said, for he shall stand in the midst of his posterity and shall be comforted by their blessings when he is old and bowed down with years and he shall be called a prince over them. Like Adam, he would assemble his children, his one undoubted accomplishment, 
and sit in the general assembly of patriarchs, even in council with the Ancient of Days when he shall sit and all the patriarchs with him, and shall enjoy his right and authority under the direction of the Ancient of Days. Whatever else Joseph Senior lacked, his seed shall rise up and call him blessed. His name shall be had in remembrance to the end. Joseph Senior seemed to understand that his sons had redeemed his life. When he blessed Joseph and Hiram in December 1834, he thanked them for enduring the hardships of their early lives. Hiram, Joseph Senior said, had borne the burthen and heat of the day and labored much for the good of thy father's family. The father was grateful for Hiram's kindness in tolerating Joseph Senior's weakness. Thou hast always stood by thy father, and reached forth the helping hand to lift him up, when he was in affliction, and though he has been out of the way through wine, thou hast never forsaken him, nor laughed him to scorn. Joseph Senior's candid words speak the sorrows of a failing father in a cruel time. Besides his business failures, his weakness for wine brought him down and opened him to the scorn of his own children. Joseph Senior was grateful that his sons did not laugh, for all these kindnesses the Lord my God will bless thee. In return, he could bless Hiram with the same blessings with which Jacob blessed his son Joseph, for thou art his true descendant. He could not give his son wealth, but he could say thy posterity shall be numbered with the house of Ephraim, and with them thou shalt stand up to crown the tribes of Israel. Joseph Senior could make these promises because Joseph Jr. had given him priesthood, while the father had given his son only hardship. Joseph Senior's blessing on Joseph Jr. acknowledged that thou hast suffered much in thy youth, and the poverty and afflictions of thy father's family have been a grief to thy soul. Joseph Jr had mourned his family's humiliations and assumed responsibility for lifting them from their low state. Thou hast stood by thy father, and like Shem, would have covered his nakedness, rather than see him exposed to shame. There must have been times when Joseph supported his father through public humiliation. When the daughters of the Gentiles laughed, Joseph Senior said to his son, Thy heart has been moved with a just anger to avenge thy kindred. The words may explain why Joseph joined his father in money-digging ventures despite his reluctance, why he stayed home from church when his mother took the other children to Presbyterian meetings, why Joseph wept when his long unchurched father was baptized into the Church of Christ on the day of its organization. He had made his father's pain his own. Now, at last, the father could bless his son with the blessings of thy fathers Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Joseph Sr. had given his son nothing for a worldly inheritance, and Joseph Jr. had met this lack by giving his father the power to bless his sons. In the seating in the Kirtland Temple, Joseph Sr. sat in the highest pulpit above his son. Joseph Sr.'s blessings suggest the personal meaning of priesthood to early members. Whether weak or strong, rich or poor, priesthood holders could pass priesthood to their sons. The 1835 priesthood revelation named the patriarchs who received the priesthood from Father Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalaleel, Jared, Enoch, and Methuselah. After Adam died, Lamech received the priesthood from Seth and Noah from Methuselah. As a later revelation was to say, the priesthood came down from the fathers. Priesthood was a father's legacy to his son counting for more than lands and herds. In the overall plan, material possessions had a part too. Zion promised an inheritance to all who migrated there. Fathers who lacked the wealth to provide for their children, as many did in this fast-moving age, were promised land in the holy city. The word inheritance for describing properties in Zion expressed a father's wish to bestow a legacy on his children. In restoring priesthood, Joseph restored fatherhood. All of these themes were layered into the revelation on priesthood in March 1835. The remnants of the first church organization of April 1830 can be glimpsed in the offices of elders, priests, teachers, and deacons, the most familiar Protestant offices in 1830. By early 1831, the Zion layer of bishops was added and then, in 1834, high councils to regulate the church in Zion's city and its stakes. A year later, the Travelling Council of Apostles was formed to carry the gospel to the world, assisted by the Seventies, and regulate branches in the mission field. Running through all the offices is the authority or priesthood with its power to perform ordinances and bestow spiritual blessings, the exalting authority that brought people to God. Instead of remaining an ethereal force, set above practical affairs, 
priesthood ran the church, high priests served as bishops, they occupied the seats in the high council, and the three presidents of the high priesthood, the first presidency, presided over the whole church. The final office, evangelical minister, or patriarch, linked the church to the antiquity of Adam and his descendants down to Noah, harking back to a time when priesthood came through lineage and priesthood and fatherhood were equated. The revelation restored those familial elements of priesthood, perhaps to heal the wounds inflicted on fatherhood by the modern economy. Church Organization Chart, 1835 Administrative, First Presidency, President of the High Priesthood, First Counselor, Second Counselor, Twelve Apostles, Preside over Branches in the Mission Field, High Councils of Twelve High Priests, Preside over Stakes of Zion, Priesthood. Melchizedek Priesthood, High Priests, Seventies, Elders, Aaronic Priesthood, Bishop, President, Priests, Teachers, Deacons, Patriarch, Political Theory, What did this vision of priesthood and church government mean to Joseph? What was accomplished by raising up a priesthood hierarchy in a democratic age? The implications of this labyrinthine organization are complex and contradictory. The democratic elements are easily identified in the overall structure the distribution of offices to all male members and the elimination of a professional clergy. No clerical class ever formed in Mormon congregations, and no special education was required of its preachers. Ordinary converts took charge of the little branches that grew up in the missionary's wake. Priesthood was a right of citizenship in the kingdom of God. The democratic elements were underscored by calling the chief church officer and the leaders of quorums president. In the same spirit, a later addition to an early revelation provided that no person is to be ordained to any office in this church, where there is a regularly organized branch of the same, without the vote of that church. Even the three members of the church presidency were brought before conferences of members for approval. But the confirmation of officers was not an election. Approval by the people indicated that officers were upheld by the confidence, faith and prayer of the church, not that the officers represented the people's interests. The people had no political standing in Mormon thought. The word people never appears in the revelations except in phrases like all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. The church system was quite different from popular government. The latter was based in a fundament of popular sovereignty. Church officers served the people but were not beholden to them. In the church, God was sovereign. The revelation on priesthood does not locate the origins of authority exactly in divine ordination either. One would expect Joseph Smith to buttress his authority by highlighting his call from God, but one looks in vain in the revelation on priesthood for a passage about transmitting power from heaven to earth from God to Joseph Smith. The priesthood revelation is not even given in the voice of God. It opens with an oblique sentence obscuring the identity of the speaker. There are, in the church, two priesthoods, namely, the Melchizedek and the Aaronic, including the Levitical priesthood. The speaker remains unidentified until halfway through the text, where the older portion of the revelation begins. Until then, a knowing guide describes priesthood as if to Nevites. The classic Thus saith the Lord is never sounded. An experienced priest leads us through a temple he knows well. Why the first is called the Melchizedek priesthood, we are told in the opening lines, is because Melchizedek was such a great high priest. Our guide knows priesthood ways. Before his day it was called the Holy Priesthood, after the order of the Son of God. The title has been shortened out of respect or reverence to the name of the Supreme Being. The origins of priesthood are never revealed and, according to the revelation, it had no beginning. The priesthood goes back before the foundation of the world. This ancient order has always existed, descending from one ancient priest to the next. Only an occasional disruption in the orderly sequence required reordination under the hands of God. And Joseph Smith is not such an exception. He received his priesthood from John the Baptist, Peter, James, John, and, later, Elijah. The revelation locates the source of authority in an ancient order coming down through time. The Melchizedek priesthood, we are told, has presided over all the offices in the church, in all ages of the world. Now priesthood order is being reconstituted in the latter days. These peculiar conceptions make it difficult to understand how priesthood could find its place among the governments of Joseph's day. Would not priesthood look like an alien system from another age? The revelations have little to say about democracy, the form of government to which priesthood had to be compared, but the contradictions, it would seem, 
would make it impossible for converts to live under the priesthood in the church and function as democratic citizens in the general society. In theory, the great advantage of democratic government was the effective containment of power, the traditional enemy of liberty. The change from monarchical to republican government had been motivated by a desire to contain the abuses suffered under British rule. By placing ultimate political authority in the hands of the people, democracy kept rulers in check. Subjecting them to regular elections meant they could not stray too far from the public interest. Like a democracy, church government had provisions for removing bad officials, including fallen prophets. The president of the church could be tried before the church's common council, consisting of the bishop and twelve councillors. John Corrill, the cool-headed member who left when he would not yield to Joseph's authority, claimed he was assured of democratic procedures for checking power, Smith and Rigdon taught the church that these authorities, in ruling or watching over the church, were nothing more than servants to the church, and that the church, as a body, had the power in themselves to do anything that either or all of these authorities could do, and that if either or all of these constituted authorities became deranged or broken down, or did not perform their duty to the satisfaction of the church, the church had a right to rise up in a body and put them out of office, make another selection and reorganize them, and thus keep in order, for the power was in the people and not in the servants. But Coril exaggerated the importance of restraints on power under priesthood government. Limitations on the higher authorities functioned only at the margins of church activity. The provision for trying the church president resembled impeachment in a democratic government, a drastic resort in an emergency. Ordinary day-by-day -day checks on power had almost no place in priesthood government. The democratic concern about political power seemed beside the point when the power of the priesthood was the power of God. In the Revelations, the word power referred to the Lord's power, not to the power of government. The power and authority of the higher, or Melchizedek priesthood, is to hold the keys of all the spiritual blessings of the church. The connection with God transformed power from a necessary evil to a power to be magnified embraced, pursued. Rather than restricting God's power, people wanted it to fill their lives. Instead of being a danger, power fulfilled their deepest desire. Priesthood government was desirable because in the ordinances thereof the power of godliness is manifest. Instead of suspicion, there was trust and yearning. Power was not to be checked but released and expanded. The problem of priesthood power was not containment, but worthiness. To acquire the power of God and exercise it suitably, the holders of power had to make themselves acceptable. What manner of men ought ye to be? Was the question. Priesthood councils aimed for righteous administration, for decisions made in all righteousness, in holiness and lowliness of heart, meekness and long-suffering, and in faith and virtue and knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness brotherly kindness and charity. Men qualified themselves for office by their virtue. High council trials for unworthy behavior served the purpose of elections in democratic government by removing the unworthy from office. Joseph learned by hard experience about the temptations of power. A few years later, he reflected on the universal tendency of men to abuse authority. We have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men as soon as they get a little authority as they suppose they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. But he would not resort to institutional restraints like the United States Constitution's checks and balances. Repentance was the solution to bad government. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood only by persuasion by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness and by love unfeigned. He assumed that the priesthood instilled kindness, and pure knowledge. The identity or priesthood holders as servants of God was expected to overcome the human tendency to dominate. As he said, the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven and the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness priesthood had to be heavenly and godly. It created the moral environment that established the terms of power. As an ideal, righteousness served priesthood government as equality serves democracy. Never perfectly realized in practice, righteousness and equality constitute the inner spirit of their respective governmental systems. Ultimately, God checked unrighteous exercise of priesthood power. Unrighteous church government would collapse. The heavens withdraw themselves. The spirit of the Lord is grieved and when it has withdrawn our men to the priesthood or the authority of that man.
The priesthood model of righteous government was akin to political theories of the 18th century. In its emphasis on virtue in rulers and people, church government resembled the classical republicanism of the revolutionary generation and government by a patriot king who sought only the good of the nation. In either republican or monarchical forms, good government in these theories required virtue at the center. In the dark times of the confederation, John Jay wrote to George Washington that the mass of men are neither wise nor good and the virtue like the other resources of a country, can only be drawn to a point and exerted by strong circumstances ably managed, or a strong government ably administered. The problem was how to bring virtuous men to power, whether as patriot kings or as a corps of dedicated citizens ruling for the public good. Though kindred in spirit, priesthood government went far beyond classical republicanism or idealized monarchy in bringing people to God. Priesthood government sought to redeem people, not just serve their interests. Priests were godly teachers rather than protectors of the people's rights. Priesthood government was redemptive. High priests held the keys of all the spiritual blessings of the church. Aaronic priests held the keys of the ministering of angels and administered ordinances like baptism. People did not submit to the priesthood in the sense of yielding their wills to higher authority. They received it, as an 1832 revelation said, All they who receive this priesthood receiveth me saith the Lord, for he that receiveth my servants receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth my father, and he that receiveth my father receiveth my father's kingdom. Therefore, all that my father hath shall be given unto him. Under priesthood authority, as outlined in the Revelations, the exercise of power was to be wholly benevolent, receiving and giving, not ordering and submitting. Government was to bless people, properly exercised, authority eliminated coercion. Priests in this kingdom would rule like God himself without force. Thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion, and without compulsory means it shall flow unto thee for ever and ever. Joseph Smith is famous for saying that he governed his people by a thread. I teach them correct principles, and they govern themselves. Joseph Smith knew, of course, that church power, especially his own, would not appear benevolent in a democratic society. So much authority in a single person set off alarms. As he told the Missouri Saints, people looked on him as a tyrant, Pope, King, usurper. Besides the repeated charges of his enemies, close associates criticized him for abusing authority. Considering the traditional dread of unchecked power, the charges seem inevitable. Joseph's confidence in the righteousness of rulers seems naive. The accepted wisdom of the founding era in United States history was that, as David Hume put it, in contriving any system of government every man ought to be supposed a knave. Joseph's plan of church government assumed the opposite, priesthood holders could be trusted with power. They would constitute a government that blessed and redeemed people and was received with gladness rather than fear and suspicion. 14. Visitors, 1835, curiosity to see a man that was reputed to be a Jew caused many to call during the day and more particularly at evening suspicions were entertained that the said Joshua was the noted Matthias of New York, spoke so much of in the public prints on account of the trials he underwent in that place before a court of justice after supper proposed that he should deliver a lecture to us, he did so sitting in his chair. Joseph Smith, Journal, November 9, 1835, by the mid-1830s. Joseph was spending hours each week with visitors. While engaged in copying blessings one day, Cowdery noted that we were thronged a part of the time with company, so that our labor, in this thing, was hindered, but we obtained many precious things. The next day Joseph wrote that while he was at home writing blessings for my most beloved brethren, I have been hindered by a multitude of visitors. Joseph enjoyed the company. One entry recorded a visit from a party leaving for Missouri. Joy filled our hearts and we blessed them and bid them Godspeed and promised them a safe journey and took them by the hand and bid them farewell for a season. Oh, may God grant them long life and good days. Joseph wrote those sentences in his own hand, expressing, as always, more emotion than entries made by his scribes. Some of the visitors were strangers, curious about Mormonism. By 1835, News of the Mormons was becoming public knowledge. As early as the summer of 1831, James Gordon Bennett, touring the state with Martin Van Buren, filed a story with the Morning Enquirer and Courier in New York City that began, You have heard of Mormonism, who has not? Paragraph has followed paragraph in the newspapers, recounting the movements, 
detailing their opinions and surprising distant readers with the traits of a singularly new religious sect which had its origin in this state. Looking for the sensational, newspaper editors seized upon reports and passed the word along. A Mormon-owned newspaper led to the visit of the Reverend John Hewitt in June 1835. Hewitt came to investigate the Mormons on behalf of Congregation of Christians in Barnsley. England. A letter from the group referred to one of your papers brought here by a merchant from New York. On the basis of this report, the English believers recognize the Mormons as kindred spirits. The Lord hath seen our joy and gladness to hear, the letter said, that he was raising up a people for himself in that part of the New World, as well as here. Hewitt's visit, though it led nowhere, raised the question of affiliations and alliances with other religious movements in the 1830s. Hewitt was introduced as a one-time mathematics teacher in the Rotherham Independent Seminary and pastor of a church in Barnsley. Excommunicated from the Church of England for teaching new doctrines, he had been preaching to a flock who followed him out of the church. After two years, he had come to America to explore the possibility of migration, perhaps to join forces with the Mormons. Many will follow. The letter assured the saints, should he approve of the country, etc., who will help the cause, because the Lord hath favored them with this world's goods. Joseph Size must have lingered on that sentence, considering the impoverished state of the church treasury. The Barnsley Christians assured the saints of their resolve to come whatever the opposition. They had heard of the attacks on the Mormons and were not discouraged. We understand that persecution had been great among you, or would be, but we were commanded not to fear for he would be with us. Although Joseph knew nothing of Hewitt's church, the group's beliefs resembled those of the Mormons. Following the New Testament practice, they too called themselves saints. One sentence in the letter prayed, Oh, may our faith increase that he may have evangelists, apostles, and prophets, filled with the power of the Spirit, and performing his will in destroying the works of darkness. The Catholic Apostolic Church, as the Barnsley group's larger affiliation was later called, sought to restore the apostleship and other offices of the New Testament Church. Between 1832 and 1835, church leaders in London had appointed twelve apostles by revelation, and the congregation in Barnsley, hearing of the Mormon prophet and possibly of the appointment of the twelve, had been intrigued. The English apostles were set apart on July 14, 1835 just six months after the Mormon apostles in Kirtland. The Catholic Apostolic Church, or congregations gathered under apostles, the name they preferred, originated in the preaching of Edward Irving, a Scottish Presbyterian who had moved to London in 1822 and quickly attracted a fashionable following. So large and stylish were his congregations that listeners' coaches lined up the four miles outside the Caledonian Chapel in Hatton Garden. His followers included members of Parliament rich lawyers and bankers, and clergymen from the Church of England and the Scottish Kirk. Thomas Carlyle, the famed essayist, came to hear him, and George Canning, the British Foreign Minister, mentioned Irving's name favorably in Parliament. Irving's views resembled those of the millenarians who had convened in Aylbury, England, in 1826 to study the timing of the Second Coming. The clergymen and laymen, though differing on details, agreed that our blessed Lord will shortly appear accompanied by heavy judgments on the church and its final destruction. During this time, the Jews would be restored to their own land, and at the end of the judgments, the universal blessedness of the millennium would commence. Preaching on millennial themes, Irving shared the excitement spreading through England and Ireland between 1826 and 1830 about the coming end. In preparation for these final events, Irving believed, spiritual gifts, like tongues, prophecy, and healing would be bestowed on the church along with the apostolic authority to give the Holy Ghost. When he heard stories of people speaking prophetic utterances in the west of Scotland, he went to investigate. His followers prayed fervently for a return of spiritual powers, relying on the same promise in Joel 2, that Moroni quoted to Joseph Smith about your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. In 1831, prophesying and tongues broke out in Irving's London congregation. Many were impressed but public opinion, offended by doctrinal excesses, turned against him. The trustees of his London church, backed by the London Presbytery, 
removed him from office. In 1833 Irving was cut off from the Church of Scotland. His followers regrouped and formed independent congregations as a movement to warn and prepare Christianity. Seven congregations met in London, and others collected throughout England and Scotland. Unfortunately for Irving, he was discredited after his excommunication. In 1834, broken in spirit, he died, and the movement came under the control of a strong-willed lawyer, J. B. Cardale, allied with the millenarian Henry Drummond. They set about to institutionalize prophecy and speaking in tongues. During worship services, prophets sat alongside the preachers and interrupted sermons with spontaneous utterances. Apostles were called by the utterances of these prophets. Cardale, the first apostle, went about the church with Edward Taplin, one of the prophets, selecting others. The Council of Zion, made up of representatives of the seven London churches, set apart the apostles in imitation of the missionary calls of Paul and Barnabas. The Kirtland Mormons knew nothing of this history when Hewitt arrived in 1835. He came in the spirit of investigation that had taken Irving's friends to the west of Scotland to investigate spiritual gifts. The Barnsley congregation, a satellite of the London churches, wanted to know if there was in fact a prophet with the Holy Ghost in America. They may also have been contemplating the advantages of migration as the letter suggested. In any event, Hewitt's involvement with the Mormons was brief. He left at once for Fairport, ten miles north of Kirtland on Lake Erie. The Kirtland brethren expected a prompt return but never heard from him again. A letter to Fairport followed by a visit from Cowdery evoked no response. The last the Mormons heard. Hewitt had opened a school in Painesville. Were the Mormons ready to join forces with kindred spirits like the Catholic Apostolic Church? Irving emerged from a vortex of English millenarianism that bore many resemblances to Mormonism. The Irvingites shared the Mormon sense of an imminent second coming for which the world must prepare. Both thought the Christian churches were irreparably dysfunctional. The millenarians believed the Jews would return to their own land and be converted. They doubtless knew of Joseph S. C. F. Frey, a converted Jew and head of the London Society for Promoting Christianity amongst the Jews, who believed the ten lost tribes dwelt among the American Indians. If Joseph had learned of these groups, would he have considered a combined effort to preach the second coming of Christ? The millenarian fervor burned brightly in Britain in the late 1820s. Were the grounds for an alliance? Other religious movements were amalgamating to form stronger denominations. The most notable was the merger of the followers of Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone. Both had broken from the Presbyterians earlier in the century over the restoration of New Testament Christianity. Campbell had gathered followers in Western Virginia and Ohio. Stone in Kentucky and Ohio. In 1832, representatives of these restorationist groups merged under the name Disciples of Christ. Restorationist Christian congregations in New England allied themselves under the working title of the Christian Connection, which later evolved into the Christian Church. Where actual denominations were not formed, people with similar doctrinal interests met in conferences, like the Millenarians at Albury to work on biblical prophecies. The Mormons were left out of all these conversations. They were not even considered, save for Hewitt's congregation in Barnsley, as candidates for an alliance. Mormonism resisted ecumenism. An 1842 editorial in the Nauvoo Times and Seasons about the Catholic Apostolic Church, possibly by Joseph Smith, indicated why a merger was impossible. The editorial acknowledged that the Irvinites had come close to the truth perhaps the nearest of any of our modern sectarians. They had apostles, prophets, and the gifts of tongues and healing. But Irving mistakenly believed all supernatural manifestations were of God and honored the prophetesses who spoke strange utterances. This recognition put Irving in a subordinate position. When his followers prophesied, Mr. Irving, or any of his ministers had to keep silence a position Joseph Smith would never accept. Joseph kept the ultimate authority to himself, while encouraging all the brethren to speak by the Holy Ghost and bestowing on every council the authority to receive revelation for its domain, Joseph remained the prophet for the church, the only one to write in the name of God. He had seen the error in acknowledging Hiram Page's seer stone in the very first year of the church's organization. Six months later, he quelled the visionaries in Kirtland shutting down the kind of spontaneous outbursts that paralyzed Irving and his colleagues. So eager were the knights for divine manifestations that they embraced the slightest trace of spiritual gifts as words of prophecy, 
and as a result prophecy brought chaos to the church. Joseph, blessed with an abundance of revelation, felt no need to embrace every outburst as precious intelligence from heaven. His own revelations came so frequently and authoritatively that he dismissed lesser manifestations, reserving the role of chief revelator for himself. Any effort at ecumenical collaboration had to come to terms with Joseph's authority. Differing views of the canon also stood in the way. Others could see that the Bible did not restrict Joseph's revelations. He expanded as well as explicated scripture. While saturated with Bible language, the Book of Mormon was an entirely new history of a people whose existence was scarcely glimpsed in the Bible. In the Book of Moses, Joseph added pages to the biblical accounts of Enoch, Moses, and Adam. His new histories and doctrines were tied to the Bible, and the Mormon elders claimed they taught an authentic Bible gospel, but for Joseph, the Bible was a gate, not a fence. Joseph staring, his blasphemous audacity, his enemies would say, erected a barrier to collaboration. Monstrous claims, Josiah Quincy called them in 1844. What point was there in looking for common ground? When Joseph had departed for other realms entirely, he created a transbiblical world unlike anything known in the Christian churches and had no interest in forming alliances with less venturous souls. Matthias, later that fall, Joseph received a visit from another potential ally. On a Monday morning in November, a man fated to influence the modern understanding of Joseph Smith far out of proportion to the length of his stay arrived in Kirtland. Some historians define Joseph's place in American history by his seeming similarities to this tall, slender, gray-bearded visitor who called himself Joshua the Jewish minister. The stranger wore a sea-green frock coat, and pantaloons of the same, black fur hat with narrow brim and while he spoke, he shut his eyes and scowled. Not one to be put off by appearances, Joseph may have taken Joshua seriously at first. They talked for most of the day. Joseph gave a lengthy account of his early visions, a story he did not often tell, and, at Joseph's invitation, Joshua discoursed on Daniel's vision of the figure with feet of iron and clay which Joshua said symbolized the confusion and disunion in modern society. He recommended withdrawal from this blighted nation to avoid being trapped in its ruins, sentiments with which Joseph would have agreed. Curious to see a reputed Jew, a number of Kirtland saints called to meet the visitor. Some speculated that he was the notorious Robert Matthias, who had recently stood trial for murder in New York and served time for whipping his daughter. Undeterred, Joseph invited Joshua to lecture that evening and during his discourse, the guest admitted to being Matthias. The next morning, Joshua claimed descent from the Apostle Matthias, chosen to replace Judas in the original twelve apostles. Matthias's spirit was resurrected in him, and eternal life consisted of this transmigration of souls from father to son. At this point, Joseph moved to end the discussion. He told Matthias that his doctrine was of the devil that he was in reality in possession of a wicked and depraved spirit. Matthias remained another night with the Smiths, and the next day after breakfast Joseph told him, that my God told me that his God is the devil, and I could not keep him any longer. And so I for once, Joseph reflected in his journal, cast out the devil in bodily shape. Joseph quickly dismissed Matthias, but he has since been plagued by Matthias's ghost. Their two names are still linked as seers of the New Republic who went beyond evangelical orthodoxy into direct and often heretical experience of the supernatural. The opening chapter of the best modern study of Matthias is entitled Two Prophets at Kirtland. Joseph and Matthias are classed as leading examples of an extraordinary American tradition. Extremist prophets have a long and remarkably continuous history in the United States coming down to modern cult leaders. Joseph and Matthias met in Kirtland, and many believe they have remained together ever since. Born of strict Calvinist parents in Washington County, New York, in 1788, and named Robert Matthews, Matthias had mixed success as a carpenter and storekeeper. Exhibiting strong animosity toward women, he beat his wife and failed to provide for his six children. In 1830, he had a vision of a flood about to descend on Albany and fled the city. Leaving his wife, Matthias wandered alone through western New York. In 1831, he decided his family name meant he was a reincarnation of the biblical Matthias and began to tell all who would listen. Returning to New York City, he convinced a Christian perfectionist named Elijah Pearson that Pearson was a reincarnation of Elijah the Tishbite. Pearson and Benjamin and Anne Fulger, 
a pair of devout Christians, joined Matthias and offered him support. In 1832 they and a few other believers began living communally in the Folger country house in Sing Sing, New York. In lectures given at the supper table, Matthias taught the household that he was the governing spirit, or God, sent to establish male government over women. People were not to pray or read the scriptures but to listen to him, the father. He outfitted himself in his trademark green frock coat with very curled pantaloons and a crimson sash with twelve tassels. When people got sick or things went wrong, he blamed the trouble on the sufferer's disobedience. He assigned couples to marry by designating them as match spirits. For himself he chose Benjamin Folger's wife proclaiming her mother in the kingdom. When Elijah Pearson died, increasingly suspicious locals brought charges against Matthias. Murder could not be proven, but Matthias was convicted of beating his grown daughter and sentenced to four months in prison. He arrived in Kirtland not long after his release in the summer of 1835. Joseph sensed the gulf between himself and Matthias when he said Matthias's God was the devil. But considering the two together actually clarifies the nature of early Mormonism. Was it a radical cult, as the comparison to Matthias implies, led by a charismatic figure whose credulous followers blindly obeyed his commands? One difference was that, unlike Matthias's little household, Mormonism had an existence apart from Joseph Smith. Missionaries preached the gospel without mentioning his name. Most converts accepted Mormonism without meeting the prophet. The opposite was true of Matthias. His followers were under the spell of his personality. He was the god of the kingdom. After his downfall, his religion perished with him. After Joseph Smith died, Mormonism went on growing. Matthias's religion was driven by his personality, Joseph's by doctrine, program, and organization. Matthias created a perishable cult, Joseph a viable church. Paradoxically, it was the revelations, the main reason for linking Joseph to Matthias, that differentiated the two. Unlike other American prophets, Joseph wrote his revelations down, turning them into scripture. The Book of Mormon and the published books of revelations made Mormonism conservative in a churchly sense. Recorded, available for study in printed compilations, and canonized, the texts formed a body of doctrine inviting interpretation and the formation of orthodoxy. The texts sank with Mormonism in the same way that the Bible and the creeds anchor Christian orthodoxy or the Constitution limits lawmaking. Mary Baker Eddy's science and health with key to the scriptures helped Christian science evolve from a potentially radical sect into the respectable, staid church. In the same fashion, the doctrine and covenants stabilized the doctrines of Mormonism. Early Mormonism was further regularized by its organization. Joseph Smith's interest in ecclesiastical structure, unlike cult leaders and extremist prophets, led to the creation of offices, councils, and diffused authority. The success of Mormonism, compared to Matthias's short-lived kingdom, was due to Joseph's instinct for institution building. In Utah, Mormonism easily moved from sect to established religion, because all the elements of a church were present already. In one respect, Matthias and Joseph were similar, both men believed in immediate revelation. They both discerned what orthodoxy had forgotten, that biblical authority rested on communication from God. Believers embraced the Bible because its words originated in heaven. Protestantism had smothered this self-evident fact by relegating revelation to a bygone age, making the Bible an archive rather than a living reality. The extremist prophets brought revelation into the present, renewing contact with the Bible's God. In that, Joseph and Matthias stood together. Even the evangelist Charles Finney, before his conversion, marveled that prayers for the Spirit of God were never answered. Did I misunderstand the promises and teachings of the Bible on this subject? Or was I to conclude that the Bible was not true? Joseph Smith, along with Anne Lee, founder of the Shakers, the Irvinites in England, and thousands of early Methodists and Quakers, wanted more revelation than conventional Protestantism offered. Reliance on revelation made Joseph and the other visionaries appear marginal, but like marginal people before them, the prophets aimed a question at the heart of their culture. If believers in the Bible dismissed revelation in the present, could they defend revelation in the past? For centuries Christian apologists had been debating the veracity of miracles and the inspiration of the prophets with deists, skeptics, and infidels. In the intellectual wars of the late 19th century, believers steadily lost ground. The loss, later characterized as the disenchantment of the world, was only dimly perceived by everyday Christians in Joseph Smith's time. 
but in the century to come, the issue divided divinity schools and troubled ordinary people. Was the Bible inspired writing or purely a historical work? Did biblical miracles actually occur, or were they fabulous tales made up long afterwards? Was God, in other words, active in human affairs? Joseph Smith resisted that ebbing current. Revelation was the essence of his religion. Take away the Book of Mormon, and the revelations, and where is our religion? We have none. He received revelation exactly as Christians thought biblical prophets did. In effect, he reenacted the writing of the Bible. Most put him aside as an obvious charlatan, but if revelation in the present was so unimaginable, why believe revelation in the past? One incredulous visitor marveled that Joseph, nothing but a man claimed revelation, to which Joseph replied that they look upon it as incredible that a man should have any intercourse with his maker. Joseph's life posed the question, does God speak? In this sense, Joseph was indeed an extremist prophet. He forced the question of revelation on a culture struggling with its own faith. Joseph's historical role, as he understood it, was to give God a voice in a world that had stopped listening. The Gentiles shall say, a Bible, a Bible, we have got a Bible, and there cannot be any more Bible, so said the Book of Mormon. O fools, the Lord rejoins, know ye not that I am the same yesterday, today, and forever and that I speak forth my words according to mine own pleasure. One reason for restoring the Book of Mormon, an early revelation said, was to prove that the Holy Scriptures are true. In reply to a minister's inquiry about the distinguishing doctrine of Mormonism, Joseph told him that we believe the Bible, and they do not. It was the power of the Bible that Joseph and the visionaries sought to recover. Not getting it from the ministry, they looked for it themselves. 15. Texts 1835, they knew that the church was evil spoken of in many places, its faith and belief misrepresented, and the way of truth thus subverted. By some it was represented as disbelieving the Bible, by others as being an enemy to all good order and uprightness, and by others as being injurious to the peace of all governments civil and political. We have, therefore, endeavored to present, though in few words, our belief, and when we say this, humbly trust the faith and principles of this society as a body. Doctrine and Covenants 1835, William E. McClellan, the former school teacher chosen an apostle in February 1835, left the church a year and a half later, disillusioned by his failure to receive manifestation at the Kirtland Temple dedication and critical of the church leader's worldly conduct. His devotion had wavered ever since his conversion in 1831, but his energy and speaking ability had qualified him for the apostleship. The journal he kept of a missionary journey with the Twelve from May through September 1835 is the best account we have of Mormon missionary work in the early years. The journal shows how completely missionaries lived off the land, stopping in one little town after another as they traveled northeast through New York and New England. The missionary pairs found a place to preach, gathered an audience and hoped for a favorable reception. For their accommodations, they relied on kindly souls. Coming to the house of Stephen Jones, McClellan wrote, We called and told them that we were preachers of the Church of the Latter-day Saints and we would be glad to be entertained for the night and also to get to preach in the neighborhood. The missionary's effectiveness depended on the population's taste for preaching. Like itinerants of all kinds, the missionaries made an appointment to preach, often in a schoolhouse or a barn and relied on the word to get around. McClellan was interrupted while preaching in a schoolhouse one Sunday on a 4 p.m. appointment. A Methodist preacher rose to say he had an appointment at 5 and needed the space. McClellan called for a vote, and the majority favored him continuing. On another occasion, he was disappointed to find the schoolhouse door locked and only one person who was an old lady attended. That evening some wild boys laughed and talked so much his companion stopped preaching. Usually the audiences were more receptive. The missionaries could fill a schoolhouse, and once 700 people crowded into a large barn. The people who came would hear a sermon of an hour or more followed by an exhortation or a second sermon. McClellan noted the sermon's tropic in his journal. After reading a portion of the Saviour's teaching in the Book of Mormon, Elder B. Young spoke about one and a half hours contrasting the religions of the day with the truth. Others spoke about the nature of the priesthoods, judgments, the power of the resurrection, the kingdom of Christ, or faith. Even if the sermons ranged widely under these headings, it is doubtful any one preachment covered the whole story of the church. Joseph Smith was never a topic, and no explicit mention was made, 
so far as can be told, of the gathering to Zion. The missionaries apparently aimed not to convey the broad idea of the restoration, but rather to make an impression. McClellan himself had been converted by first hearing Samuel Smith and Reynolds Cahoon preaching in Paris, Illinois, on their way to Missouri in the summer of 1831. When I heard it, McClellan later wrote, I made up my mind that there was more in it than any religions I had ever before heard advocated. A few days later, David Whitmer and Harvey Whitlock came through on their way to Missouri. Of Whitlock's sermon, McClellan said, I never heard such preaching in all my life. The glory of God seemed to encircle the man and the wisdom of God to be displayed in his discourse. McClellan closed his school and followed the missionaries to Missouri. After a long talk with Hiram Smith, McClellan accepted the Book of Mormon and was baptized in Jackson County on August 20, 1831. The missionaries had no plan, no pamphlets or books for the investigators to study, no standard message. The Book of Mormon was the only printed literature. The School of the Prophets had deepened their knowledge but the missionaries did not learn key points or a set of principles. Joseph made no effort to homogenize the message or dictate topics. He exercised little oversight over church communications save for publication of the revelations themselves. William W. Phelps published the Evening and Morning Star in faraway Missouri with little oversight. During the paper's brief life in independence from June 1832 to July 1833, Joseph Reed as a subscriber not as publisher or monitor. He never told Phelps what to print, and complained only once, about flagging interest. If you do not render it more interesting than at present, Joseph told Phelps, it will fall, and the church will suffer a great loss thereby. Joseph would not tolerate criticism of himself or of the church, but he granted the editors wide latitude otherwise. Mormons needed an answer to the question what do Mormons believe? In the October 1834 issue of The Messenger and Advocate, the church's newspaper in Kirtland, Oliver Cowdery attempted a summary. That our principles may be fully known we here state them briefly, we believe in God, and his Son Jesus Christ. We believe that God, from the beginning, revealed himself to man, and that whenever he has had a people on earth, he always has revealed himself to them by the Holy Ghost, the ministering of angels or his own voice. We do not believe that he ever had a church on earth without revealing himself to that church, consequently, there were apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, in the same dot we believe that God is the same in all ages, and that it requires the same holiness, purity, and religion, to save a man now, as it did anciently, and that as he is no respecter of persons, always has and always will reveal himself to men when they call upon him. We believe that God has revealed himself to men in this age, and commenced to raise up a church preparatory to his second advent, when he will come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. We believe that the popular religious theories of the day are incorrect, that they are without parallel in the revelations of God, as sanctioned by him, and that however faithfully they may be adhered to, or however zealously and warmly they may be defended, they will never stand the strict scrutiny of the word of life. We believe that all men are born free and equal, that no man, combination of men, or government of men, have power or authority to compel or force others to embrace any system of religion, or religious creed, or to use force or violence to prevent others from enjoying their own opinions, or practicing the same, so long as they do not molest or disturb others in theirs in a manner to deprive them of their privileges as free citizens, or of worshipping God as they choose, and that any attempt to the contrary is an assumption unwarrantable in the revelations of heaven, and strikes at the root of civil liberty, and is a subversion of all equitable principles between man and man. We believe that God has set his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people, Israel, and that the time is near when he will bring them from the four winds, with songs of everlasting joy and reinstate them upon their own lands which he gave their fathers by covenant. And further, we believe in embracing good wherever it may be found, of proving all things, and holding fast that which is righteous. This, in short, is our belief, and we stand ready to defend it upon its own foundation whenever it is assailed by men of character and respectability. The summary was helpful, but incomplete. Nothing was said of priesthood and authority, the promise of exaltation or the three degrees of glory. Cowdery never mentioned the Book of Mormon or the revision of the Bible. He said little about Zion. Instead he emphasized revelation in all ages of the world, the shortcomings of modern religion, 
and the gathering of Israel, plus religious freedom, a lesson from the Missouri persecutions. Despite the omissions, this description was probably acceptable to most Mormons in 1835. Amid the diversity, a loose consensus was forming. Doctrine and Covenants A major step towards correlating the message was taken in August 1835, when Joseph's revelations were published in a revised and expanded edition called The Doctrine and Covenants, a change in title from the 1833 Book of Commandments. The leaders had labored on the book for nearly two years, ever since the Mormon press in independence was destroyed and the proofs of the Book of Commandments scattered to assist Oliver Cowdery. Sidney Rigdon, the press manager, was charged in April 1834 with arranging the church covenants, and the project moved slowly and steadily along. In June, Joseph issued an appeal for funds to help publish all the revelations, including the revised version of the Bible. On September 24, the Kirtland High Council assigned the task of correcting the revelations to a committee composed of Cowdery and the First Presidency. Progress may have been slowed by disagreement about the contents. The directions to the committee in September gave signs that the book's conception was in flux. A compilation of Joseph Smith's revelations, the idea behind the Book of Commandments, was giving way to a systematic presentation of church doctrine using scripture from all sources with Joseph's revelations as a part. The High Council instructed the committee to arrange the items of the doctrine of Jesus Christ for the government of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, taken from the Bible, Book of Mormon and the Revelations. The book was to be a summary drawing on all scriptures, rather than a record of Joseph's work. Ultimately, Bible and Book of Mormon scriptures were omitted but the idea of gathering items of doctrine for the government of the church prevailed. The 1835 Doctrine and Covenants was meant to summarize the church's major beliefs and provide a handbook of its policies. Joseph Smith's role in receiving revelations was played down. They were referred to as the revelations which have been given since its organization without mentioning his name, and characterized as items or principles for the regulation of the church. In the first sentence of the introduction, the First Presidency states that the book contains the leading items of the religion which we have professed to believe, and later speaks of presenting a system. The body of the text then opens with seven theological lectures on the doctrine of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, given at the School of the Prophets. In the second part, containing the revelations themselves, seven revelations, each one called a section are pulled out of chronological order and moved to the front to highlight their significance. Following the section designated the Lord's Preface, the second section is the current section 20 of the Modern Doctrine and Covenants, the so-called Constitution of the Church given in the spring of 1830. The third section, the current section 107, is the Grand Revelation on Priesthood. The fourth is the current section 84, also on Priesthood and so on. The compilers featured the sections that offered systematic descriptions of church organization and belief. The revelation on the organization of high councils comes fifth. Then the book reverts to roughly chronological order. The compilation concludes with statements by Phelps and Cowdery on marriage and on government. In the back, an index guides readers to topics like ironic priesthood or baptism or children. The word section as a heading for the individual revelations, replacing chapter in the Book of Commandments, suggests the committee was thinking of a code of laws or a constitution. The book came at a time when the prophetic impulses of the movement were being regularized and systematized. The standing and traveling high councils had given form to church administration. The twelve were touring the country organizing branches into conferences and putting their affairs in order. The first presidency had emerged as the leading quorum in church government. The time had come to channel energy and bring order to the movement. In January 1835, Seven months before the Doctrine and Covenants was presented to the Church, Alexander Campbell put the finishing touches on the Christian system. In the same years, the Methodists were restraining the supernaturalist impulses among believers. The mainline churches, in the words of the historian Gordon Wood, wanted to offset the personal and emotional character of revivalism by restoring the corporate rituals and doctrines of the historic churches. John Hyam has characterized the overall change going on in American society as a transition from boundlessness to consolidation. The lectures on faith were a perfect example of orderly presentation. Given in the fall of 1834 by Sidney Rigdon and others, with input from Joseph Smith, 
The lectures were included in every edition of the Doctrine and Covenants from 1835 through 1921. They are a surprising departure from Joseph's unsystematic and often sprawling revelations. Tightly organized, self-consciously logical, and overtly rational, the lectures have the air of sermons meant to persuade a skeptical audience. They accept the definition of theology in Buck's theological dictionary as a revealed science claiming that any rational and intelligent being may exercise faith in God. In the review questions following each lecture, students are asked for rational proof. How do you prove that faith is the principle of action in all intelligent beings? How do you prove that God has faith in himself independently? The saints were given a tightly wound package of logic and evidence to help them make the case. If the spirit of the lectures had governed the church after 1835, a systematic theology like Alexander Campbell's might have soon followed. On August 17, 1835, while Joseph was away in Michigan, Sidney Rigdon and Oliver Cowdery presented the Doctrine and Covenants to a General Assembly to become a law unto the Church, a rule of faith and practice. They were accepted by way of an elaborate ritual that came to be observed on later occasions when important business was transacted. The various priesthood quorums and councils sat together and each group voted in turn, the two high councils, Kirtland and Missouri, the bishoprics, the seventies, elders, priests, teachers, and deacons. When the book was brought before the assembly, the head of each group rose and attested the book's truth. The absent twelve apostles, away on mission were represented by a written testimony affirming that these commandments were given by inspiration of God, and are profitable for all men, and are verily true. At the end, the whole assembly gave a decided voice in favor of the book. The ceremonial endorsement of the book did not persuade everyone to embrace it. The maverick Lyman White thought that the Book of Covenants and Doctrine was a telestial law and the Book of Commandments were a celestial law. Others were apprehensive about adopting a creed. Some of the saints liked the improvisational character of early missionary preaching. Soon after the acceptance, Elder Armand Babbitt was charged with saying that we have no articles of faith except the Bible. The introduction anticipated these objections to regularization. There may be an aversion in the minds of some, the First Presidency acknowledged, against receiving anything purporting to be articles of religious faith in consequence of there being so many now extant. But if men believe a system, and profess that it was given by inspiration, certainly the more intelligibly they can present it, the better. It does not make a principle untrue to print it. This was not good enough for David Whitmer, who later complained that the Doctrine and Covenants established a creed of religious faith. Although listed on the title page as one of the four compilers of the Doctrine and Covenants and obviously in favor of its publication, Joseph Smith was also uneasy about creeds. Later Joseph formulated his own articles of faith when a curious newspaper editor requested a statement, but he never intended this or any single statement to represent the totality of belief. The flow of revelations prevented him from ever saying the work was finished. Even near the end of his career, he resisted any attempt to stanch the springs of inspiration. The most prominent point of difference in sentiment between the Latter-day Saints and sectarians, a clerk later recorded him saying, was, that the latter were all circumscribed by some peculiar creed, which deprived its members the privilege of believing anything not contained therein, whereas the LD Saints had no creed, but are ready to believe all true principles that exist, as they are made manifest from time to time. Creed's fixed limits they seem to say thus far and no further, while for Joseph the way was always open to additional truth, the creed set up stakes, and say hitherto shalt thou come, and no further, which I cannot subscribe to. He wanted the door left ajar for truth from every source. He revised his own revelations, adding new material and splicing one to another, altering the wording as he saw fit. He felt authorized to expand the revelations as his understanding expanded. In later editions of the Doctrine and Covenants this freewheeling style prevailed. Instead of putting the key revelations first, as if they had preeminence, the later editions became once more a chronological compilation of Joseph's revelations in all their tangled, unsystematic glory. Joseph once said that Methodists have creeds which a man must believe or be kicked out of their church. I want the liberty to believe as I please, it feels so good not to be trammeled. Revelation meant freedom to Joseph freedom to expand his mind through time and space, 
seeking truth wherever it might be. But as the form of the 1835 edition suggested, a desire for order balanced the freeing impulse. By licensing his followers to speak with the Holy Ghost, he risked having the whole movement spin out of control. Against the centrifugal force of individual revelation, Joseph continually organized and regulated. Though he was the chief visionary of the age, he showed little sympathy for the extravagant behavior of people possessed by spirits. He preferred edification and orderly worship to the uncontrolled emotion of the camp meeting or the idiosyncratic excursions of the Irvinite prophets. The balance between freedom and control makes it difficult to keep Mormonism in focus. Was it authoritarian or anarchic? disciplined or unbounded, the printed word of God constituted a doctrinal authority that at the same time was open-ended, allowing visionary freedom to Joseph's successors after his death. Abraham, in the summer of 1835, Joseph returned to translating, the peculiar form of revelation he had set aside in 1833 when revision of the Bible was completed. Reawakening his interest was the visit of one Michael H. Chandler, who arrived in Kirtland on July 3rd. 1835, with four mummies and some rolls of papyrus. Something of an opportunist and promoter, Chandler had exhibited the artifacts in Cleveland in March and come to Kirtland, he said, because of Joseph Smith's translating powers. Chandler's account of the mummies is full of contradictions. He claimed he inherited the artifacts from his uncle, Antonio Libolo. Libolo had indeed obtained Egyptian artifacts around 1820 and distributed the finds to various European museums before he died in 1830, but no mention of Chandler or mummies was made in Libolo's probate papers. He had earlier arranged for a triste merchant to sell eleven mummies that were forwarded to New York, and probably Chandler purchased the artifacts in New York, thinking to exhibit and then sell them. On inspecting the papyri, Joseph announced that one roll contained the writings of Abraham of Ur and another the writings of Joseph of Egypt. Excited by this discovery, he encouraged some of the Kirtland saints to purchase four mummies and the papyri for $2,400, a huge sum when money was desperately needed for other projects. In late July and off and on through the fall and winter, Joseph worked on the translation, until events interrupted the work. William W. Phelps who helped with the project, wrote as early as September that there was little chance of getting back to it. The first chapter and part of the second of the Book of Abraham were completed by 1837, and probably earlier, the remainder may not have been produced until early 1842, shortly before the publication in the church newspaper, The Times and Seasons. The translation of the writings of Joseph of Egypt never appeared. The prospect of another translation excited the Kirtland saints. John Whitmer commented that the completed translation will be a pleasing history and of great value to the saints. Oliver Cowdery felt the translations would be an inestimable acquisition to our present scriptures. The writings moved the world toward the time when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All through the winter of 1835-36, curious people stopped by to view the papyri and to hear Joseph's explanations. He would continue showing the relics until his death. Joseph Smith's Book of Abraham is best thought of as an apocryphal addition to the Genesis story of Abraham, in the same vein as the Enoch passages in the Book of Moses. Characteristically, Joseph's translated account did not repeat the familiar biblical stories, instead expanding on a few verses about Abraham's origins in Air of the Chaldees, adding material not mentioned in the Bible. The published version contained two chapters giving an account of Abraham's ordeal in Air and his departure for Canaan and Egypt. In keeping with Abraham's curiosity about the heavens, the third chapter is an excursion into astronomy and cosmology and the fourth and fifth chapters are another account of creation, paralleling the one in the book of Moses. Like all of Joseph's historical narratives, the Abraham story begins without a translator's introduction. The reader is suddenly dropped into Abraham's mind and world, and Joseph the translator is entirely invisible. Geographical locations like Potiphar's Hill, Bethel, Sechem, Haran, and Hyadot the text, in the land of the Chaldeans, at the residence of my fathers, I, Abraham, saw that it was needful for me to obtain another place of residence. At once we have a character, a place, and a plot. Abraham is a restless, striving person, and finding there was greater happiness and peace and rest for me, I sought for the blessings of the fathers and the right whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same. 
having been myself a follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge, and to be a greater follower of righteousness, and to possess a greater knowledge, and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, and desiring to receive instructions, and to keep the commandments of God, I became a rightful heir, a high priest, holding the right belonging to the fathers. To the familiar idea of Abraham as a prince and the father of many nations, Joseph's account adds priesthood, a theme running through the entire story. The book of Abraham can be considered an extension of the priesthood revelations that had influenced the church in the past few years, in contrast to the earlier book of Moses, which rarely used the word in Abraham's case. The priesthood is not given by ordination alone but is received as an inheritance. Priesthood is a right belonging to the fathers. It descends to Abraham from the fathers, from the beginning of time, yea, even from the beginning, or before the foundations of the earth, to the present time, even the right of the firstborn, or the first man, who is Adam, or first father, before obtaining priesthood. Abraham passes through an ordeal that takes the narrative toward Egypt and a rival priesthood. Abraham's father Terah has apostatized to the false gods of Egypt. Their worship involves human sacrifices conducted in Ur by the priest of Pharaoh. After offering a child and three virgins, the priest then seized Abraham. They take him that they might slay me, also, as they did those virgins, upon this altar. Bound on the altar, Abraham cries to the Lord and an angel comes to his rescue. The voice of Jehovah commands Abraham to depart for a strange land that the Lord will reveal to him. Then in a confrontation like Elijah's duel with the priests of Baal, the altar is broken down and the priests smitten, causing great mourning in Chaldea, and also in the court of Pharaoh. At this point, the narrative detours into Egyptian history. Pharaoh, we are told, is descended from Ham, the son of Noah. Ham's daughter Egyptus discovered the land of Egypt and her eldest son was the first pharaoh, who ruled after the manner of the government of Ham, which was patriarchal. The lineage of Ham, we learn, comes through the Canaanites, who are cursed. Pharaoh is of that lineage, by which he could not have the right of priesthood, notwithstanding the pharaohs would fain claim it from Noah, through Ham. Like Abraham, Pharaoh yearns for the priesthood, but is denied it because of his lineage. These verses have had a troubled history. Later they were used as a justification for refusing black people the priesthood. The Abraham verses say nothing of skin color, but the 1830 revelation of Moses had spoken of a blackness coming upon all the children of Canaan, that they were despised among all people, and Abraham said Pharaoh was a partaker of the blood of the Canaanites, by birth. Joining the verses in Abraham and Moses, some concluded that black people had descended from the Canaanites, the lineage cursed as pertaining to the priesthood. In coming to this conclusion, later Mormons borrowed from the common 19th century belief that Africans descended from Ham and bore a curse. In the Bible, Noah's son Ham mocked his father's drunkenness and nakedness, and in revenge Noah cursed Ham's son Canaan. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Over the centuries, biblical interpreters, including Jews and Arabs, identified Canaan with people they wished to enslave, and the cursed people, whoever they happened to be at the time, were then thought of as innately inferior, dishonest, lazy, irresponsible, intemperate. Around 1000 CE, the curse was assigned to black Africans. Joseph spoke of Abraham, while partially paralleling this tradition, deviated significantly from the pattern of Hamitic interpretation. The Abraham verses spoke of Noah, Ham, and a curse, but said nothing of servitude. Slavery was left out of the picture altogether. The pharaoh who bore the curse was anything but an impoverished servant or lazy and dishonest. He established his kingdom and judged his people wisely and justly all his days. He sought to imitate that order established by the fathers in the first generations. Blessed with kingship and the blessings of the earth, Pharaoh founded the mighty Egyptian civilization famed for its magnificence and power. In Joseph Smith's time, Egypt was believed to have been the starting point for Western civilization. Advocates of black equality stressed their connection with Egypt to prove African achievements. Their favorite biblical passage was Psalm 68 31, Princes shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia shall soon stretch forth her hands unto God. By associating the cursed descendants of Ham with Egypt, the Book of Abraham ran at cross purposes with the usual arguments for black cultural inferiority and black slavery.
The book exhibited an idiosyncratic type of racial thinking. Neither inferiority nor servitude was at issue, only priesthood. Was Joseph racist in other contexts? The exclusion of black men from the priesthood was publicly stated only after his death. Except for a brief lapse in early 1836, Joseph advocated taking the gospel to both bond and free, ignoring race. An essay against abolitionism published over his name in 1836, a year when fear of abolitionism was at its peak, exhibited the conventional prejudices of his day in asserting that blacks were cursed with servitude by a decree of Jehovah, but there was no follow-up that spring. The house rules for the Kirtland Temple, the saint's most sacred building, allowed for the presence of male or female bond or free black or white. The same policy was followed in Norvu, where persons of all languages, and of every tongue, and of every color shall with us worship the Lord of hosts in his holy temple. Nothing was done during Joseph's lifetime to withhold priesthood from black members. Joseph knew Elijah Abel, a black man who was ordained as a seventy and is said to have entertained him. As Joseph began to take positions on national issues, he came out strongly against slavery. Blacks come into the world slaves, mentally and physically, he once said in private conversation. Change their situation with the white and they would be like them. He favored a policy of national equalization, though he retained the common prejudice against intermarriage and blending of the races. When he ran for U.S. president in 1844, he made compensated emancipation a plank in his platform. He urged the nation to ameliorate the condition of all, black or white, bond or free, for the best of books says, God hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Joseph never commented on the Abraham text or implied it denied priesthood to blacks. Joseph's concern in the first chapter of Abraham was with civilizations and lineage more than race. Pharaoh, Ham and Egyptus figure in one lineage and Abraham in another. The implications for modern race relations interested Joseph less than the configuration of family lines and the descent of authority. Abraham says he will delineate the chronology, running back from myself to the beginning of the creation, though the text never returned to that subject. In two other places in his revelations, Joseph traced the lineage of priesthood back to Adam. Abraham is the third of Joseph's foundational biographies stories of individuals who founded nations. One great character dominates each story. The Book of Mormon opens with I, Nephi, marching the opening of Abraham, in the land of the Chaldeans, at the residence of my fathers, I, Abraham. A person immediately flashes on the screen. The first chapter of Moses begins in the third person but immediately switches into Moses' first person account of seeing God face to face. From these individuals come peoples and civilizations. Nations spring up in these narratives and, in Moses and Abraham, humankind itself. The writings tell why earth was created, or how our people came into existence. Through the account of a single figure, Nephi blends the dispersal of Israelite civilization to the New World with the story of his family. The Book of Abraham shows the founding of the Abrahamic nation, the people with priesthood who will bless the earth. In a sidebar to Abraham's story, Egyptus and Pharaoh found Egypt. These stories are preoccupied with beginnings. Joseph wrote in a time of epics, when American literary figures were creating foundational stories for the new nation. Joel Barlow the late 18th century Connecticut poet, attempted an epic in the Columbiad, his long vision of Columbus, as did Timothy Dwight in his recounting of the biblical Joshua as a barely disguised George Washington in the conquest of Canaan. Both were narratives of nation founding told as the story of great individuals. Joseph Smith's Moses, Abraham, and Nuffi compare to the leading figures in Barlow's and Dwight's epic poems, but in daring and originality, Joseph exceeds them. The American poets overlaid familiar biblical events with blunt references to the United States. Joseph's expansion of the biblical stories transcended the national. He stepped out of his own time into antiquity in search of the origins of civilization. Moses and Abraham even have cosmological dimensions. All three betray a fascination with how the world began. Translating the Abraham texts gave Joseph another chance to let his followers try translating. While working on the Book of Mormon in 1829, Joseph invited Oliver Cowdery to translate. He tried and failed. Now with the Egyptian papyri before them, Joseph again let the men with the greatest interest in such undertakings, Cowdery, William W. Phelps, Warren Parrish, and Frederick G. Williams, 
Attempt translations. Parish was told he shall see much of my ancient records, and shall know of hidden things, and shall be endowed with a knowledge of hidden languages. Through the fall of 1835, the little group made various attempts. This afternoon labored on the Egyptian alphabet, in company with brothers O. Cowdery and W. W. Phelps, Joseph's journal notes. They seem to have copied lines of Egyptian from the papyrus and worked out stories to go with the text. Or they wrote down an Egyptian character and attempted various renditions. Joseph apparently had translated the first two chapters of Abraham, through chapter 2, verse 18, in the current edition and the would-be translators matched up hieroglyphs with some of his English sentences. Their general method can be deduced from a revelation given to Oliver Cowdery after he failed to translate the gold plates, you must study it out in your mind, then you must ask me if it be right, and if it is right, I will cause that your bus shall burn within you. One can imagine these men staring at the characters, jotting down ideas that occurred to them hoping for a burning confirmation. They tried one approach after another. Joseph probably threw in ideas of his own. Eventually they pulled their work together into a collection they called Grammar and Alphabet of the Egyptian Language, written in the hands of Phelps and Parrish. Of all the men working on the papyri, only Joseph produced a coherent text. What was going on as he translated? For many years, Mormons assumed that he sat down with the scrolls, looked at each Egyptian word, and by inspiration understood its meaning in English. He must have been reading from a text, so Mormons thought, much as a conventional translator would do, except the words came by revelation rather than out of his own learning. In 1967, that view of translation suffered a blow when eleven scraps of the Abraham papyri, long since lost and believed to have been burned, were discovered in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City and given to Latter-day Saint leaders in Salt Lake City. Color pictures were soon printed and scholars went to work. The texts were thought to be the Abraham papyri because Joseph had published facsimiles from the papyri with his translation, and the same pictures appeared on the museum fragments. Moreover, some of the characters from the Egyptian grammar appeared on the fragments. The translation of these texts by expert Egyptologists would finally prove or disprove Joseph's claims to miraculous translating powers. Would any of the language correspond to the text in his book of Abraham? Some Mormons were crushed when the fragments turned out to be rather conventional funerary texts placed with mummified bodies, in this case Hor, to assure continuing life as an immortal god. According to the Egyptologists, Nothing on the fragments resembled Joseph's account of Abraham. Some Mormon scholars, notably Hugh Nibley, doubt that the actual texts for Abraham and Joseph have been found. The scraps from the Metropolitan Museum do not fit the description Joseph Smith gave of long, beautiful scrolls. At best the remnants are a small fraction of the originals, with no indication of what appears on the lost portions. Nonetheless. The discovery prompted a reassessment of the Book of Abraham. What was going on while Joseph translated the papyri and dictated text to a scribe? Obviously, he was not interpreting the hieroglyphics like an ordinary scholar. As Joseph saw it, he was working by inspiration, that had been clear from the beginning. When he translated the Book of Mormon, he did not read from the gold plates, he looked into the crystals of the Aram and Thummim or gazed at the seer stone. The words came by inspiration, not by reading the characters on the plates. By analogy, it seemed likely that the papyri had been an occasion for receiving a revelation rather than a word-for-word -word interpretation of the hieroglyphs as in ordinary translations. Joseph translated Abraham as he had the characters on the gold plates, by knowing the meaning without actually knowing the plates language. Warren Parrish, his clerk, said, I have sat by his side and penned down the translation of the Egyptian hieroglyphics as he claimed to receive it by direct inspiration of heaven. When Chandler arrived with the scrolls, Joseph saw the papyri and inspiration struck. Not one to deny God's promptings, the prophet said what he felt, the papyri were the writings of Abraham and Joseph. The whole thing was miraculous, and to reduce Joseph's translation to some quasi-natural process, some concluded was folly. The peculiar fact is that the results were not entirely out of line with the huge apocryphal literature on Abraham. His book of Abraham picked up themes found in texts like the book of Jasher and Flavius Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews. In these extra-biblical stories, Abraham's father worshipped idols, people tried to murder Abraham because of his resistance, and Abraham was learned in astronomy, 
all features of Joseph Smith's narrative. Josephus says, for example, that Abraham delivered the science of astronomy to the Egyptians, as does Joseph's Abraham. The parallels are not exact, the book of Abraham was not a copy of any of the apocryphal texts. In the book of Jasher, Abraham destroys the idols of King Nimrod with a hatchet and is thrown into a furnace, Joseph's Abraham offers no violence to the idols and is bound on a bedstead. The similarities are far from complete, but the theme of resisting the king's idolatry and an attempted execution followed by redemption by God are the same. The parallels extend to numerous small details. Joseph may have heard apocryphal stories of Abraham, although the book of Jasher was not published in English until 1829 and not in the United States until 1840. A Bible dictionary published by the American Sunday School Union summed up many of the apocryphal elements. Whether Joseph knew of alternate accounts of Abraham or not, he created an original narrative that echoed apocryphal stories without imitating them, either by revelation, as his followers believed, or by some instinctive affinity for antiquity. Joseph made his own late, and unlikely entry in the long tradition of extra-biblical narratives about the great patriarch. Despite his gift for translating, Joseph wanted to learn language in the ordinary way and translate rationally as well as miraculously. When he returned to the translation of Abraham in 1842, he again proposed an Egyptian grammar. He apparently hoped to transform his inspired interpretation of the text into a mastery of the Egyptian language. In the fall of 1835, when he first began work on the Abraham text, he was also planning to study languages conventionally. Dr. Daniel L. M. Paik Soto, a professor of medicine at Willoughby University four miles from Kirtland, was hired to teach Hebrew in the School of the Prophets. When Paik Soto could not come, the brethren hired Joshua Satius, a Jewish convert to Christianity then teaching at the Western Reserve College. In the interim, Joseph studied Hebrew on his own and, after Satius arrived in January 1836, attended class conscientiously, a prophet learning from a scholar. He proudly recorded Satius's comment that we are the most forward of any class he ever taught. Joseph was one of ten to meet for extra sessions with the professor. Satius called Joseph an indefatigable student. Excited by his learning, Joseph resolved to peruse the study of languages until I shall become master of them, if I am permitted to live long enough. The Hebrew classes continued until the dedication of the temple in March, when Satius dropped from sight. In light of Joseph's language study, the Egyptian grammar appears as an awkward attempt to blend a scholarly approach to language with inspired translation. Like Abraham, Joseph wanted to be one who possessed great knowledge. He began his career as a prophet by translating gold plates inscribed in reformed Egyptian. As late as 1842, he worked on the translation of papyri from an Egyptian tomb. The allure of the ancient comes through in the revelation to Oliver Cowdery about those ancient records which have been hid up, that are sacred. Beyond the Book of Mormon people, other Israelites had kept records that would flow together in the last days. The sealed portion of the gold plates was yet to be revealed, and revelations to sundry others had generated caches of records, all part of the Lord's work all to be recovered in time. Translation gave him access to the peoples of antiquity. Full of wonders as it was, the Book of Abraham complicated the problem of regularizing Mormon doctrine. The Doctrine and Covenants was meant to stabilize Mormon beliefs, but in the very year of its publication, the papyri rode into Kirtland in Michael Chandler's wagon, bringing news of Abraham from the tombs of Egypt. Every attempt to regularize belief was diffused by new revelations. Who could tell what would be revealed next? What new insight into the patriarchal past? What stories of Abraham, Moses, or Enoch? What glimpses into heaven? Joseph himself could not predict the course of Mormon doctrine. All he could say he summed up in a later article of faith, We believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 16, Stripe, August to December 1835, Be assured brethren Lamb willing to stem the torrent of all opposition, in storms in tempests in thunders and lightning by sea and by land in the wilderness or among false brethren or mobs or wherever God in his providence may call us and I am determined that neither heights nor depths principalities nor powers things present or to come nor any other creature shall separate me from you. Joseph Smith to the Twelve Apostles, 
January 1836 Joseph's Journal for September 22, 1835, through April 3, 1836, was the most extensive, comprehensive, and revealing he ever kept. Earlier journals ran a few months and petered out, his letters give only a brief glimpse of one moment in time. The 1835-36 journal contains almost daily entries for six months. Only a few passages were written in his own hand but the bulk of the entries appear to have been dictated rather than composed by his clerks. After this, Joseph's journals lose the personal touch. Clerks wrote them for his approval, introducing an intervening mind between readers and the prophet. The personal nature of the 1835-36 journal clarifies, at least a little, the meaning of Mormonism to Joseph Smith himself. How did his religion relate to his temperament and feelings? If Joseph thought the historical significance of his work was to renew biblical revelation and to prepare for the second coming, what personal satisfactions did Mormonism bring? The 1835-36 journal says enough about Joseph's needs and tensions to permit speculation on a difficult question. His personal hopes for Zion were interwoven with an inherited burden from his New England ancestors. Incidents through the fall of 1835 reveal how Fully Joseph was immersed in a system called by historians the culture of honor, illustrated at the highest level of American society by the duel between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr in 1804. Joseph Smith had no part in the code duelo, but versions of the honor culture did affect him. By the time of his young manhood, the northern middle and upper classes were beginning to adopt genteel and commercial mores that weakened their hold of the honor culture, but it still prevailed in the south, in the northern rural backcountry and among urban immigrant groups. The culture of honor bred deep loyalties to friends and family, while instilling a fierce urge to avenge insults. Andrew Jackson killed a man in a duel over a perceived slight to his wife's honor. The greatest fear in life, a fear stronger than death or damnation, was public humiliation. A man must fight for honor, whether in a duel like Jackson's or Hamilton's at the upper levels of society, or in a brawl among ordinary people. Like everyone raised in this culture, the Smiths had a clannish loyalty to one another and a fiery resentment against the slightest derogation of their worth. In the culture of honor, one would battle to the death in defense of reputation. An honorable man who suffered an insult would spare nothing to get even. In a sense, these qualities were aspects of one's personal character, a matter of individual moral responsibility. In another sense, they were social and cultural. The honor culture was a legacy from one's family and society a burden imposed on children by their world. Joseph's reaction to insults was learned behavior, shared with his society. His anger was both his own and an expression of a cultural practice, what honorable men were taught to do. Unfortunately for his peace of mind, Joseph's angry responses conflicted with the harmony and brotherhood he prized. Through the fall of 1835, he engaged in a series of small quarrels, domestic disturbances, and squabbles. He did not rise above the fray in the serene majesty of his calling. The culture of honor moved him to contend with the offending parties to protect his easily bruised pride, even though all the while he wanted peace. He hated contention and tried to make peace by mutual confessions and brotherly arbitration. But his own sensitivity entangled him in further rows, repeatedly recycling resentment and reconciliation. By January 1836, when he made peace with his antagonists, the meaning of Zion to a man of his temperament was clear. To live in harmony with his brothers and sisters, as the revelations required, was reason to rejoice. Harmony was valued in all the church's councils. The Kirtland High Council's hearings examined the attitudes of offending parties as well as their actions. The minutes refer to the spirit of meekness, or feelings of the heart, or the spirit of justification and pride. On September 19th, Jared Carter answered charges about his presentation on the Temple Building Committee. No one objected to the topic, but Carter had threatened that if any man spoke against the committee, God would curse him. In asking others to pray for his committee, he demanded it in the name of the Lord with an authoritative voice and gesticulation which are not according to the meekness of the Spirit of Jesus. Joseph ruled that Elder Carter has not designed to do wickedly, but he erred in judgment and deserves reproof. He was to stand before the congregation and say he had erred in spirit and now ask your forgiveness. Cart accepted the ruling and promised to comply. While Joseph was sensitive to the spirit of others, he may have been tone deaf to the spirit of his own words. Unable to bear criticism, 
he rebuked anyone who challenged him. Benjamin Johnson, a great admirer, said, criticism, even by associates, was rarely acceptable, and contradiction would rouse in him the lion at once, for by no one of his fellows would he be superseded or disputed. When one brother Aldridge accused Joseph of paying too much for the patriarchal blessings book and Joseph flashed back, an observer, brother Henry Green, accused Joseph of rebuking brother Aldridge wrongfully and being under the influence of an evil spirit. Aldridge was justified, in Green's estimation, and Presidents Joseph and Hiram Smith were wrong in abusing the old man. Green said anyone who talked like Joseph was a scoundrel and must have the devil in him. The High Council, where the dispute was aired on September 16, 1835, ruled Green was at fault for criticizing the President. When an indignity is offered to the High Council, then it is the privilege of the Presidency of the High Council to stamp it with indignation underfoot. The people around Joseph divided on the degree of suitable indignation, suggesting that cultural norms were in flux. Green's objection echoed Sylvester Smith's complaint against Joseph after the Zion's Camp expedition in 1834. Sylvester had charged that Joseph's angry chastisement was unworthy of a man of God, but after a month he agreed to publish a retraction. A year later, Sylvester was the clerk at Green's trial standing with Joseph against Green and Aldridge on basically the same charge. During the intervening year, Sylvester had accepted the principle that the leaders of the church, and especially the president, were not to be criticized. They were to be honored and regarded, even when a charge was brought against them. The disaffected were not required to stifle their complaints. Sidney Rigdon ruled that Green should have gone to Joseph privately. Public humiliation was the issue. There was no justification in opposing the servant of the Lord while in the actual discharge of his duty. Theologically, the office of prophet was essential to the well-being of the entire society. The High Council seemed to have concluded the presidency held by Joseph could not be undermined. Aldridge's error was to question the integrity of the heads of the church. Joseph's office required him to detect evil spirits and reproofs were necessary. As he said a few years later, he rebuked and admonished his brethren frequently, and that because he loved them, not because he wished to incur their displeasure or mar their happiness. In that spirit, Samuel Smith argued that President Smith was in the line of his duty when he reproved Bro. Aldridge for his evil. Oliver Cowdery warned that to call Joseph a scoundrel threatened to destroy the character of the heads of this church. Joseph was concerned about the reputation of the entire general leadership, not just his own standing. He was furious when Apostles Orson Hyde and William E. McClellan scoffed at the Kirtland School run by Sidney Rigdon. While away from Kirtland in the summer of 1835, McClellan had learned that it was not possible for his wife to attend Rigdon's school. I am glad that it is not, McClellan wrote home, since Elder Hyde has returned and given me a description of the manner in which the school is conducted, though we do not wish to cast any reflections. Joseph and the Kirtland High Council considered the comment the highest insult to the church and the presidency. McClellan and Hyde summarily had their membership suspended until they explained themselves. They were warned that any who spoke evil of the dignities which God has set in his church would suffer. When the Twelve returned to Kirtland in late September, the presidency reviewed the dispute and other differences that had risen while the twelve were away. McClellan and Hyde admitted their error. And Joseph, feeling the matter was settled, closed the case. Through the fall, other disagreements roiled Joseph's relations with the twelve. When a branch leader criticized the twelve for soliciting funds for Missouri and neglecting the Kirtland Temple, the High Council told the twelve that you set yourselves up as an independent council, subject to no authority of the church a kind of outlaws. Castant further doubt on the Twelve's judgment, a council member questioned their decision in the trial of Gladden Bishop who had been charged with heresy. Joseph was also disturbed by stories of how the Twelve managed their funds during their summer mission. A revelation on November 3 announced that the Twelve are under condemnation, because they have not been sufficiently humble in my sight, and in consequence of their covetous desires in that they have not dealt equally with each other in the division of the monies which came into their hands. Three of the twelve were mentioned by name for their grievous sins, and the revelation said the residue are not sufficiently humble before me. When word of the revelation got around, McClellan and Hyde, the offenders in the school matter, came to hear it read, later Brigham Young, one of the apostles, asked to hear it too. Objections were raised, 
but Joseph thought the offenders acknowledged their wrongs eventually. After examining their own hearts, Joseph said of McClellan and Hyde, they acknowledged it to be the word of the Lord and said they were satisfied. Joseph met a week later with the twelve and assured them they had my utmost confidence. Typically, Joseph's anger evaporated after admission of error on both sides. He wanted to put difficult matters behind him. But those who were affected could not always forget so easily. In January 1836, Thomas Marsh, President of the Twelve, asked for a meeting with the Presidency to air a number of hurts. He complained that the Twelve had been in this work from the beginning almost and had borne the burden in the heat of the day and passed through many trials and still the Presidency doubted them. Each of the quorum members rose to echo Marsh's protestations. Joseph acknowledged that the letter rebuking them might have been expressed in too harsh language, which was not intentional and I ask your forgiveness inasmuch as I have hurt your feelings but he insisted that McClellan's criticism of the school justified the tone. He admitted sometimes being too harsh from the impulse of the moment. Then his affection returned. Inasmuch as I have wounded your feelings, he implored the twelve, I ask your forgiveness, for I love you and will hold you up with all my heart in all righteousness before the Lord. A flood of pledges followed, be assured brethren I am willing to stem the torrent of all opposition in storms in tempests in thunders and lightning by sea and by land in the wilderness or among false brethren or mobs or wherever God in his providence may call us and I am determined that neither heights nor depths principalities nor powers things present or to come nor any other creature shall separate me from you. He promised to place unlimited confidence in your word and ask the same of them, for I will not tell you I know anything which I do not know. Sidney Rigdon and Frederick Williams asked forgiveness to admitting they had spoken harshly. Satisfied, Marsh called upon the Twelve to accept the explanation and enter into a covenant of mutual trust. They raised their hands to heaven, in testimony of their willingness and desire to enter into this covenant and their entire satisfaction with our explanation, and then grasped hands. Joseph reported a perfect unison of feeling as our hearts overflowed with blessings, which were pronounced upon each other's heads as the Spirit gave us utterance. Joseph ended with prayer. May God enable us all, to perform our vows and covenants with each other in all fidelity and righteousness before him. While bickering with the Twelfth through the fall of 1835, Joseph seemed to be in a mood for finding fault, as if some frustration or worry eroded his patience. On one vexing Sunday in November, he fell upon one person after another. He objected to the way his uncle John Smith and Sidney Rigdon dealt with a transgressor during a church meeting. He noted in his journal that William Phelps and John Whitmer were under condemnation before the Lord, for their errors. Later in the day, he admonished John Corrill for not partaking of the sacrament and upbraided Emma for leaving the meeting early. He noted she made no reply, but manifested contrition by weeping. Contention broke out over small matters. Joseph argued with Orson Bratt in the elders' school over the pronunciation of a Hebrew letter. As teacher, Joseph thought his opinion should prevail, but Pratt manifested a stubborn spirit. Joseph spent the next morning settling the unpleasant feelings that existed in the breast of Elder Orson Pratt. Pratt eventually backed down and confessed his fault. As usual, he asked forgiveness of the whole school and was cheerfully forgiven by all. Once people gave way, Joseph forgave and forgot the matter. He could not understand how others felt when shamed. Emma wept and said nothing. When he could not have his way, Joseph sometimes rained down curses on his opponents. He was outraged when the Chardon County Court fined his brother Samuel $20 for avoiding militia duty. Apparently, Samuel's claim to be a clergyman was denied for lack of a verifying document, and Joseph assumed the large sum was prejudiced a base insult practiced upon us on the account of our faith, that the ungodly might have unlawful power over us and trample us under their unhallowed feet. When Samuel had to sell his cow to pay the fine, Joseph condemned the court, I say in the name of Jesus Christ that the money that they have thus unjustly taken shall be a testimony against them and canker and eat their flesh as fire. The words conveyed the outrage of poor rural people defeated by official procedures they did not wholly understand and could not master. The most violent outburst came during a dispute with Joseph's younger brother William, the most volatile of the Smiths. Near the end of October, William brought charges against a brother David Elliot for whipping his teenage daughter. Called to testify, Joseph backed Elliot against William. Although soft-hearted toward children and opposed to whippings, 
Joseph had spoken with the family and concluded the girl was at fault and the neighbors were meddling. The council concluded that the charge had not been fully sustained, but Elliot has acted injudiciously and brought a disgrace upon himself, upon his daughter and upon this church, because he ought to have trained his child in a way, that she should not have required the rod at the age of fifteen years. Later that day, Joseph presided in the case of Mary Elliot, David's wife, who was brought before the council on the same charges. During the hearing, when Lucy Smith, William and Joseph's mother, testified, Joseph objected that she was hauling up old charges. William lost his temper, accusing Joseph of invalidating or doubting my mother's testimony, an unforgivable betrayal of family. Joseph told William he was out of place and ordered him to sit down. He refused, Joseph reported. I repeated my request and he become enraged. Ordered again to sit, William said he would not unless I knocked him down. Only the appeal of Father Smith stopped Joseph from walking out. Finally order was restored and the council delivered its ruling. The Elliots confessed their wrongs and were restored to full fellowship. The next day, William wrote Joseph that the council was censuring him for misbehavior, and he wanted to settle the matter. Joseph said he thought they had parted with the best of feelings his usual reaction when agreement had been reached. The next morning, William came anyway to resolve their differences. Joseph proposed that they tell their stories, confess their wrongs, and ask forgiveness, letting Joseph's Clark Warren Parish and Hiram judge between them. The proposal gave William a chance to vent his basic grievance. But he said, Joseph reported, that I was always determined to carry my points whether right or wrong and therefore he would not stand an equal chance with me. William thought Joseph had to have the upper hand. Joseph took this as an insult but restrained himself. Unfortunately, telling their stories got them nowhere. All efforts to calm his stormy feelings failed. William declared he wanted nothing more to do with the church and rushed out. William, an apostle, did not leave as threatened. A revelation three days after William stormed off said God would yet make him a polished shaft in my quiver. Perhaps to pacify his brother. Joseph gave William more credit to the church store than the other apostles, leading Orson Hyde to complain that he could not buy cloth on credit when William had run up $700 in bills. Joseph feared the bickering was tearing up the church. The adversary was destroying the work by causing division among the twelve. Joseph prayed that William would be delivered from the power of the destroyer and that he and all the elders would receive their endowment in the temple. Prayers notwithstanding. The situation grew worse. While quieting Hyde's complaint against William, Joseph got involved in another row with his brother. On a frigid December night, Joseph attended a debating school at William's house. The school had been open for over a month, treating such questions as was or was it not the design of Christ to establish his gospel by miracles? Decided in the negative, and was it necessary for God to reveal himself to man, in order for their happiness? decided in the affirmative. On December 16, a question was raised about the propriety of continuing the debates, or at least William thought the question was being raised. Hiram asked to speak, and before he said a word, William forbade him to abuse the school in his house. Joseph thought it unfair to prejudge what Hiram would say, and also to claim that the house was William's. Joseph had helped finish the house and Joseph Sr. had part possession. Joseph fruitlessly tried to reason with William. Meeting an inconsiderate and stubborn spirit, Joseph told him you was ugly as the devil. Joseph Sr. commanded his boys to stop, but William insisted he would say what he pleased in his own house. Joseph Jr., again protested William's claim of ownership and the right to speak. Despite his father's command of silence, Joseph felt justified in giving reproof in a house he had built. He later admitted this was an exaggeration, he had only helped. At this, William rushed Joseph, who had pulled off his coat to defend himself. Joseph had to be rescued from William's blows. When he got home, he could not sit or stand without help. Ashamed of being beaten, Joseph explained why his younger brother had won the fight. Joseph had been marred by Moz who had debilitated his body, he reminded William and it may be that I cannot boast of being stronger, than you. Joseph was further humiliated when Armand Babbitt reported that Joseph got mad because he was overpowered in argument. Insulted by the comment, Joseph brought Babbitt before the High Council for misrepresenting me to certain of the brethren. Joseph hated to feud. He was depressed by the abuse, anger, malice, hatred, 
and rage of that evening, to mangle the flesh or seek revenge upon one who never done you any wrong, Joseph wrote William, cannot be a source of sweet reflection, to you, nor to me, neither to an honourable father and mother, brothers, and sisters. He begged William to curb his passion and not leave the church, may God take away enmity, from between me and thee, and may all blessings be restored, and the past be forgotten. In private, he prayed earnestly for William that the Lord will not cast him off but he may return to the God of Jacob and magnify his apostleship. Weeks later, Joseph was still depressed. On January 1st, he brooded in his journal about the low state of the church. My heart is pained within me because of the difficulty that exists in my father's family. To make matters worse, William had one a brother-in-law and another family member to his side. The powers of darkness, Joseph reflected, cast a gloomy shade over the minds of my brothers and sisters, which prevents them from seeing things as they really are. Once again, the devil was determined to overthrow the church by causing division, all to prevent the saints from being endowed. Joseph met with William, Hiram, Joseph Sr., Uncle John Smith, and Martin Harris on New Year's Day to make peace. Joseph Sr.'s opening prayer melted their hearts, according to the journal and then B.R. William made an humble confession and asked my forgiveness for the abuse he had offered me and wherein I had been out of the way I asked his forgiveness. He promised mutual trust to the family in the same spirit as the promises made to the twelve. The spirit of confession and forgiveness, was mutual among us all, and we covenanted with each other in the sight of God and the holy angels and the brethren, to strive from henceforward to build each other up in righteousness. Lucy and Emma doubtless apprehensive about the outcome, were called in to hear the promises of mutual aid. Gratitude swelled our bosoms, tears flowed from our eyes, Joseph recounted, I was then requested to close our interview which I did with prayer, and it was truly a jubilee and time of rejoicing. Joseph and William regretted the outbursts, William's petition for forgiveness was pitiful in its abjection but their sensitivities repeatedly involved them in quarrels and fighting. Joseph rebuked critics and berated the defiant William. Outsiders who demeaned the prophet or his family were cursed. On the other hand, he warmly welcomed them back when they were contrite. When Harvey Whitlock, a backsliding saint, wrote a repentant letter, pleading for acceptance, Joseph wrote that the floodgates of my heart were broken up, I could not refrain from weeping. The angels rejoice over you. To modern eyes, Joseph's impulsiveness looks raw, but he was also vivid and strong. The expression of feelings bound people to him. Joseph summed up his own personality in a letter of instruction from the Liberty Jail three years later, reproving betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost and then showing forth afterwards an increase of love toward him whom thou has reproved lest he esteem thee to be his enemy that he may know that thy faithfulness is stronger than the cords of death. Zion promised to end the rancor. In Zion, there would be no lacerating offences, no insults, no vengeance, no infringements on honour. The inhabitants of Enoch's city were of one heart and one mind. The saints would live together amicably, escaping the ceaseless round of insults and reprisals, of rebuke and reconciliation. For Joseph, burdened with the contentious culture of New England's rural poor, social peace was heaven. After a particularly happy Sunday meeting in January, he wrote, I verily realized that it was good for brethren to dwell together in unity, like dew upon the mountains of Israel. He caught a glimpse of Zion when a group of friends cut his winter's wood in December. Joseph was sincerely grateful to each and every, one of them, for this expression of their goodness towards me. In a remarkable passage in his journal, he moved from simple gratitude to exaltation of the woodcutters. In the name of Jesus Christ I invoke the rich benediction of heaven to rest upon them and their families, and I ask my heavenly Father to preserve their health s, and those of their wives and children, that they may have strength of body to perform, their labors, in their several occupations in life, and the use and activity of their limbs, also powers of intellect and understanding hearts, that they may treasure up wisdom, understanding, and intelligence above measure, and be preserved from plagues pestilence, and famine, and from the power of the adversary, and the hands of evil designing, men and have power over all their enemies, and the way be prepared before them, that they may journey to the land of Zion and be established, on their inheritances, to enjoy undisturbed peace and happiness for ever, and ultimately to be crowned with everlasting life in the celestial kingdom of God.
which blessings I ask in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. If Joseph's theology had any foundation in his character, the footings are revealed in those words. Starting with appreciation for the winter's wood, he went on to strength of body, powers of intellect, and understanding hearts. Finally, he crowned the woodcutters with everlasting life. Next year in Zion, through all the bickering in the fall of 1835, Zion was never far from Joseph's mind. The expulsion from Jackson County and the failure of Zion's camp to recover Mormon lands had not dulled his zeal. In May 1835, on the eve of the Twelve's departure for their summer mission, Joseph proposed to the church in Kirtland that we never give up the struggle for Zion, even until death, or until Zion is redeemed. The vote, was unanimous and with apparent deep feeling. The Salvation of Israel in the Last Days, an article in The Messenger and Advocate proclaimed, consists in the work of the gathering. Men and angels are to be co-workers in bringing to pass this great work, and a Zion is to be prepared, even a new Jerusalem, for the elect that are to be gathered from the four quarters of the earth, and to be established in holy city, for the tabernacle of the Lord shall be with them. The return, they were assured, would be soon. Joseph told the Twelve in October 1835 that they should take their families to Missouri next season. With eight other leaders, he prayed the Lord will open the way and deliver Zion in the appointed time and that without the shedding of blood. He asked for means to purchase inheritances, and all this easily and without perplexity, and trouble. At supper with Joseph and Emma one evening, Newell Whitney observed to Edward Partridge that next year at this time they might be seated together around a table on the land of Zion. Emma added her hope that the company present might be seated around her table in the land of promise. Joseph noted that the same sentiment was reciprocated from the company round the table and my heart responded Amen God granted. How could they recover their lands? The Jackson citizenry would not permit a court trial for redress of grievances. Any saint who set foot in the county put his life in jeopardy. Since the Missourians were certain to wage war, the saints had to defend themselves. Joseph prayed for 800 to 1,000 well-armed men to accomplish the work. David Whitmer was appointed captain of the Lord's host. In September Joseph challenged the Kirtland High Council that we go next season to live or die in Jackson County. The prospect of a battle with his comrades beside him cheered Joseph's heart. We truly had a good time and covenanted to struggle for this thing until death shall dissolve this union and if one falls that the rest be not discouraged but pursue this object until it is accomplished which may God grant unto us in the name of Christ our Lord. Meanwhile, the saints in Missouri were to keep quiet. Joseph told them to make little or no stir and cause as little excitement as possible and endure their afflictions patiently until the time appointed. Like captive Israel in Babylon, their harps must be hung upon the willows, and they cannot sing the songs of Zion. They were to talk not of judgments but only the first principles of the gospel. Preach Christ and him crucified, love to God, and love to man. Whenever they could, they were to make mention of our republican principles, thereby if possible, we may allay the prejudice of the people. Although little could be done at the moment to speed the day, the saints collected petitions from branches all over the country and mailed them to Missouri in December. But arms and petitions figured less in their minds than spiritual strength. Ever since the dissolution of Zion's camp, Joseph had believed the saints would not prevail in Missouri without the endowment of spiritual power they had been anticipating for five years, their own Pentecost. The High Council minutes for August 4, 1835, noted that God has commanded us to build a house in which to receive an endowment, previous to the redemption of Zion, and Zion could not be redeemed until this takes place. To prepare for that time, Joseph assembled his leadership corps in Kirtland. The High Council and the bishopric came from Missouri, and the twelve apostles and the seventy from the mission field. We look for the great endowment to take place soon. Now there will be a great gathering of the saints to Zion next season, George Hinkle wrote a friend in October. William Phelps told his wife, Sally, in Missouri to remain patient. He did not know when Zion will be redeemed. Little is said or known but the endowment had to come first. Don't reckon too much on my coming home in the spring, he warned. Keep up your faith and pray for the endowment, as soon as that takes place the elders will anxiously speed for their families. 17, The Order of Heaven, January, April 1836. Now to let you know a few of the thousand great things of God that is passing in this place.
Some have seen the heavens opened and seen the Saviour others have seen angels on the four corners of the house of the Lord with drawn swords and also stood thick on the ridge Elisha with his chariot of fire, Peter John and James, and the highway cast up the tent tribes returning in chariots as far as the eye could extend some saw the redemption of Zion. Benjamin Brown, Kirtland, to Sarah Brown. March 1836 The winter and spring months of 1836 were among Joseph's happiest. For a time, everything went right. The strife of the previous fall ended, temple construction was progressing, the brethren studied Hebrew by day and gathered for spiritual meetings at night, weekly councils dispatched business and planned for the temple's dedication. After a long day in council, he wrote that this has been one of the best days that I ever spent. There has been an entire unison of feeling expressed in all our proceedings this day. Paraphrasing Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration, Joseph exulted that it has been good for us to be here. In early January, he attended a sumptuous feast at Bishop Whitney's. The guests sang, prayed, and Father Smith gave blessings. Our hearts were made glad, the prophet reported, in anticipation of joys that will be poured upon the head of the saints when they are gathered together on Mount Zion to enjoy each other's society forevermore even all the blessings of heaven and earth where there will be none to molest nor make us afraid. Here was a plain man's dream, a feast and genial companionship, safe from enemies. Bishop Whitney invited everyone back a few days later. Joseph said the feast was after the order of the Son of God, a curious description of a party where people ate and laughed. A revelation a year earlier had attached the phrase after the order of the Son of God to the priesthood, here it was applied to a dinner party. Joseph said that the lame the halt and blind were invited according to the instructions of the Saviour, and the presence of the downtrodden probably made the feast seem Christ-like. But he applied the word order to other occasions that winter as if he felt that the order of heaven the template of a good society, was beginning to regulate every aspect of his people's lives. Life in Kirtland Joseph's own domestic life had become more orderly by the winter of 1836. In the fall, the Smith house had been full of people. Boarding temple workers crowded the rooms some nights, forcing Joseph and Emma to sleep on the floor. The strain on Emma may account for the premature departure from services that brought on Joseph's scolding. Earlier he had asked the boarders to leave, helping to ease Emma's burden, but the next month, Joseph's parents moved in having left William Smith's after the November argument at the debating society. Their arrival was less of a burden for Emma. Though prickly, Lucy got along well with her daughter-in-law. Sometime in the fall, Emma became pregnant with her fifth child. Three of her four children had died at birth or soon after. Only Joseph Smith III, born in 1832, had survived. The Smiths had also lost one of the twins adopted when their own twins died in 1831. The other adopted twin. Julia Murdoch Smith, was five in July 1836 when Frederick was born to Emma and Joseph. How the Smiths paid the bills in these years is a mystery. Joseph's journal shows no evidence of working for money. In 1834, he had been granted the stewardship of a farm near the temple site, but he recorded no income or benefit. He never mentioned doing farm work or supervising anyone's labors. Later he opened a store in Kirtland but the store was not profitable. Joseph's followers helped by bringing food, half a fattened hog from John Tanner, a quarter beef from Shadra Roundy. Others gave Joseph money or forgave borrowed sums. The Smiths never lived well, but in their small house on the hill neither did they starve. For others, temple construction provided an undependable income. Contributions from around the church paid wages and provided building materials. A line of little houses on half-acre plots, a kind of temple village was built near the temple for the workers. Jacob Abum plastered the inside of the temple, placing stoves in the cellar to warm the house and hurry drying. Artemis Millet, who supervised the framing, employed a crew of young men to stucco the exterior with broken glassware in the finish coat. Brigham Young glazed the windows and oversaw the painting. The workers were poor. Young once came to the printing house looking for assistance, saying he had nothing in his house to eat, and he knew not how to get anything. To feed his family, he borrowed $25 from a newcomer in town. The temple committee was so far in debt, it appealed constantly for contributions in order to pay the workers. Women spun, knitted, and sewed clothes for the laboring poor. Joseph negotiated loan after loan until the size of the debt drove him to pleading and bargaining with the Lord. He and Cowdery promised that if means were obtained to pay their debts, 
they would give one-tenth of their income to the poor and the same for their children and their children's children. Herbert Kimball later estimated final construction costs at between $40,000 and $50,000, a huge sum when a laborer was lucky to earn $400 a year. A large part was paid by one wealthy convert, John Tanner, who donated $13,000, and may have loaned another $30,000. By the summer of 1835, the saints were assembling for worship in the shade of the temple walls. In January, the School of the Prophets, also called the School for the Elders, which had met in the printing office since November, moved into the temple. The December 1832 revelation calling for the temple's construction had spoken of it as a house of learning and described how to conduct a school according to divine order. During the school's five-month term, the students studied Greek. Hebrew, and theology. The instruction did not go much further, though English grammar was taught as a remedial course, along with geography. In the four rooms under the eaves, the priesthood quorums assembled for instruction. While the workmen's tools were still scattered about, a singing school met in the chapel, as the temple was sometimes called. Endowment. The elders were meeting in the temple primarily to prepare for the endowment of power. Joseph had awaited five years for this long-promised heavenly gift. An 1830 revelation had promised the saints they would be endowed with power from on high when they got to Ohio, and an 1832 revelation said priesthood ordinances would help them to see the face of God. Spiritual blessings, much like an endowment, were received at the first session of the School of the Prophets in 1833. But later the saints learned that the endowment would come in the temple a house where God could endow those whom I have chosen with power from on high. Oliver Cowdery told the Twelve, when they were ordained in February 1835, that they were not to go to other nations till you receive your endowments. Because they had not known Jesus in mortality, these modern apostles had to know him by revelation. Never cease striving until you have seen God face to face. Cowdery told them. That time seemed close in October 1835. Joseph told the twelve they were to attend the school of the prophets that fall and prepare their hearts in all humility for an endowment with power from on high. Indeed all priesthood holders were to ready themselves by reining up our minds to a sense of the great object that lies before us, viz, that glorious endowment that God has in store for the faithful. The saints expected to relive the Pentecost in the Book of Acts when the powers of heaven rained down on the first Christians. The gift from heaven would energize all other projects, missionary work, the gathering, and the recovery of Zion. On a cold night in November 1835, when an inch of slush covered the ground, Joseph told the twelve that new ordinances were coming to be done in God's own way. He had thought the church was on a permanent foundation a year earlier when he had organized the High Council in Missouri. He was ready to die, he said, thinking his work was complete. But now God requires more at my hands. A solemn assembly was to be called and organized according to the order of the house of God. Joseph was beginning to glimpse an unchanging and timeless temple order. The order of the house of God has and ever will be the same, he told the Twelve, even after Christ comes and after the termination of the thousand years it will be the same, and we shall finally roll into the celestial kingdom of God and enjoy it forever. As preparations were made, Joseph was preoccupied with the right order for everything. Church councils had to follow the pattern of the ancients. His history said the cornerstones of the Kirtland Temple were laid after the order of the priesthood, which was to divide twenty-four priesthood holders into four groups of six and assign each to a corner beginning at the southeast. In 1835 and 1836, ceremony began to infuse ordinary church business. Joseph instituted an elaborate voting method involving the presidency of the church, the Twelve Apostles, the Seventy, and the High Councils of Missouri and Kirtland. Before this time, a single council, usually the High Council in Kirtland, had made administrative decisions for the church as a whole. But once the priesthood revelation of March 1835 explained that the governing quorums constituted the spiritual authorities of the church, the possibility of them all working together had to be considered. A variant of this assemblage of authorities, called the Grand Council, had sustained the doctrine and governance in August 1835. A representative of each priesthood quorum, seated in order of seniority, arose in turn to approve the book making in all ten different quorums voting one by one, plus the congregation as a whole. Through the winter of 1836, 
Joseph managed church affairs this same way, at a large assembly on January 13, 1836. Proposals to appoint men to bishoprics and high councils were presented for confirmation. The sustaining and ordaining of officers went on from 10 a.m. until evening, the quorums once again voting individually on each proposal. Since the voting was unanimous, the procedure was largely ceremonial, an act of confirmation rather than contest. Joseph loved it. He relished the spirit of the God of Israel resting on them in mighty power. William W. Phelps wrote his wife that the Grand Council was one of the most interesting meetings I ever saw. Women remained invisible in the organization and were absent from most ritual events. Some resented it. During the 1836 Pentecostal sessions, George A. Smith remembered, a few women thought that some mischief was going on, some were right huffy about it. They were most sensitive about exclusion from spiritual occasions, gifts being their vital connection with the church. Joseph would not define a place for women in the order of heaven for another half dozen years. But in this spiritual season, weddings and dinners involving women were turned into holy celebrations. At the marriage of John Boynton and Susan Lowell, Joseph pronounced the blessings of Abraham Isaac and Jacob upon the pair, before Sidney Rigdon delivered a forcible address. After prayer, Joseph blessed three servers filled with glasses of wine, which were passed around, followed by cake. Joy filled every bosom, and the countenances of old, and young, alike, seemed to bloom with the cheerfulness and smiles of youth and an entire unison of feeling seemed to pervade the congregation. Joseph enjoyed these social occasions as much as the meetings of authorities in the Grand Council. I doubt whether the pages of history can boast, he noted in his journal of a more splendid and innocent wedding and feast than this for it was conducted after the order of heaven. During the winter, a small committee under Joseph's direction worked out nine rules for temple conduct. They prohibited going up the stairs during worship, marring the house with knife or pencil, and children playing in the rooms. Speakers were not to be interrupted by laughing, whispering, or menacing gestures and the presiding officers were not to be insulted. Joseph solemnly told the assembled authorities that they were under great responsibility to enforce the rules in righteousness before God, inasmuch as our decisions will have a bearing upon all mankind and upon all generations to come. Decorum apparently had to be perfect for the saints to receive the outpouring of heaven. Even the walls and the furniture were to be honored, if people were to change from natural to heavenly conduct. Later the saints removed their shoes and dressed in white on entering the temple. Pentecost, in midwinter, the elaborate attention to heavenly order bore fruit. At Sunday meeting on January 17, Joseph organized the attendees into the several quorums, and instead of the usual preaching, the First Presidency and the Twelve confessed their faults to one another. The congregation were soon overwhelmed in tears, Joseph said, and some of our hearts were too big for utterance, the gift of tongues, come upon us also like rushing of a mighty wind, and my soul was filled with the glory of God. William W. Phelps could scarcely talk. When I was speaking, he wrote Sally, which was but few words, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me so that I could not speak and I cried as little children cry in earnest and the tears from my eyes ran in streams, the audience, which was the largest ever convened in the said room, sobbed and wept aloud. The temple rituals began with washings. Earlier, in January 1833, Joseph had washed the feet of thirteen brethren, following the example of Jesus in the Gospel of John. In 1836, a new kind of washing, one for the whole body, was instituted following Old Testament practices. On Thursday afternoon, January 21, we attended to the ordinance of washing our bodies in pure water, Joseph wrote in his journal. We also perfumed our bodies and our heads, in the name of the Lord. Oliver Cowdery gave a fuller description of washings performed the previous Saturday. Met in the evening with bro, Joseph Smith, Jr., at his house, in company with bro, John Corrill, and after pure water was prepared, called upon the Lord and proceeded to wash each other's bodies, and bathe the same with whiskey, perfumed with cinnamon. This we did that we might be clean before the Lord for the Sabbath, confessing our sins and covenanting to be faithful to God. While performing this washing unto the Lord with solemnity, our minds were filled with many reflections upon the propriety of the same, and how the priests anciently used to wash always before ministering before the Lord. As we had nearly finished this purification, 
Martin Harris came in and was also washed. When the brethren met the following Thursday, they added an anointing with oil. Dark having fallen, the west room of the temple was lit by candles. While the high councils from Kirtland and Missouri waited in two adjoining rooms, Joseph and six other men attended to the ordinance of anointing our heads with holy oil. Recording exactly how he proceeded, Joseph wrote that I took the oil in my left hand. Father Smith being seated before me and the rest of the presidency encircled him roundabout. We then stretched our right hands to heaven and blessed the oil and consecrated it in the name of Jesus Christ. The circle laid their hands on Father Smith and blessed him, after which Joseph anointed his father with the oil, and the others laid their hands upon his head, beginning at the eldest, until they had all laid their hands on him, and pronounced such blessings, upon his head as the Lord put into their hearts as they did so rubbing their hands over his anointed face and head, having been anointed and blessed himself, Joseph Sr. rose and anointed the others in order of age. When he came to his son, he sealed upon me the blessings, of Moses, to lead Israel in the latter days, even as Moses led him in days of old, also the blessings of Abraham Isaac and Jacob. All of the presidency followed Father Smith with blessings and prophecies on Joseph. One searches in vain for such rituals among Joseph's Protestant contemporaries. The Shakers' mountain top feasts of the Passover were in another vein entirely, and the Baptists' feet washing in imitation of the New Testament practice never came to full washings or anointings with oil. Oliver Cowdery reveals Joseph's source in commenting that those named in the first room were anointed with the same kind of oil and in the manner that were Moses and Aaron, and those who stood before the Lord in ancient days. In Exodus, the Lord commanded Moses to bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and wash them with water. Then thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments, and anoint him, and sanctify him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. The washing and anointing of ancient Hebrew priests became the pattern for the modern temple. Even the cinnamon perfume was in the biblical recipe for anointing oil. Exodus called for myrrh and calamus to be mixed with sweet cinnamon, but cinnamon was all these poor latter-day priests could manage. In an era when many Christians were sloughing off the Hebrew Bible and taking their gospel solely from the New Testament, Joseph drew upon ceremonies in Exodus. Later the saints clothed themselves in holy garments like Aaron. After Joseph's anointing, he wrote, The heavens were opened upon us and I beheld the celestial kingdom of God, and the glory thereof, whether in the body or out I cannot tell. He saw the throne of God whereon was seated the Father and the Son in the streets of heaven looking like gold. He saw Adam, Abraham, and Michael and his older brother Alvin, who had died when Joseph was seventeen. How could Alvin be in heaven without being baptized? Joseph wondered. A voice told him that all who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it, if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. He saw the twelve apostles in the foreign land standing together in a circle much fatigued, with their clothes tattered and feet swollen, with their eyes cast down hard, and Jesus standing in their midst, and they did not behold him, the Saviour looked upon them and wept. All through the night, Joseph saw visions, Elder McClellan in the south healing a lame man, and Brigham Young in a southwest desert breaching from a rock to a dozen men of color, who, appeared hostile. Young was protected by an angel of God standing above his head with a drawn sword. Joseph said that many of the brethren saw glorious visions also. After the presidency, Joseph anointed the bishops of Kirtland and Clay County with their councillors, the high councils of the two cities, and then the presidents of each quorum. The Bishop of Missouri, Edward Partridge, wrote that a number saw visions and others were blessed with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. The vision of heaven was open to these also. Some of them saw the face of the Saviour, and others were ministered unto by holy angels. Finally, after 1 a.m., the brethren sang, invoked the blessing of heaven with uplifted hands, and went home. The next day no one could concentrate on school. They wanted to talk over the glorious scenes that transpired on the preceding evening. Joseph had now established a procedure for the priesthood to follow in the temple, washing the body, anointing with oil and sealing the anointing with prayer. That evening the twelve apostles and the seventy underwent the same procedure. Joseph anointed Thomas Marsh, head of the twelve, and he in turn anointed his brethren, from oldest to youngest, sealing a blessing on each. The twelve anointed and blessed the presidency of the seventy, 
who did the same to each of their fellow seventies. Following the ordinances, tongues, fell upon us in mighty power, angels mingled their voices with ours, while their presence was in our midst, and unceasing praises swelled our bosoms for the space of half an hour. At two in the morning they went home, and, Joseph said, the spirit and visions of God attended me through the night. Six days later, in the west room of the temple attic, the presidency of the high priests were anointed and then their quorum, at the other end of the room, the elders presidency were anointed and they anointed their brethren. In another room, Joseph found the twelve apostles meeting with the seventy, and instructed them in an additional step, to call upon God with uplifted hands to seal the blessings which had been promised to them by the holy anointing. And so the ordinances were elaborated, each one bringing more spiritual manifestations. Joseph retired filled with the Spirit and my soul cried Hosanna to God and the Lamb through the silent watches of the night and while my eyes were closed in sleep the visions of the Lord were sweet unto me and His glory was round about me. Through January and February, the brethren read Hebrew by day, and washed, anointed, prayed and beheld visions by night. The occasional sermons were not recorded in Joseph's journal. Ordinances and spiritual gifts filled the entries, showing more concern with richer order than doctrine. One Saturday evening, he went to the upper rooms of the Lord's house and set the different quorns in order, telling them how to anoint. In the evening, I returned to my house being weary with continual anxiety and labor imputing all the authorities in order and in striving to purify them for the solemn assembly according to the commandment of the Lord. Oliver Cowdery prayed in his diary, O oh may we be prepared for the endowment, being sanctified and cleansed from all sin. William Phelps captured the mood in a verse of the Spirit of God, sung at the temple dedication in March. Will wash, and be washed and with oil be anointed with all that not omitting the washing of feet, for he that receiveth his penny appointed, must surely be clean at the harvest of wheat. Joseph's method for bringing his people to holiness differed from the approach of evangelical preachers. Rather than convicting people of their sins, thus humbling them before God, Joseph relied upon the power of ritual to arouse their spirits. The saints did not have to admit their helplessness as a first step toward reaching Christ. They were washed, anointed and blessed, ministered to, rather than upbraided, a more liturgical than evangelical method. Phelps wrote his wife, We are preparing to make ourselves clean, by first cleansing our hearts, forsaking our sins, forgiving everybody, all we ever had against them, anointing washing the body, putting on clean decent clothes, by anointing our heads and by keeping all the commandments. As we come nearer to God we see our imperfections and nothingness plainer and plainer. Ritual form was crucial. One Saturday night in early February, Joseph called the anointed together to receive the seal of all their blessings. They were organized by quorums, the high priests and the elders in one room, the seventy and the twelve in the next, the bishop preaks adjoining. He told each quorum to proceed with silent prayer, concluding with a sealing prayer by President Rigdon when all the quorums were to shout a solemn hosanna to God and the Lamb. Then all were to be seated and lift up their hearts in silent prayer, and if one had a vision or prophecy he was to rise and speak. For some reason, all the quorums did not comply. I went from room to room repeatedly, he said impatiently, and charged each separately, assuring them it was according to the mind of God. And yet while talking to the bishops he felt something was wrong with the elders and sent Hiram and Cowdery to investigate. Requested to observe order. The elders replied that they had a teacher of their own and did not wish to be troubled by others. Joseph reported as a result this quorum lost their blessing in a great measure. A cloud of darkness filled the elders' room, their minutes reported, while the more careful quorums enjoyed a great flow of the Holy Spirit that was like fire in their bones. Joseph said nothing about a revelation on washings and anointings. The only scriptural authorization came from Exodus. Yet Joseph assured the brethren that the order was according to the mind of God. He introduced the washings, anointings, and sealings as rigorously as any commandment. Ritual now assumed as much importance as the gathering or Zion or the organization of councils in the overall program of the church. The Kirtland rituals amounted to another form of revelation comparable in importance to the visitations of angels, the voice of the Spirit speaking for God, the translations of historical texts, and the organization of church councils by precedent and experience. Dedication, in March, the temple washings and anointings ended, 
and the month was devoted to Hebrew study in the school. Attended school as usual was Joseph's typical diary entry. The temple neared completion and dedication loomed. The quorum of singers was practicing in the chapel, Joseph reported on March 16, likely perfecting songs that Emma and William Phelps had compiled for a book of hymns. Five of the six hymns sung at the dedication were written by Phelps and Parley Pratt, the leading Latter-day Saint poets. The first presidency spent the Saturday before the dedication working on seating arrangements and ordering events. At this climactic moment, the priesthood organization would be displayed and the accumulated organizational layers ordered spatially. In his notes on the planning meeting, Joseph specified the seating chart for the meeting. At the west end of the temple, in the altars, the Patriarch, First Presidency, Presidency of Zion, and Presidency of the High Priests. The Twelve Apostles on the right in the three highest seats with the Presidency of the Elders just below them. The Twelve High Councillors of Kirtland on the left in the three first seats with Joseph's scribes below them. At the east end of the temple, the Bishoprics of Kirtland and Zion in the first two altars with the Presidencies of the Priests and Teachers below them. The Twelve High Councillors of Zion to the right with the Presidency of the Deacons below them. The Presidents of the Seventy to the left. Every quorum was given a place roughly in order of precedence. The Twelve Apostles, on the right of the First Presidency, were coming to be seen as the quorum next in authority. The Kirtland High Council sat next to the Presidency at the West End indicating a rank slightly above the High Council in Missouri, seated by the bishops at the East. The dedication on March 27 was open to the general public. A great many strangers came from the country to see it, reported Ira Ames, who collected donations at the door. People arrived at 7 a.m., and 500 or 600 were waiting outside when the doors opened at 8 o'clock. Joseph, Cowdery, and Rigdon seated 900 to 1, thousand in the lower court of the temple. The overflow went to the schoolhouse for a meeting, and the dedication was repeated the following Thursday for their benefit. Recognizing the general interest, the dedicatory prayer was published in a messenger and advocate broadside. As often happened on grand occasions, Sidney Rigdon, the most polished of the church's preachers, took the leading role. Opening the meeting, he read two psalms, prayed and then spoke two and a half hours on a text from Matthew and the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Joseph called Rigdon's address forcible and sublime, and well adapted to the occasion, but said nothing about the content. Joseph was more interested in the business of the meeting. Rigdon asked the quorums to acknowledge Joseph as a prophet and seer and to uphold him by their prayers of faith. The voting followed the procedures worked out in the Grand Council meetings of the previous winter. All the quorums in their turn gave their assent by rising on their feet. After an intermission, Joseph gave a short address, on what subject he did not say, and then asked the quorums to acknowledge the entire First Presidency as prophets and seers. I then called upon the quorums and congregation of saints to acknowledge the twelve apostles who were present as prophets and seers. By now they were into the third round of polling. Quorum by quorum, they voted for the Kirtland High Council the bishoprics of Kirtland and Missouri, the High Council of Missouri, the Presidents of the Seventy, the Presidency of the Elders, and finally the Quorums and Congregation of Saints were called upon to acknowledge and uphold by their prayers the Presidents of the Priests, Teachers, and Deacons and their Councillors, which they did by rising. Depending on possible combined votes, there could have been twelve different sustainings by ten or twelve different quorums, plus the Congregation all rising to show each other support. This tedious ritual testified to the importance of organization in Joseph's mind. The day-long meeting dedicated church government as well as the temple. Joseph described the organizational business in detail while skipping over the sermons and the accounts of spiritual gifts. Constructing a kingdom of priests meant as much to him as propounding a set of doctrines. The dedication gave him the opportunity to display the church's organization, one of his masterpieces before the saints and the world. Only after this extended presentation of officers did Joseph come to the dedicatory prayer. He wrote the prayer by revelation. He later reported, with help from counselors and clerks. The prayer sums up the church's concerns in 1836, bringing before God each major project. The temple was presented to God for acceptance. Joseph asked that thy holy presence may be continually in this house. He prayed for the promised endowment to come to the saints. Let the anointing of thy ministers be sealed upon them with power from on high, 
let it be fulfilled upon them, as upon those on the day of Pentecost. Feeling increasing opposition, Joseph asked that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. He desired that no combination of wickedness shall have power to rise up and prevail over thy people. Joseph prayed that the righteous could gather to Zion and that the Lord would remember those who have been driven by the inhabitants of Jackson County, Missouri, from the lands of their inheritance. Then he prayed for the missionaries and for success in gathering Israel from among the nations. Finally, Joseph asked for the exaltation of the saints, that at the last day our garments may be pure, that we may be clothed upon with robes of righteousness, with palms in our hands, and crowns of glory upon our heads and reap eternal joy for all our sufferings. The meeting closed with a ceremonial gesture, a shout in the Methodist tradition. We then sealed the proceedings of the day, Joseph reported, by shouting Hosanna to God and the Lamb three times sealing it each time with Amen, Amen, and Amen. The dedication was over, but was this the Pentecostal endowment of power Joseph had so long anticipated? Joseph mentioned the appearance of angels. Frederick G. Williams testified that while President Rigdon was making his first prayer an angel entered the window and took his seat between Father Smith, and himself. Others saw angels, and two apostles sang and spoke in tongues. Although Joseph made no record of the events, others reported great manifestations of power, such as speaking in tongues, seeing visions, administration of angels. Oliver Cowdery saw the glory of God, like a great cloud, come down and rest upon the house, and fill the same like a mighty rushing wind. I also saw cloven tongues, like as a fire rest upon many while they spake with other tongues and prophesied. But the congregation did not see the face of God, and the level of spiritual manifestations did not equal the outpourings of January and February. Had the long-sought endowment finally been granted? Apparently satisfied with what had happened, Joseph returned to practical matters. The campaign to redeem Zion had been on hold for months, and he was eager to get busy. Two days after the dedication, Joseph and four counselors met in the most holy place in the Lord's house, probably the West Room in the attic and sought a revelation from him to teach us concerning our going to Zion. But then the Spirit whispered to come into the holy place three times with the other presidents and the bishoprics, fasting through the day and night, and, if they were humble, a revelation on Zion would be given. No record of such a revelation survives, but once the brethren were gathered in the temple, the meeting took another direction. Joseph decided to remain in the house until morning. Followers were to cleanse their feet and take the sacrament that we might be made holy before him, and thereby be qualified to officiate in our calling upon the morrow in washing the feet of the elders. The brethren washed feet and partook of the sacrament. The Holy Spirit rested down upon us, Joseph reported, and we continued in the Lord's house all night prophesying and giving glory to God. The next day, March 30th, more priesthood joined them and all the official members in this stake of Zion amounting to about 300. To provide for the multitude, Joseph called for towels and tubs of water and took up a collection to purchase bread and wine. The first presidency washed the feet of the twelve and then the brethren began prophesying on each other's heads, often sealing the prophecies with Hosanna and Amen. After lowering the veils, they prophesied, spoke and sang in tongues in each room. Exhausted after the all-night session, the presidency retired, but the rest of the brethren remained, exhorting, prophesying and speaking in tongues until 5 a.m. A few skeptics wondered if the brethren had become drunk on sacrament wine, but according to Joseph's journal, the non-stop Tuesday and Wednesday meetings were, finally, the endowment. The Savior made his appearance to some, while angels minus to done to others, and it was a Pentecost and endowment indeed long to be remembered for the sound shall go forth from this place into all the world, and the occurrences of this day shall be handed down upon the pages of sacred history to all generations, as the day of Pentecost. Not many saw the face of God or the Saviour, but enough had been given to say that the endowment was now theirs. As one brother wrote later, some brethren expressed themselves as being disappointed at not receiving more and greater manifestations of the power of God, but for our part. We had found the pearl of great price, and our soul was happy and contented, and we rejoiced greatly in the Lord. Joseph told the quorums that I had now completed the organization of the church and we had passed through all the necessary ceremonies, that I had given them all the instruction they needed. Now they needed to build up the kingdom of God. These exhausting and exhilarating three months, 
the zenith of the saints' ecstatic experience, came in the 1830s, at a high point of visionary religion in American history. In 1837, Emerson would tell Harvard Divinity School graduates that the gleams which flash across my mind, are not mine, but God's. In the next year, the era of manifestations began in Shaker communities at New Lebanon and Water Vliet, New York, where visions, tongues, and spiritual operations took over entire congregations. In 1844, Ellen G. White, the Adventist prophetess, would receive the first in a series of visions that eventually filled many volumes. In the late 1830s a cluster of evangelical theologians round Charles G. Finney at Oberlin contemplated the doctrine of sinless perfection. Under the influence of grace, a person could live a perfectly sinless life. For a number of groups, the cap on human experience seemed to be lifting. Aftermath, joyous as the endowment was, Joseph's attention went back to Zion immediately. After the seven-month suspension, the missionaries were to return to the field to gather Israel, empowered now by their spiritual experiences. If ever the saints were slain or driven from their lands in Missouri again, Joseph vowed, we would give ourselves no rest until we are avenged of our enemies. They would breach or fight, whichever was required, confident that God was with them. The Saturday following the last endowment experience, Joseph's clerk noted him talking on his favorite theme, which was the redemption of Zion. The clerk observed that the positive manner in which he Joseph Smith expressed himself was directly calculated to produce conviction in the minds of those who heard him, that his whole soul was engaged in it. He and Cowdery set out that day to collect funds to redeem their lands. To their surprise, the spiritual experiences in the temple were not over. The next Sunday, about a thousand people attended a morning service and returned in the afternoon for the sacrament. At the conclusion, Joseph and Cowdery went into one of the pulpits and had the veil dropped, cutting them off from view of the congregation. In seclusion, they experienced one of Joseph's most spectacular visions, later recorded by Warren Cowdery, Joseph's clerk and Oliver's brother. They saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before them, and under his feet was a paved work of pure gold, in color like amber, his eyes were as a flame of fire, the hair of his head was like the pure snow his countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah, saying, I am the first and the last, I am he who liveth, I am he who was slain, I am your advocate with the further behold your sins are forgiven you, you are clean before me, therefore, lift up your heads and rejoice, let the hearts of your brethren rejoice and let the hearts of all my people rejoice, who have with their might built this house to my name. For behold I have accepted this house and my name shall be here, and I will manifest myself to my people, in mercy, in this house, yea I will appear unto my servants and speak unto them with mine own voice, if my people will keep my commandments and do not pollute this holy house. What could this staggering experience have meant to Joseph and Cowdery? Unfortunately, Joseph's detailed Ohio journal ends with Warren Cowdery's entry. The long run of reports abruptly halts not to be resumed for two years. We have no idea what Joseph and Cowdery said when they came from behind the veil, or how widely they shared the account. The vision was not included in editions of the Doctrine and Covenants published during Joseph's lifetime, and no manuscript copies exist save Warren Cowdery's and the one Willard Richards copied into Joseph's history for the church newspaper in 1843. Joseph never mentioned the event in his other writings. There is no evidence he told the Kirtland Saints. Warren Cowdery reported additional visitors behind the veil that day. Moses appeared, and then Elias, followed by Elijah. Each personage presented keys that is, the power and right to perform certain acts on God's behalf. Moses, to gather Israel, Elias, for the gospel of Abraham, and Elijah for turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and children to the fathers, in fulfillment of a prophecy in Malachi. No explanation of these keys was given. The gathering of Israel was familiar by this time, but the significance of the gospel of Abraham and uniting the hearts of fathers and children could only be surmised. The episode behind the veil is mysteriously suspended at the end of the diary without comment or explanation as if Joseph was stilled by the events. Joseph would have needed time to understand Elijah's part in the order of heaven. As for Abraham, Joseph had been translating his writings since the Egyptian scrolls were purchased the previous summer, and Abraham's gospel still was not clear. How did it differ from the gospel the saints already had? In time, 
the name of Abraham would be invoked to explain marriage practices too radical to be announced. Besides marking the completion of the temple, the April 3rd vision signaled the coming of incommunicable revelations. The frequency of announced revelations slowed in the ensuing years. Doctrine came through sermons, offhand comments, and letters, reports on revelations rather than full revelations themselves. An air of mystery and reticence rises around the prophet. He had conscientiously worked to install the order of heaven in Kirtland as rapidly as new light came to him introducing washings and anointings and ceremonial order. After the temple dedication, he confidently informed the saints that he had completed the organization of the church and given them all the instruction they needed. Zion could now be built. But then just as he was setting to work on Zion, an enigmatic revelation intervened. The revelation behind the veil suggested that Joseph was moving ahead of his followers. He began to speak of revelations they could not bear. 18. Reverses April 1836 to January 1838, brethren we have waded through a scene of affliction and sorrow thus far for the will of God, that language is inadequate to describe pray ye therefore with more earnestness for our redemption. Joseph Smith to John Corrill and others, September 4, 1837, the dedication of the temple in 1836 was a high point, after its completion. Joseph Smith's life descended into a tangle of intrigue and conflict. To this point, the church had suffered little internal contention. Joseph's most virulent critics had been newspaper editors and lapsed Mormons. By the winter of 1837, however, factions in Kirtland, believing Joseph had fallen, were trying to depose him. Joseph was accused of false steps in the promotion of a Kirtland bank and of moral transgression in taking an additional wife or worse. Some of his most trusted associates lost confidence in him, and for the first time, loyalty became a central issue. Who would stand by him? Who would turn against him? Unfortunately, Joseph's own words are rarely heard in this dark time. There are no more dictated journals, no writing by his hand. Clarks made his diary entries, sometimes only listing official acts. Not even the birth of Joseph's son Frederick is mentioned. The revelations decreased too between the dedication of the Kirtland Temple in the spring of 1836 until the Prophet fled Kirtland in early 1838, only two brief revelations were recorded. From then until the end of his life, only twenty more were added to the canon. His speeches are known only from notes by listeners. On the large issues of the next eight years, plural marriage, the temple endowment, the plans for the Kingdom of God, we hear virtually nothing from Joseph himself. He moves behind a screen of other minds. Those of clerks who wrote his diaries, hearers who took notes on his sermons, enemies who charged him with dire crimes, official letters written by others, sensational reports by newspaper editors, and later remembrances of loyal old comrades and embittered former friends. The image of Joseph Smith shifts and goes out of focus. We know the facts of his life, a succession of battles and defeats, widening influence and doctrinal exposition, a reach for power and glory and finally gunshots and death, but not his personality or attitudes. Was he the same hopeful Joseph Smith of the Kirtland years, the person who yearned to be the friend of God, or did he develop an insatiable appetite for position and eminence? Did he give way to his lusts? The answers depend on who speaks. Fanny Alger, there is evidence that Joseph was a polygamist by 1835. Was he also an adulterer? In an angry letter written in 1838, Oliver Cowdery referred to the dirty, nasty, filthy affair of Joseph Smith and Fanny Alger. What did that mean? Had Joseph been involved in an illicit affair? Some of his critics tried to depict him as a libertine going back to the New York years. One of Emma's cousins by marriage, Levi Lewis, said Martin Harris spoke of Joseph's attempt to seduce Elizabeth Winters, a friend of Emma's in harmony. But the reports are tenuous. Harris said nothing of the event in his many descriptions of Joseph nor did Winters herself when interviewed much later. Considering how eager the Palmyra neighbors were to besmirch Joseph's character, their minimal mention of moral lapses suggests libertinism was not part of his New York reputation. In Kirtland, the situation was more complicated. Alger was 14 when her family joined the church in Mayfield, near Kirtland, in 1830. In 1836, after a time as a serving girl in the Smith household, she left Kirtland and soon married. Between those two dates, perhaps as early as 1831, she and Joseph were reportedly involved, but conflicting accounts make it difficult to establish the facts. 
much less to understand Joseph's thoughts. Was he a blackguard covering his lusts with religious pretensions, or a prophet doggedly adhering to instructions from heaven, or something in between? Rumors of Mormon sexual license were circulating by 1835, when an article on marriage published in the Doctrine and Governments said that church members had been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy. Coming from faithful Mormons, this evidence of marital irregularities cannot be ignored, but neither can it be taken at face value. From the Munster Anabaptists of the 16th century to the camp meetings of the 19th, critics expected sexual improprieties from religious enthusiasts. Marital experiments by contemporary radical sects increased the suspicions. John Humphrey Noyes, founder of the Anita community, concluded that there is no more reason why sexual intercourse should be restricted by law, than why eating and drinking should be. With old barriers coming down, people were on the lookout for sexual aberrations. What, if anything, lay behind the accusations of the Mormons is uncertain. They were apparently on edge themselves. The seventies resolved to expel any of their members guilty or polygamy. No one intimated in 1835 that Joseph's actions caused the rumors. The sources written before 1839 indicate that most church leaders knew nothing of a possible marriage. What they did know is suggested by the minutes of Oliver Cowdery's excommunication trial before the Far West High Council in April 1838, one of the few contemporaneous sources. Cowdery long Joseph's friend and associate in visions, was a casualty of the bad times. In 1838, he was charged with seeking to destroy the character of President Joseph Smith Jr. by falsely insinuating that he was guilty of adultery. Fanny Alger's name was never mentioned, but doubtless she was the woman in question. The Far West Court did not accuse Joseph of being involved with Alger. Some counselors had heard the rumors but concluded they were untrue. They were concerned only with Cowdery's insinuations. He was on trial for false accusations, not Joseph for adultery. David Patton, an apostle, went to Oliver Cowdery to inquire of him if a certain story was true respecting J. Smith's committing adultery with a certain girl, when he turned on his heel and insinuated as though he was guilty. Thomas Marsh, another apostle, reported a similar experience. Oliver Cowdery cocked up his eye very knowingly and hesitated to answer the question, saying he did not know as he was bound to answer the question yet conveyed the idea that it was true. George Harris testified that in conversation between Cowdery and Joseph the previous November, Cowdery seemed to insinuate that Joseph Smith Jr. was guilty of adultery. Eventually the court concluded that Cowdery had made false accusations, and cut him off from the church. Cowdery denied that he had lied about Joseph and Alger. Cowdery had heard the accusations against him when he wrote to Joseph in January 1838. I learn from Kirtland, by the last letters, that you have publicly said, that when you were here I confessed to you that I had willfully lied about you. He demanded that Joseph retract the statement. In a letter to his brother Warren, Cowdery insisted he would never dishonor the family name by lying about anything much less about the Smiths, whom he had always defended. In his conversations with Joseph, Cowdery asserted, in every instance, I did not fail to affirm that what I had said was strictly true, meaning he believed Joseph did have an affair. His insinuations were not lies but the truth, as he understood it. Cowdery and Joseph fed their differences at a meeting in November 1837 where Joseph did not deny his relationship with Alger but contended that he had never confessed to adultery. Cowdery apparently had said otherwise, but backed down at the November meeting. When the question was put to Cowdery if he Joseph had ever acknowledged to him that he was guilty of such a thing he answered no, that it was all Joseph wanted, an admission that he had not termed the Alger affair adulterous. As Cowdery told his brother, just before leaving, he Joseph wanted to drop every past thing, in which had been a difficulty or difference, he called witnesses to the fact gave me his hand in their presence, and I might have supposed of an honest man, calculated to say nothing of former matters. These scraps of testimony recorded within a few years of the Alger business show how differently the various parties understood events. In the contemporaneous documents, only one person, Cowdery, believed that Joseph had had an affair with Fanny Alger. Others may have heard the rumors, but none joined Cowdery in making accusations. David Patton who made inquiries in Kirtland, concluded the rumors were untrue. No one proposed to put Joseph on trial for adultery. Only Cowdery, who was leaving the church, asserted Joseph's involvement. On his part, 
Joseph never denied a relationship with Alger, but insisted it was not adulterous. He wanted it on record that he had never confessed to such a sin. Presumably, he felt innocent because he had married Alger. After the Far West Council excommunicated Cowdery, Alger disappears from the Mormon historical record for a quarter of a century. Her story was recorded as many as sixty years later by witnesses who had strong reason to take sides. Surprisingly, they all agree that Joseph married Fanny Alger as a plural wife. Analyzer Webb Young, the notorious divorced wife of Brigham Young who toured the country lecturing against the Mormons, thought the relationship was scandalous but reported that Fanny's parents considered it the highest honor to have their daughter adopted into the Prophet's family, and her mother has always claimed that Fanny was sealed to Joseph at that time. Analyzer's father, Chauncey Webb, who reportedly took Alger in when Emma learned of the marriage, said Joseph was sealed the secretly to Fanny Alger, Mormon language for marriage. On the believer's side, Mosiah Hancock wrote in the 1890s about Joseph engaging Levi Hancock, Mosiah's father, to ask Alger's parents for permission to marry. Levi Hancock was Alger's uncle and an appropriate go-between. He talked with Alger's father, then her mother, and finally to Fanny herself, and all three consented. As in many subsequent plural marriages, Joseph did not steal away the prospective bride. He approached the parents first to ask for their daughter's hand. Hancock performed the ceremony, repeating words Joseph dictated to him. The whole process was formal and, in a peculiar way, old-fashioned. Most of the other stories about Joseph's plural marriage in Kirtland come from one individual without confirmation from a second source. Anne Eliza, for example, included a story of Fanny being ejected by a furious Emma, one of the few scraps of information about her reaction. Analyzer could not have been an eyewitness because she was not yet born, but she might have heard the story from her parents, who were close to the Smiths. Are such accounts to be believed? One of the few tales that appears in more than one account was of Oliver Cowdery experimenting with plural wives himself, contrary to Joseph's counsel. That pattern of followers marrying prematurely without authorization was repeated later when some of Joseph's followers used the doctrine of plural marriage as a license for marrying at will. Stories like these, all of them from intensely partisan witnesses, must be treated with caution. On that principle, the date when plural marriage was begun will remain uncertain. Todd Compton, putting the evidence together in his massive history, concluded that Joseph began practicing plural marriage around 1833. The sources offer conflicting testimony on when the principle was revealed. When a plural marriage revelation was finally written down in 1843, it referred to a question about Old Testament polygamy. You have inquired of my hand to know and understand wherein I the Lord justified my servants, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, as also Moses, David and Solomon, my servants as touching the principle and doctrine of their having many wives and concubines. Joseph frequently inquired about biblical practices while revising the scriptures, and it seems possible that he received the revelation on plural marriage in 1831 while working on the Old Testament. Because plural marriage was so sexually charged, the practice has provoked endless speculation about Joseph's motives. Was he a libertine in the guise of a prophet seducing women for his own pleasure? The question can never be answered definitively from historical sources, but the language he used to describe marriage is known. Joseph did not explain plural marriage as a love match or even a companionship. Only slight hints of romance found their way into his proposals. He understood plural marriage as a religious principle. Levi Hancock remembered the prophet telling him in 1832, Brother Levi, the Lord has revealed to me that it is his will that righteous men shall take righteous women even a plurality of wives that a righteous race may be sent forth upon the earth preparatory to the ushering in of the millennial reign of our Redeemer. As Joseph described the practice to Hancock, plural marriage had the millennial purpose of fashioning a righteous generation on the eve of the second coming. The end of Joseph's relationship with Fanny Alger is as elusive as the beginning. After leaving Kirtland in September 1836, Alger, reportedly a comely, amiable person, had no trouble remarrying. Joseph asked her uncle Hancock to take her to Missouri, but she went with her parents instead. They stopped in Indiana for the season, and while there she married Solomon Custer a non-Mormon listed in the censuses as grocer, baker, and merchant. When her parents moved on, Alger remained in Indiana with her husband. She bore nine children. After Joseph's death, Alger's brother asked her about her relationship with the prophet. She replied, 
that is all a matter of my own, and I have nothing to communicate. Clay County, Joseph had believed that the endowment of power in the temple would open the gates to Jackson County. Either an army of saints would sweep through, or their enemies' hearts would be softened. Two days after the temple dedication, Joseph and the other presidents met in the most holy place in the Lord's house and sought for a revelation from him to teach us concerning our going to Zion. Suspension of Joseph's journal in early April obscures what happened next, but by the summer of 1836, the saints were further than ever from their goal. On June 29, 1836, a public meeting in Liberty, Missouri, voted that the saints must leave Clay County, which had been their home since they were driven from Jackson County in late 1833. Now the clouds of civil war are rolling up their fearful masses, the drafting committee reported, and hanging over our devoted country. Solemn, dark terrible. The report recalled the sympathy shown the penniless saints when they first arrived. Now, when they were purchasing land and increasing their numbers, their alien character was becoming obvious, they are eastern men, whose manners, habits, customs and even dialect, are essentially different from our own. Worst of all, they are not slaveholders, and opposed to slavery, which, in this peculiar period, when abolition has reared its deformed and haggard visage in our land, is well calculated to excite deep and abiding prejudices. Mormon opposition to slavery had come up earlier in a Jackson County manifesto claiming that Mormons planned to introduce free blacks into the county. The church had tried to neutralize the charge in a letter to the editor in the April 1836 Messenger and Advocate that responded to an abolitionist lecture in Kirtland, which church leaders feared would be interpreted as a sign of friendship for the abolitionist cause. Writing in Joseph Smith's name, the author denied that there was any local sympathy for the speaker. All except a very few, attended to their own avocations and left the gentleman to hold forth his own arguments to nearly naked walls. The letter echoed the ant abolitionist feeling that was peaking in the United States in 1836. Andrew Jackson had proposed that incendiary publications be barred from the mails. Southern congressmen successfully sponsored legislation to block petitions for ending the slave trade in Washington. D.C. Abolitionists were being mobbed everywhere. Caught up in this wave of anti-abolitionist enthusiasm, the letter repeated all the familiar biblical arguments in support of slavery and warned traveling elders against breaching to slaves without their master's permission. The messenger and advocate's feeble attempt to allay suspicion had no effect on the Clay County Committee that recommended Mormon withdrawal. The committee admitted that the county had not the least right, under the Constitution and laws of the country to expel them by force. But the committee feared an irrepressible conflict if the Mormons did not voluntarily leave. The religious tenets of this people are so different from the present churches of the age, that they always have and always will, excite deep prejudices against them, in any populous country. They would be happiest living alone in unsettled frontier regions. The Mormons were given time to sell any property over 40 acres at a fair price and then they were to leave. The church leaders in Clay County and Kirtland responded in the spirit of the committee's proposals. They agreed on the terms suggested, and the departure was so amicable that the citizens in Clay raised funds to help the poorest saints. In defense of the church's reputation. A letter from Kirtland did reply to the Clay County charge of Mormon abolitionism by pointing to the anti-abolitionist letter in the April Messenger and Advocate. On another count, the reason for the saints' poverty was the persecution they had suffered. Nothing was said about religious tenets so different from the present churches of the age. Their silence acknowledged the truth of that charge. Finances when the saints were driven from Jackson County three years earlier, Joseph had been stunned for months scarcely knowing what to do. This time, after dispatching letters to the Clay County officials, the Kirtland leaders set off on a trip east. Joseph and Hiram, Rigdon and Cowdery took passage from Fairport on Lake Erie the very day the letters were dated, their destinations New York City and Salem, Massachusetts. The purpose of the journey goes unstated, but in Salem, a revelation assured them, I have much treasure in this city for you, for the benefit of Zion and many people in this city whom I will gather out in due time for the benefit of Zion. Uncertain of his next step, Joseph was casting about for financial resources. The revelation put the best face on a misbegotten venture. Long after the event, Ebenezer Robinson, a printer in Nauvoo, remembered that a convert named Burgess had persuaded church leaders that a large sum of money was hidden in the cellar of a Salem house, 
Perhaps Joseph believed he could identify the site using his boyhood gifts as a treasure seeker. Less than encouraging, the Salem revelation opened with the words I the Lord your God am not displeased with your coming this journey, notwithstanding your follies, and tried to deflect the men to missionary work. There are more treasures than one for you in this city. The wealth pertaining to gold and silver could be obtained in due time, implying that meanwhile they should concentrate on people. For two weeks, the men taught from house to house, taking time out to visit the famous East India Marine Society Museum like ordinary tourists. On August 20, Rigdon lectured on Christianity at the Lyceum. All the while they looked for the treasure house. On August 19, Joseph wrote Emma that we have found the house since Bro. Burgess left us very luckily and providentially, as we had one spell been most discouraged. They were plotting how to get possession. The house is occupied, and it will require much care and patience to rent or buy it. Joseph said they were willing to wait months if necessary, but by September, the party was back in Kirtland with no treasure for their pains. The Kirtland leaders grasped at the slimmest hopes. The temple had left a debt of around $13,000, and in the summer of 1836, the church faced the additional expense of establishing a new stake of Zion in Missouri. At the June trial of two brethren accused of insufficient generosity, Frederick Williams put it bluntly, the church is poor, Zion is to be built and we have not means to do it unless the rich assist, and because the rich have not assisted, the heads of the church have to suffer and are now suffering under severe embarrassments and are much in debt. In December 1836, Elders in the branches were told to stop sending their poor from among them, and moving them to this place, without the necessary means of subsistence, a policy Joseph must have lamented. Joseph opened a merchandise store, but the venture called for still more capital. The month after he returned from Salem, he borrowed $11,000 for land purchases and store inventory. John Corrill heard the store inventory eventually cost between $80,000 and $90,000 thousand dollars. The borrowing went on through 1837 until Joseph had run up debts of over one hundred thousand dollars. While risky, the indebtedness was not extravagant. The lenders would not have extended credit were Joseph and the church without prospects. Creditors doubtless viewed the loans as capital investments, not credit for personal consumption. The loans were secured by store goods or land with many notes showing multiple signatures. The Kirtland leaders followed standard practices for merchants and land brokers developing the Midwestern economy. They borrowed to build a business. To make the Mormon market especially attractive, the church could almost guarantee an ingathering of saints eager to buy land. Developers all over the country were borrowing the land under less favorable circumstances. Assured by the church's prospects, lenders extended credit even as the debt rose. To raise more capital, church leaders planned a bank. Like stores and mills, banks were multiplying in the 1830s. Twenty banks had been chartered in Ohio since 1830. In November 1836, church leaders dispatched Cowdery to New York to purchase plates for printing currency, and Orson Hyde was sent to the state capital in Columbus to apply for a charter. On November 2, the Kirtland Safety Society Bank was organized and began selling stock. As usual, Joseph thought big. Capital stock was set at $4 million, though the roughly 200 stock purchasers put up only about $21,000 in cash. Herber C. Kimball subscribed for $50,000 in shares for only $15. The rest of the issue was secured by land. In actuality, the Safety Society was a partial land bank, a device New Englanders had once resorted to in their cash-poor, land-rich society. Land bank notes secured by the farms of participants, gave landowners liquidity to initiate commercial ventures when capital was lacking. Unfortunately, the hybrid Kirtland Bank, based partly on land and partly on specie, set up expectations for redeeming notes in hard money. The disappointments began almost immediately. Cowdery brought back the plates and printed notes, but Hyde failed to obtain the charter from the Ohio legislature which knew the pitfalls of underfunded banks. Hard money Democrats saw the weakness in the Kirtland operation immediately. The Mormons adjusted by organizing themselves into an anti-banking company and, spiting the legislature, stamped the word anti before the word banking, and began issuing notes. The issue of about $100,000 made no claim that the bills were legal tender. The notes were the promissory notes of a private company. In an earlier day, they would have been called a medium of trade 
replacing barter as a means of exchange, allowing farmers to buy and sell by paying cash, instead of working out more complicated exchanges in a simpler and more isolated society, where mutual trust was high, the scheme might have worked. In Kirtland, the bank failed within a month. Business started on January 2, 1837. Three weeks later, the bank was floundering. Skeptical, and perhaps mean-spirited, customers presented their notes for redemption, and the bank's pitiful supply of liquid capital was exhausted within days. On January 23, payments stopped. From then on, the value of the notes plummeted, falling to one-eighth of their face value by February. All the investors lost their capital, Joseph as much as anyone. He had bought more stock than 85% of the investors. As treasurer and secretary and signers of the notes, Joseph and Rigdon begged the note holders to keep them, promising that the economy would benefit. In June, faced with complete collapse, both resigned. In August, Joseph publicly disavowed the Kirtland notes in the church newspaper. The bank staggered on until November, long since moribund. Meanwhile, Joseph's enemies attacked. A local mill owner, Grandison Newell, a longtime enemy of the Mormons, entered a suit against Joseph for issuing bills of credit illegally. The Charterless Kirtland Safety Society fell under the ban of an 1816 Ohio law forbidding private companies to issue money. The case was heard in March 1837 and held over to October, when Joseph was fined $1,000 adding to his huge debt. Creditors everywhere were closing in on their debtors. The nationwide collapse of the speculative bubble in 1837 tightened credit throughout the country. The Mormons' creditors were as zealous as any. Kirtland merchants refused to sell the saints' flour, driving up the price and forcing them to trade with neighboring towns. Sidney Rigdon told the church in an April meeting that the Gentiles are striving to besiege the saints in Kirtland and would be glad to starve the saints to death. Everyone who accepted safety society notes at face value suffered from the collapse. Losses are estimated at $40,000 about the cost of the Kirtland Temple. Mormons, who invested in the bank and trusted the notes, suffered most. Jonathan Crosby lacked the money to invest in the bank, but he took the bills in payment for his work. When flour rose to $10 a barrel, Crosby could not purchase provisions. I was then compelled to stop work and spent a day running about town trying to buy some food with Kirtland money, but could get nothing for it. Emma Smith gave him a ham and 40 pounds of flour. The bank episode not only hurt the saints financially, it tried their faith. The notes had their profits signature on the face. He had encouraged investment, his enthusiasm persuaded subscription. Wilford Woodruff marveled at Joseph's vision of Kirtland. Joseph presented to us in some degree the plot of the city of Kirtland as it was given him by vision. It was great marvelous and glorious. The city extended to the east, west, north, south. Steamboats will come puffing into the city. Our goods will be conveyed upon railroads from Kirtland to many places probably to Zion. Houses of worship would be reared unto the Most High. Beautiful streets was to be made for the saints to walk in. Kings of the earth would come to behold the glory thereof and many glorious things not now to be named would be bestowed upon the saints. Carried along by the booster spirit that infected virtually every western town in these decades, Joseph promised too much. Town promoters like William Ogden in Chicago or, later, William Larama in Denver believed they could create something out of nothing and did. Overly optimistic. Joseph started construction on a new house. Other brethren went heavily into debt expecting to profit in the predicted boom. John Corrill remembered that some brethren suffered pride to arise in their hearts, and became desirous of fine houses, and fine clothes, and indulged too much in these things, supposing for a few months that they were very rich. A year earlier, in 1836, they had seemed to be succeeding. A visitor to Kirtland that fall was astonished to see that a city had sprung up since I was there last March. I should think there were between 100 and 200 houses, perhaps more, and new buildings, most of them are small and plain, but some of them are elegant. By April 1837, when the bank was floundering, Joseph was still telling his people that this place must be built up, and would be built up and that every brother that would take hold and help secure and discharge those contracts that had been made, should be rich. His hopes were doomed. When the effects of the 1837 panic and the subsequent depression spread, any chance of Kirtland and its bank prospering was destroyed. Far from flourishing as their prophet had foretold, 
the Saints were caught in a downward spiral of personal losses and narrowing opportunities. Widespread apostasy resulted, the volatility in prices, the pressure to collect debts, the implication of bad faith were too much for some of the sturdiest believers. The stalwarts Parley and Orson Pratt faltered for a few months. David Patton, a leading apostle, raised so many insulting questions Joseph slapped him in the face and kicked him out of the yard. Joseph's counselor Frederick G. Williams was alienated and removed from office. One of the prophet's favorites, his clerk Warren Parrish, tried to depose him. Herbert C. Kimball claimed that by June 1837 not twenty men in Kirtland believed Joseph was a prophet. Wilford Woodruff's Kirtland, in later retellings, the turmoil of this bad time overshadows the ordinary course of life in Kirtland in 1837. Brigham Young and Heber Kimball told grim stories. Eliza Snow who was living in Joseph's household, added a terrifying account of apostates with bowie knives in the temple. The tales were accounted years later to emphasize the importance of loyalty in trying circumstances, but they had the effect of making 1837 appear like an unbroken fall into apostasy and ruin. In the worst of these times, Joseph kept the support of hundreds and probably thousands of loyal followers. Apostasy was rife, but the church was not near collapse, as leaders defected men of equal ability rose to take their places. By 1837, Mormonism had developed such momentum that the loss of a few high-placed men could not slow it down. While Joseph was fending off critics in Kirtland, the Missouri church leaders were building a Zion in Far West. Elsewhere, the traveling elders were gathering converts faster than Joseph's opponents could make apostates. A more balanced picture comes from the diary of Wilford Woodruff. A 30-year-old convert who made nearly daily entries from January to May 1837, the period when opposition was taking shape. Woodruff began his diary perhaps the best by a 19th century Mormon, as he left on his first mission in January 1835. The son of a Connecticut miller, he had moved to New York in 1832 to farm with his brother. Perpetually dissatisfied with existing churches, he was looking for an authoritative version of Christianity. I believed the Church of Christ was in the wilderness, he later wrote, and that there had been a falling away from the pure and undefiled religion before God. When he heard a Mormon elder preach, Woodruff believed immediately and joined in 1833. A rock-solid, intense man, with glowing deep-set A's, he volunteered for Zion's camp the proving ground for later Mormon leaders. After a mission to Kentucky and Tennessee, Woodruff returned to Kirtland in November 1836. Although not eminent enough to be called in for the endowment of power earlier that spring, Woodruff was well acquainted in town. Joseph greeted him on his arrival, one friendly face among many. Woodruff wrote, I was truly edified to again strike hands with President Joseph Smith Jr and many other beloved saints of God who were rolling on the mighty work of God and of Israel. Woodruff's circle of friends represented a substantial second-rank, self-motivated priesthood who were rolling on the mighty work. A passionate enumerator, Woodruff summed up his labors for 1836 by noting he traveled 6,557 miles, held 153 meetings, started one congregation, baptized 27 persons, blessed nineteen children, healed four persons of disease, and had three mobs come together against me but always as yet delivered from their hands. Woodruff was one of scores, perhaps hundreds, of Mormon missionaries gathering converts across the United States. The messenger and advocate carried frequent reports from the field, and a new journal was envisioned just to publish their letters. Many of these men scarcely knew Joseph Smith and honored him more for his office than for his personal influence on their lives. They preached, debated, baptized, withstood mobs, and healed the sick on their own. In Kirtland, Woodruff attended school with fellow veterans of the missionary wars. There is an enjoyment in meeting our brethren and companions in tribulation that the world knows not, he wrote. On the first Sunday in Kirtland, Joseph spoke in the morning meeting, and in the afternoon, Woodruff and Abraham Smoot were asked to speak. For the rest of the winter, Joseph appears in the diary only intermittently in occasional group settings. He gave sermons and officiated at occasional marriages, but appeared more like an eminent neighbor than an overwhelming presence. Woodruff was more involved with the Seventies, who met on Tuesday evenings through the winter. They assembled to ordain initiates and receive instruction. We had an interesting meeting 
Woodruff wrote after one gathering, Much of the spirit of prophecy was poured out upon those presidents while ordaining the third seventy. Woodruff wrote a diary page on his own ordination. In a blessing given by Zebedee Coltrane, Woodruff was promised he would heal the sick, cause the blind to see and the deaf to hear, and have power to waft myself, as did Philip, from river to river from sea to sea and from continent to continent for the purpose of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. During the day, Woodruff studied Latin and Greek at a school taught by Professor Hawes. On January 4, the school was examined and a four-week recess declared. With time on his hands, Woodruff visited the Kirtland Safety Society office on January 6 to see the first notes issued to Jacob Bump. Joseph told them he had received a revelation about the society in an audible voice not just by impressions of the Spirit. Joseph did not disclose the revelation but remarked that if we would give heed to the commandments the Lord had given this morning all would be well. Woodruff entered his own small prayer asking that the society would become the greatest of all institutions on earth. From then on, Woodruff wrote news of the bank along with other events. At one Thursday prayer meeting, Woodruff heard an account of the general gathering of Israel in the gift of tongues. The next Sunday at Bishop Newell Whitney's house, Woodruff had a very happy time in speaking singing hearing and interpreting tongues and in prayer with the family. A week later, five elders of the church laid their hands on Abraham Smoot and immediately healed him of his pain and fever. Into these happy accounts, Woodruff interjected the jarring note that on January 24 he feared a mob from Painesville to visit us that night and demolish our bank and take our property. But they did not appear. Messages coming from church leaders suggest more internal tension than Woodruff himself felt. As early as December 1836, warnings were being delivered in Sunday meetings. Oh what a meeting, Woodruff wrote. On this day the God of Israel sharply reproved this stake of Zion Kirtland through the prophets and apostles for all our sins and backsliding and also a timely warning that we may escape the judgments of God that otherwise will fall on us. A month later, Brigham Young warned us not to murmur against Moses or Joseph or the heads of the church. Complaints spread as the bank collapsed. The next Sunday, Sidney Rigdon exhorted the church to union that they might be prepared to meet every trial and difficulty that awaits them. Two days later, David Whitmer rebuked the Seventies for their pride. A scourge awaits this stake of Zion even Kirtland if there is not great repentance. Everyone knew this, Whitmer said, especially the heads of the church. Joseph preached on Sunday, February 19, after having been away on business for a few days. While he was gone, Many were stirred up in their hearts and some were against him as the Israelites were against Moses. Woodruff thought Joseph silenced the critics. When he arose in the power of God in their midst, as Moses did anciently, they were put to silence for the complainers saw that he stood in the power of a prophet. Joseph spoke again the next Sunday with the same effect. Though his friend Warren Parrish was to defect in a few months, Woodruff showed no uncertainty about the church leadership. Interspersed with the warning sermons were Woodruff's reports of a missionary pair who had baptized 267 persons in Canada over the last eight months, a great patriarchal blessing, a funeral, a church court where a brother was chastised and restored to fellowship, and the healing of a boy from pleurisy. Woodruff. Meanwhile, had returned to his Latin studies. On March 24, he wrote that I left school in view of spending some time in studying history and preparing for the endowment. He reported events at one of the regular Thursday prayer meetings where the saints spent the whole day in prayer and fasting. After scripture reading and brief remarks, the veils were lowered, dividing the room into four segments two for women and two for men. The time was taken up during the day in each apartment in singing exhortation, and prayer. Some had a tongue, others an interpretation, and all was in order. Woodruff, who had missed the temple dedication the previous spring, had his own Pentecost. The gifts were poured out upon us. Some had the administering of angels and the image of God sat upon the countenances of the saints. Finally, at four in the afternoon, the veils were lifted bringing participants in view of one another, when the saints fell upon their knees and all as one man, vocally poured forth rejoicing, supplication and prayer before the God of Israel. To close, they made a contribution to the poor and then departed. The spiritual experiences occurred without noticeable direction from Joseph. He was not there when initiates were instructed in the rituals of washing and anointing. When the rituals were instituted the previous spring, 
Joseph had closely supervised them. A year later, the 70s performed the ordinances on their own. Woodruff was sent to President Williams to have the perfumes and oil prepared against the day following. That night they performed their first washings. After washing our bodies from head to foot in soap and water we then washed ourselves in clear water next in perfumed spirits. The Spirit of God was with us and we had a spiritual time. Once washed, the men became officiators. Woodruff said, I washed and perfumed the bodies of a number of my brethren and the interview closed after expressing our feelings to each other. That evening they met in the upper part of the temple for the anointing with oil. Fifteen of the seventies were anointed and many received a blessing from President Coltrane. At ten the meeting closed, all without Joseph appearing. The second and third rank leaders managed on their own. Joseph was more in evidence on April 6, 1837, the church's seven-year anniversary conference. In a preliminary meeting, he and rigged and ordained new leaders of the seventy and sealed a blessing upon the newly anointed. They all then shouted Hosanna, 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 to God and the Lamb, Amen, and Amen, and Amen, Woodruff wrote, and if ever a shout entered the cabinet of heaven that did and was repeated by angels on high and caused the power of God to rest upon us. Afterward, the men joined the saints in the lower court where the veils were once more dropped and the twelve assisted the seventies presidents in washing feet, culminating the series of temple rituals. Heber Kimball pronounced Woodruff clean from the blood of this generation. Then the veils were rolled up. Woodruff did not feel the bank trouble threatened Joseph's authority. After hearing his address at the April 6th conference, he felt the prophet was clothed with the power, spirit, and image of God. Woodruff concurred when the prophet said the dissenters have become covenant breakers for which they will feel the wrath of God. Woodruff found evidence of Joseph's greatness in his sermons, Joseph is as a father to Ephraim and to all Israel in these last days. He mourns because of unbelief and the negligence manifest with many who have received the gospel in obeying the commands of God. He fears lest but few be left to receive an inheritance. There is not a greater man than Joseph standing in this generation. Nothing short of a God can comprehend his soul paradoxically. The trials of 1837, instead of tearing Joseph down, built him up. The power, gifts and graces of the gospel continued to visit Woodruff, but by June the sky blackened. On May 28 he noted that the same spirits of murmuring, complaining, and of mutiny, that I spake of in February 19 in this journal, hath not slept from that day to the present. They have been brewing in the family circle in the secret chamber and in the streets until many and some in high places had risen up against Joseph. Warren Parish arose in public meeting and in the blackness of his face and corruption of his heart stretched out his puny arm and proclaimed against Joseph. Woodruff had stopped boarding with his old friend. Oh, Warren, Warren, Woodruff lamented, when thou art converted strength in thy brethren. Oh my God deliver me from such a crime. On May 31st, Woodruff left Kirtland on another mission. Apostasy, the bank failure, suspicions about Joseph's morals and economic stress combined to bring on the apostasies of 1837. When Joseph, battered by creditors, tried to collect payment for three city lots he had sold Parley Pratt in the inflationary delirium a few months earlier, Pratt exploded in rage and frustration. If you are still determined to pursue this wicked course, until yourself and the church shall sink down to hell, I beseech you at least, to have mercy on me and my family. His brother Orson and Lyman Johnson brought charges against Joseph for lying, extortion, and speaking disrespectfully, against his brethren behind their backs. It took months for the Pratts to recover their composure and return to the fold. In retaliation, charges were brought against the complainers. At a May 29th High Council meeting, five brethren accused Parrish, Parley P. Pratt, David Whitmer, Frederick G. Williams, and Lyman Johnson all high church officers, of following a course that has been injurious to the church of God. For once the council system was unequal to the occasion. Whitmer and Williams denied the high council's jurisdiction because a revelation had said that presidents were to be tried by a bishop's court. Pratt objected to Rigdon and Joseph sitting on the case since they had previously spoken against him, Cowdery admitted that he had too. Rigdon and Cowdery then withdrew from the council both claiming Pratt was guilty. Williams said he could not preside because he had been accused. The council then dispersed in confusion. In the middle of the disarray, Joseph was hauled off to court on another charge. Grandison Newell, 
who had gone after Joseph Smith for breaking the banking laws, brought a suit against Joseph on June 3, 1837, for plotting Newell's assassination. The angry Newell had sponsored Dr. Philastus Hurlbut's search for the Spalding manuscript and had led a band of rowdies who pelted Parley Pratt with eggs while he preached in Mentor. The Mormons suspected Newell of getting up a mob to attack the bank. In the 1837 suit, Newell's star witness was an excommunicated Mormon named Solomon Denton, once a helper in the Smith household who testified that Joseph had approached him to assassinate Newell. Orson Hyde testified for the prosecution that Joseph had said in January or February 1837 that Newell should be put out of the way, or whether Groves could not find him. When the shocked Hyde asked what he meant, Joseph assured him he had spoken inadvertently in the heat of passion. Hyde told the court, I have known him for some time and think him to be possessed of much kindness and humanity toward his fellow beings. With little evidence to support Newell's suspicion, the court acquitted Joseph, insinuating, according to Newell, that my hatred, not my fear, induced the prosecution. Mary Fielding, a recent convert from Canada who witnessed the disaffection, wrote home in mid-June that truly my heart has almost bled for Joseph. Besides facing the dissidents, he was struck down by a nearly fatal illness in early June. He was incapacitated while his critics reviled him in meetings. One Sunday, Parley Pratt preached that Joseph had committed great sins. After Rigdon defended the prophet, Pratt left in protest. Mary Fielding stayed to hear Cowdery attempt a reconciliation, but when Orson Pratt attacked Joseph, she walked out to Parrish, who had climbed into Joseph's seat on the stand, spoke last and the meeting broke up without the Lord's Supper. Many tears were that day shed by those who had come up here to worship God in his house, said Fielding. She walked home by way of Joseph's house not knowing whether he lived till next morn. Fielding found Joseph able to walk, but illness and contention had worn him down. Fielding said that he feels himself to be but a poor creature and can do nothing but what God enables him to do. When he was too weak to pray himself, he told his visitors, the enemy strove with all his power to get his spirit. The struggle sometimes became so great that he had to call upon his wife or some friend to pray that the good spirit might conquer. At the same time, Joseph was blessed with such glorious visions as made him quite forget that his body was afflicted. By mid-June, Fielding could write that the Lord begins to pour out his spirit upon us in mighty power and I truly feel encouraged to hope that we shall ere long have order and peace restored to the church. Hiram spoke in meeting on feeling humble as a little child, breaking into tears as he spoke. By early July, meetings were back to normal. It was truly gratifying, Fielding wrote, to see Joseph Smith Sr., the venerable patriarch with his two aged brothers in the upper stand and in the next, four of his sons with President Rigdon in their midst. She noticed how proud Lucy was of the Smith men, her eyes are frequently bathed in tears when she looks at, or speaks of them. At the regular Thursday meeting, many spake in tongues and others prophesied and interpreted. It was one of the best meetings the Kirtland Saints could remember. Some of the sisters while engaged in conversing in tongues their countenances beaming with joy, clasped each other's hands and kissed in the most affectionate manner. The brethren as well as the sisters were all melted down and we wept and praised God together. Fielding thought angels entered the room. Zion, while he was fending off the apostates. Joseph looked beyond Kirtland to a broader field. The twelve apostles had been contemplating a European mission in keeping with their commission to carry the gospel to the world, and in June 1837, Joseph called Heber C. Kimball to lead a band of seven to England. On June 13, they set out to begin a work that over the next fifteen years would yield fifty-one thousand converts. Three weeks later, 1,500 saints in Far West broke ground for a new temple in Missouri. By the day's end, an excavation for a 110 by 80 foot foundation had been dug. William Phelps reported that the Missouri Saints were increasing daily, and we shall soon have one of the most precious spots on the globe. A few months later, in September, a conference in Kirtland discussed the need for more gathering places, as many as 11 new stakes, and more missionaries. During the conference, 109 elders accepted mission calls. A circular letter from the bishopric showed the enthusiasm for Zion was still high. Whatever is glorious. Whatever is desirable, whatever pertains to salvation, either temporal or spiritual, our hopes, our expectations, 
our glory and our reward, all depend on our building Zion according to the testimony of the prophets. To promote the work and probably to escape trouble, on July 26, 1837, Joseph left Kirtland with Hiram, Rigdon, David Patton, and Thomas Marsh, headed for Canada. He had gone north once before when Herbert was pursuing him. This time vexatious lawsuits in Painesville delayed him for a day, but by taking circuitous routes, he eluded his creditors and reached a port on Lake Erie. His absence gave the dissenters free reign in Kirtland, shattering the calm of the past month. Eliza Snow, who was there, later said that the dissenters claimed that the temple belonged to them. Headed by Warren Parrish, the ringleader, and armed with pistols and bowie knives, they occupied the East Pulpits one Sunday morning when Joseph Sr. was conducting. One usurper started heckling the speaker, and Father Smith told him to wait his turn. At this, Parrish, Apostle John Boynton, and others drew their pistols and knives. Boynton threatened to blow out the brains of the first man who dared to lay hands on him. Amid the shrieks, women and children tried to jump out the window. Constables carried off the troublemakers, who, as a countermeasure, charged Joseph Sr. and 18 others with assault, battery, and riot. The violent outburst seemed like a complete collapse. Snow herself said that nearly, if not every quorum was more or less infected. And yet, after his return from Canada, Joseph held a conference where the church leaders were presented for a sustaining vote and Joseph put himself before the membership. He and the first presidency were sustained unanimously, and three dissidents were excluded from the twelve. The next Sunday, the three spoke in meeting, confessed their sins, and were forgiven. They were restored to full fellowship and reappointed to their former positions. Joseph did not fear them and was quick to forgive. The three brethren administered the sacrament to the congregation. Joseph did not seem to worry about his position in the church. At the September conference, he announced that Oliver Cowdery was in transgression, and soon after chastised John Whitmer and William Phelps in Missouri, with a warning to David Whitmer. Joseph was not concerned that criticism of these longtime leaders might weaken his own authority. To check on progress in Far West, he and Rigdon traveled west in October, where he aired the complaints against the Missouri leaders and his former counselor Frederick G. Williams, but they all were sustained in their positions save Williams. On the same visit, Joseph confronted Cowdery about the accusation of adultery with Fanny Alger. While he dealt with disaffection in Missouri in November, the Kirtland dissenters rallied again. Parrish, Boynton, and Luke Johnson, the off and on again apostles, aided by Joseph Coe and others, undertook to take over the church under the banner of the old standard. The title implied the dissenters held to the original restored gospel while objecting to more recent developments. They claimed that 30 of the most talented men in Kirtland had joined them, and support was solicited in Missouri from the Whitmers, Cowdery, Williams, and William McClellan. This time punishment was swift. In late December, 28 men were cut off from the church, bringing the total to more than 40 that year. But excommunication did not silence the group. In mid-December, they were very violent in their opposition to the president and all who uphold him. The old standard faction was determined to hold their meetings in the temple even if it is by the shedding of blood. They claimed to be the legitimate church, making Joseph the apostate. They called themselves the Church of Christ, the church's first name. Joseph and Rigdon left Kirtland in the night on January 12th. 1838. The lawsuits were building up, and apostates were feared to be plotting more desperate measures. Joseph claimed that armed men, whether Mormons or irate creditors, he did not say, pursued them for 200 miles from Kirtland. Joseph and Rigdon had resolved in November to move to Missouri, but their leave-taking in January was precipitous. Brigham Young had gone three weeks earlier, forced to leave. He later said, by enemies who threatened to take my life because I would proclaim publicly and privately that I knew by the power of the Holy Ghost that President Joseph Smith was a prophet of the Most High God. Emma was pregnant when she followed Joseph in a wagon with the three children. Soon after they left, the church printing office went up in flames, scorching the nearby temple. The turmoil in Joseph's mind in 1837 seems to have matched the disruptions in the church. The despair he felt during his June illness may have been with him at other times. Reading between the lines of the sparse records, 
It appears that the letdown after the Kirtland endowment puzzled and depressed him. He had anticipated triumph and instead suffered defeat. Where was God during these setbacks? Only one revelation during the year was deemed worthy of inclusion in the later doctrine and governance. Only one letter in Joseph's voice went into the record. His usual inspiration seemed closed or at least he chose to keep silent about it. Except for the bold stroke of the English mission, he seems to have lost his way. The bank, his great hope for Kirtland, had crashed, injuring and alienating his friends. He knew only dark days. He wrote to John Corrill in Missouri in September that we have waded through a scene of affliction and sorrow thus far for the will of God, that language is inadequate to describe. Though he blessed the God who has delivered you many times from the hands of your enemies, he had no counsel to offer, no revelation, no bright prospect. He sent them a copy of the Kirtland High Council minutes for September 3rd, that the Missouri Saints may know how to proceed to set in order and regulate the affairs of the church in Zion whenever they become disorganized. He had nothing more to say. 19, Trials, January, July 1838, We will never be the aggressors, we will infringe on the rights of no people but shall stand for our own until death. We claim our own rights, and are willing that all others shall enjoy theirs. No man shall be at liberty to come into our streets, to threaten us with mobs, for if he does, he shall atone for it before he leaves the place. Neither shall he be at liberty, to vilify and slander any of us, for suffer it we will not in this place. Sidney Rigdon, Oration, July 4, 1838. Emma was six months pregnant when she and Joseph left Kirtland with Sidney Rigdon in January 1838. They struggled west on bad roads in bitter cold with little money. At one point, Joseph was looking for work cutting cordwood when a local member supplied them with funds. In Paris, Illinois, the tavern keepers turned the Mormons away until Joseph threatened to burn down one of their houses if his family was refused. At the Mississippi, they crossed on broken ice. Finally in early March, 120 miles from far west, the Smiths were met with money and teams. On March 13, two months and a day after leaving Kirtland, the brethren came out to escort them the last eight miles. We were greeted on every hand by the saints who bid us welcome to the land of their inheritance. Joseph wrote back to Kirtland, Verily our hearts were full and we feel grateful to Almighty God for his kindness unto us. In a year and a half, the Missouri Saints had erected a thriving city with 100 buildings, a public square, and a temple site. Far West followed Joseph's and Frederick G. Williams's plan for the city of Zion, with four main streets 132 feet wide and the rest 82 and a half feet. In the surrounding countryside, the Saints opened as many as two thousand farms. One outsider said that it was by magic that the wild prairies over a large tract were converted into cultivated fields. Already rising land prices were forcing newcomers into outlying areas, where they could enter a government land claim at $1.25 an acre. Most Mormon settlers dwelt in cabins or small shanties, and many could afford only 40 acres but two or three years wages paid for a small farm. The Caldwell County population would rise to around 5,000 in 1838. Virtually all Mormons Mormons elected the magistrates, county clerk, and military officers. William W. Phelps was postmaster and justice of the county court. When Joseph arrived in 1838, a new city of Zion was on its way to completion. Within a year, it would all be lost. A new Zion. The conception of Far West was Joseph's, but Phelps, Edward Partridge, John Corrill, Isaac Morley, John Whitmer, and a handful of others actually planted the city on the raw prairie. Joseph's vision of Zion now had a life of its own. When Far West grew too crowded, Joseph told them to expand the city to four square miles rather than one, and he authorized the leaders to look for additional lands outside the county's bounds but local leaders made most decisions. When Edward Partridge wrote his brother in October 1837 that our town or city is called Far West, the words our town were entirely justified. The Mormons had taken an interest in this tract in the spring of 1836, four months before the Clay County citizens formally asked them to leave. A few Mormon exiles from Jackson County had been among the first settlers in the largely uninhabited area. Most settlers preferred the timbered lands along the rivers to the open prairies, peering one over another, as far as the eye can glance. The area the Mormons took up was about two-thirds prairie, tough grasslands with sod a foot thick, 
requiring special plows to break it up, though rich soil lay underneath. Hoping to be left alone, the Mormons moved on to the less desirable lands. After their experience in Jackson and Clay counties, the Mormons felt they must ask nearby settlers for permission to move in. They requested a meeting in Ray County, where the desired lands were located, to present their case. Without hesitation, the Ray citizens said no. Mormon migration would retard the prosperity of the county, check further emigration of any class except Mormons, and disturb the peace. With no assurance of protection, the Mormons had to pull back. Before they left Clay, they wrote the governor about their fear lest the inhabitants will rise up to mob us, in other places, or in other counties. They wanted to know whether the governor would quell these mobs, and help us obtain a location. Governor Dunklin was less sympathetic than when they had appealed to him during the Jackson County riots. Again he told them to use the courts for redress, but, he admitted, there are cases, sometimes, of individual outrage which may be so popular as to render the action of courts of justice nugatory, in endeavoring to afford a remedy. He suggested that the saints themselves must be at fault for the citizens' enmity, but could not say why. As the Mormons said, not one solitary instance of crime had been lodged against them in either Jackson or Clay courts. The governor noted somewhat diffidently, your neighbors accuse your people, of holding illicit communications with the Indians, and of being opposed to slavery for which he had no evidence. He was helpless to offer a solution. All I can say to you is, that in this republic, the vox populi is the vox de With no protection from the government, the saints depended on the goodwill of their neighbors, which Ray County refused to give. The impasse was broken when Alexander Donifan of Clay County, a member of the state legislature and the Mormon's legal counsel, submitted a bill to create two counties out of northern Ray County, called Well County, just north of Ray, for the Mormons, and Davis, immediately above Caldwell, which would be open to all. The framers of the legislation probably thought that Caldwell would hold the saints. They would live there and nowhere else. Mormons would control local government, and other citizens would leave them alone. Donifan apologized for not getting the entire region for the Mormons, considering their rapidly expanding numbers, but opposition from the Jackson County representative and the governor, by this time Lilburn Boggs, a resident of Jackson County prevented it. The bill, signed into law on December 19, 1836, cut Caldwell's size to roughly 18 miles from north to south and 24 miles east to west. The compromise placated the citizens of Ray, who understood the Mormons would be restricted to the undesirable northern prairie lands and would not live among the Missourians in Ray. The Mormons meanwhile bought out all the non-Mormon settlers in Caldwell including the bee men who hunted wild honey on the prairies. An 1838 dispute about the state boundary in northern Missouri was called the Honey War. By late 1836, the Mormons, still wary of potential mobbings, began moving in. All this was history when Joseph reached far west in the spring of 1838. The site gave him his first opportunity to construct a city from the ground up. He had scarcely been there a month when a revelation called the saints in called well my church in Zion, implying that far west was to take the place of independence. Let the city far west, be a holy and consecrated land unto me, the Lord said, and it shall be called most holy for the ground upon which thou standest is holy. A temple was to be constructed, and the new Zion was to be for a defense and for a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. Then other places should be appointed for stakes in the regions round about as they shall be manifested unto my servant Joseph. In the late spring, Joseph began looking for more land. On May 18, he headed north with a large party for the purpose of laying off stakes of Zion in Davis County. On the open prairies, they saw deer, turkey, partridges, elk, and a wolf that Joseph set his dog after. When they reached the Grand River angling to the southeast, they thought about steamboats hauling in freight. Hiking through the timber along the river, they came to the place where Lyman White operated a ferry at the bottom of Tower Hill. Inspired by what he saw, Joseph invested the place with a history, partly from the Book of Mormon, partly from the Bible. He spotted an old Nephite Psalter and Tower, and then received a revelation that said Spring Hill was named by the Lord Adam on the Arman, because it is the place where Adam shall come to visit his people, or the Ancient of Days shall sit as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. The name of the site, Adam on the Arman, meant the place where Adam dwelt. 
presumably after his expulsion from the garden. For two weeks, the party surveyed lands, intending to purchase everything between Adam on the Armen and Far West 25 miles to the south. After that they would obtain the land to the north. Joseph returned to Far West just before Emma bore a son, whom they named Alexander Hale Smith but the rest of the party went on surveying and building houses until June 5. The church did not have the resources to purchase the land outright, but they entered preemption rights with the government, which would permit them to buy the land for $1.25 an acre in November when it was to be open for sale. The surveying went on outside Caldwell, beyond the limits of the informal agreement limiting the Mormons to one county. Since the terms were never specified, the Mormons may have thought that staying away from Ray County to the south was all that mattered. With migrants pouring in, Joseph could scarcely keep his people out of open areas. He heard in early May that 200 wagons would be arriving from Canada in three weeks. A few days later, a reconciled Parley Pratt, fresh from New York, brought word of saints flocking from all parts of the world to this land, to avoid the destructions which are coming. Kirtland saints were planning to come too. More than 500 left on July 6 and arrived on October 2. By that time, a Mormon living at Far West reported that emigration to the stakes of Zion is very great almost every day witnesseth from 1 to 30 teams with furniture and families tenement room very scarce in this place, many families have to live in their tents and wagons. Joseph encouraged the immigrants with a revelation promising to make solitary places to bud and to blossom, and to bring forth in abundance. By May the habitable parts of Caldwell were mostly settled and there were 150 houses in Far West. In June, Joseph organized a stake at Adamondi Armin and Davis, and by October, 200 houses had been built there. One observer said the city had 500 people in it before Gillettin, the county seat of Davis, had five houses. The expansion beyond Caldwell would prove to be fatal. Descent. Joseph soon learned that the disaffection in the Kirtland Church had spread to Caldwell County beginning with the Missouri Presidency. Not long after Caldwell was settled, the Missouri Saints began to doubt the faithfulness of David Whitmer, William Phelps, John Whitmer, and Oliver Cowdery. John Corrill, a member of the Missouri Bishopric with Edward Partridge, thought that a misunderstanding about land purchases aroused suspicion of Phelps and Whitmer, presidents of the Missouri Church. Sometime in the winter of 1836-37, Church members came to doubt them on account of their having entered the town plot and some other lands in their own names, suggesting they were speculating in Caldwell County lands. The land was soon deeded to the bishop, the church officer responsible for land, but complaints accumulated. In January 1838, a group of apostles and high councillors appointed a committee to make inquiries. Soon after, the excitement rose so high that they turned them out of their presidential office. At a February council meeting, George Moray, a high councillor, set forth in a very energetic manner, the proceedings of the presidency as being iniquitous. The four were accused of various infractions of the word of wisdom and of selling their lands in Jackson County, signalling a lack of faith in the saints' return to their promised land. Cowdery admitted to drinking tea three times a day for his health, and the Whitmers contended tea and coffee were not governed by the revelation. As for their property, the four threatened to leave if they were forbidden to sell their Jackson lands. Phelps said he would move out of the accursed place. Moreover, they would not be controlled by an ecclesiastical power of revelation whatever in their temporal concerns. Considering the answers unsatisfactory, the council removed the four from office. By this time popular feelings were at fever pitch. Had we not taken the above measures, Thomas Marsh wrote Joseph. We think that nothing could have prevented a rebellion against the whole high council and bishop, so great was the disaffection against the presidents. Joseph approved the judicious high council that cut off Phelps and Whitmer, adding that the saints at this time are in union and peace and love prevails throughout, in a word heaven smiles upon the saints in Caldwell, as if the removal of dissenters had brought the harmony essential to Zion. The individual complaints against the Missouri presidency blended with the larger issue of loyalty to Joseph Smith. The prophet had warned the Missouri saints the previous fall about the transgressions of the four men. The High Council's investigations only confirmed his earlier suspicions. In a public meeting, Apostle David Patton spake with much zeal against this presidency, and in favor of B.R. Joseph Smith Jr. somehow, 
Opposition to the Missouri presidency was interpreted as support of Joseph. A new phrase was added to entries in the minutes about the appointment of faithful brethren who were called men in good standing and friends to Joseph Smith Jr., the prophet. Friendship to Joseph divided true saints from fools. That summer Patton wrote a long discourse for the Elders' Journal on the scriptural foundation of Joseph's authority. Although Joseph's own position was never seriously threatened, after the repeated struggles with the Kirtland dissenters he had lost patience with the opposition. He did what he could to end controversy, but when reconciliation failed, he cut his brethren off to preserve union and peace and love. He would tolerate failings in his closest followers, but not disloyalty. In April, Joseph attended the trial of his bosom friend Oliver Cowdery, whose relationship with the church had been deteriorating for nearly a year. In September 1837, Joseph publicly announced that Cowdery was in transgression, though he retained his positions as assistant counselor to Joseph and one of the presidents of the church in Far West. After dropping him from the Far West presidency in January, the High Council tried him for his church membership on April 12, 1838. One of the nine charges was falsely insinuating that Joseph had committed adultery. He was also accused of urging vexatious lawsuits against the Mormons, leaving his calling to make money and counterfeiting. Perhaps the heart of the matter was stated in a charge of virtually denying the faith by declaring that he would not be governed by any ecclesiastical authority nor revelation whatever in his temporal affairs. Cowdery was charged with selling his lands in Jackson County contrary to the revelations, a sign he was withdrawing from the economic order of the church. Joseph told the council that Cowdery had said he wanted to get property and if he could not get it one way he would another. For a couple of years, Cowdery had been trying to develop a law practice and obtain political office. The saints suspected him of drumming up business by urging their enemies to bring suits for debts. He was charged with leaving the calling, in which God had appointed him, by revelation, for the sake of filthy lucre, and turning to the practice of the law. In response to the charge of selling land in Jackson County, Cowdery launched into a discourse about a lodial tenure as contrasted to feudal tenure. Strange language for a church court. Allodial holdings allowed a person to dispose of land without the permission of an overlord. In America, he reminded the council, land was held allodially, unlike under the feudal regimes of Europe. He might have added that freehold tenure was widely considered to be the economic basis of a republican society. By limiting land sales, he implied, the church had reverted to feudalism. He was unwilling, the letter went on to subject himself to any ecclesiastical authority or pretended revelation. He based his actions on the three great principles of English liberty the right of personal security, the right of personal liberty, and the right of private property. This attempt to control me in my temporal interest, I conceive to be a disposition to take from me a portion of my constitutional privileges and inherent rights. Cowdery was speaking as a citizen of a republic rather than as a member of the church that he had once thought was the kingdom of God on earth. Cowdery's letter is a reminder of the complex ideological environment of Mormons in the 1830s. Most of the time they spoke kingdom of God language, using words like faith, righteousness, Zion, gathering, priesthood, and temple. At the same time, as American citizens, they knew the political language of rights and freedom. Most church discourses was conducted using scriptural language, but they all knew Republican speech as well. Cowdery showed how easily a disaffected member could slip out of millennial, scriptural discourse into political talk, using Republicanism to discredit church leaders. Democratic discourse transformed obedience, faith, and loyalty into fanaticism and blind submission. The injunction not to sell land in Jackson County became a feudal imposition, a trespass on American property rights. My venerable ancestor was among that little band, who landed on the rocks of Plymouth in 1620, Oliver informed his judges, invoking an event as familiar as the stories in the Bible. Cowdery's Plymouth ancestor, he told the council, brought those maxims, and a body of those laws on which now stands our great and happy government. How could he yield to a petty ecclesiastical government? I am wholly unwilling to exchange them for anything less liberal, less benevolent, or less free. The church and kingdom Cowdery had once thrilled to had become a petty satrap. Cowdery's letter sounded incongruous in the context of a church trial, 
but it was only the opening round in a battle of republicanisms in 1838. Joseph thought Republican too. Shortly after arriving in Far West, he dictated the motto of the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints. Instead of sounding like scripture, the motto's first line was the constitution of our country formed by the Fathers of Liberty. Since the expulsion from Jackson County, Joseph had viewed the Constitution as a bulwark, though no authorities enforced its principles for the Mormons. His motto proclaimed, Woe, to tyrants, mobs, aristocracy, anarchy and Toryism, Republican words for the dark side, referring in one sweep to their enemies in Jackson, unsympathetic government officials, and the Kirtland dissenters. Exalt the standard of democracy. Down with it of priestcraft, and let all the people say Amen. He concluded the motto. The only scriptural note struck was a call for peace and good order in society love to God and good will to man. Danites, this republican language would be heard again in June 1838 after the Danites, or Daughters of Zion, were organized. In the impassioned accounts of Mormon crimes written in the aftermath of the Mormon War in 1838, the later conflict that resulted in expulsion of Mormons from Missouri, the Danites figured as an example of religious power run amok. The Danites were said to be a secret society, several hundred strong, organized in June 1838, to drive out dissenters, using violence if necessary. They ran into awful extremes, John Coryell later said, for it seemed that they felt justified, and thought it was the will of God to use any measures whatever, whether lawful or unlawful, to accomplish their end. The leader of the Danites, Sampson Avard, described them as a seditious government within the lawful government, supporting the charge of treason brought against Joseph after the Mormon War. In later court hearings, Joseph was held responsible for Danite excesses. Some historians depict the Danites as Joseph's private army, dispatched at his command to expunge enemies of the church. In contrast, many Mormons, both then and now, blame Avard for the Danites. Avard, an ambitious adventurer, it was said, formed a band of ruffians who harassed dissenters at his command rather than Joseph's. Unfortunately, the secrecy of the organization and the obscurity of the records hinder efforts to distribute blame between the two. Was a vengeful Joseph the inspiration for the Danites, or was the band the work of the unscrupulous Avard? The situation was further complicated by George Robinson, Sidney Rigdon's son-in-law and keeper of Joseph's journal. Being a Danite supporter, Robinson may exaggerate the first presidency's backing. He also depicts the presidency, not Joseph, as the effective governing body of the church. Smith recedes as a personality in Robinson's records, and the presidency as a group, with Rigdon as first counselor, appears to be in charge. In Robinson's record, Joseph goes along with Rigdon, rather than taking the lead making it difficult to determine the degree of Joseph's involvement. Resentment against dissenters was already boiling when Avard arrived in June. Coryell said that notwithstanding the dissenters had left the church, yet the old strife kept up. The Far West defectors, particularly Cowdery, the Whitmers, and Phelps, were accused of stealing and counterfeiting, and bringing vexatious lawsuits to collect debts and question land titles. Read Beck. A Mormon drawn unwillingly into the Danite movement and who left the church by the end of 1838, said a secret meeting held in mid-June was called by Demick Huntington and Jared Carter, not Avard, to decide how to expel the dissenters. Beck said someone proposed to kill these men that they would not be capable of injuring the church. Although none of the presidency attended the Danite organizational meeting, Beck assumed Joseph and Rigdon knew about it. Perhaps by coincidence, on June 17, the Sunday following the meeting, Rigdon preached a vitriolic sermon based on the theme of salt losing its savor and being cast out and trodden underfoot. Beck, who recorded the most incendiary passages, remembered Rigdon saying that they had a set of men among them that had dissented from the church and were doing all in their power to destroy the presidency laying plans to take their lives accused them of counterfeiting lying cheating and numerous other crimes and called on the people to rise in mass and rid the county of such a nuisance. According to Beck, Rigdon hinted at lynching. Joseph, a dim figure at the meeting, gave only a short speech. Beck thought the prophet sanctioned Rigdon's message but remembered Joseph adding, I don't want the brethren to act unlawfully a constant theme that year. Coriel accused Joseph and Rigdon of backing violent measures, but, according to Coriel's own account, they both denied it promptly. Soon after the sermon, 
83 prominent members in Far West, many of them probably Danites by then, signed an ultimatum demanding the departure of the offenders. The letter summarized the mounting complaints against Cowdery, John and David Whitmer, and Phelps. You have had the audacity, the letter concluded, to threaten us that, if we offered to disturb you, you would get up a mob from Clay and Ray counties. For the insult, if for nothing else, and for your threatening to shoot us if we offered to molest you, we will put you from the county of Caldwell, so help us God. Fearing for their property and perhaps their lives, the dissenters fled. A gleeful George Robinson noted in the Prophet's Journal that these men took warning, and soon they were seen bounding over the prairie like the scapegoat to carry off their own sins. When he formed the Danites, Avard was a relative newcomer. An immigrant physician from the Isle of Guernsey, he had preached for a time as a Campbellite minister in Pennsylvania before being baptized by Orson Pratt in 1835 and called to lead the local branch of the church. Avard moved to Kirtland in 1836, and a year later, for reasons unknown, had his license as a high priest revoked. Joseph's attorney later described Avard as a very eccentric genius, fluent, imaginative, sarcastic, and very quick in replying to questions. The Mormon historian B. H. Roberts thought that Avard had attempted to wrest control of the Canadian church from the hands of John Taylor, for which he earned a severe rebuke from Joseph. Cowdery wrote his brothers that Avard arrived some time since. He appears very friendly, but I look upon him with so much contempt that he will probably get but little from me. Although the Far West Mormons ousted the dissenters without Avard's provocation, he gave shape to their outrage. He formed the Far West activists into a society bound by oaths, backing one another to the death. Avard played upon the members' loyalty to Joseph Smith, putting them under oath to be completely submissive to the presidency. The reasoning, as John Corrill explained, was that as the presidency stood next to God, or between God and the Church, and was the oracle through which the word and will of God was communicated to the Church, they esteemed it very essential to have their word or the word of God through them, strictly adhered to. They therefore entered into a covenant, that the word of the presidency should be obeyed, and none should be suffered to raise his hand or voice against it. Beck later wrote that Avard insisted the people were bound to obey God's prophet in all things, and whatever he requires you shall perform being ready to give up life and property for the advancement of the cause. When anything is to be performed no member shall have the privilege of judging whether it would be right or wrong but shall engage in its accomplishment and trust God for the result. Beck, Corill, and a few others later said they objected to Avard's oaths, but could not extricate themselves. They kept quiet for fear they would be run out of town like other dissenters. Coral blamed the society's extremes on Avard, who was indefatigable in accomplishing their purposes, for he devoted his whole talents to it, and spared no pains, and, I thought, was as grand a villain as his wit and ability would admit of. Coral suspected that Avard spoke for Joseph and Rigdon, but admitted how much he was assisted by the presidency I know not. Beck. A Danite adjutant, said, Dr. Ravard, in speaking to the society, remarked, that it would be impossible for the presidency to explain the object of the society to every member, but that the presidency would explain their views or wishes to the head officers, and they to the members of the society. After a secret meeting, Coril approached Rigdon, and he told me I ought not to have anything to do with it, that they would do as they pleased. Yet later, the presidency blessed the officers at a meeting. Coril testified, there was at this meeting a ceremony of introducing the officers of the society to the presidency, who pronounced blessings on each of them, as introduced, exhorting to faithfulness in their calling, and they should have blessings. After this, President Smith got up and made general remarks, about, in substance, as follows, relating the oppressions the society had suffered, and they wanted to be prepared for further events but said he wished to do nothing unlawful, and, if the people would let him alone, they would preach the gospel and live in peace. Beck observed that Dr. Avard did not explain to the presidency what his teaching had been in the society. Coril remembered strong talk. Joseph said that if they came on us to molest us, we would establish our religion by the sword, and that he would become to this generation a second Muhammad. Although Avard may have concealed the Danite oaths, Joseph certainly favored evicting dissenters and resisting mobs. Coril and Beck used Republican language to combat the Danites. It was clearly evident to me, Coril wrote the next year, 
that the leaders of this faction intended to set up a monarchical government, in which the presidency should tyrannize and rule over all things. Those words made the authority of the prophet, otherwise considered a blessing to the saints, appear tyrannical. Once the language of the American Revolution snapped into place, the divine powers of the prophet became oppressive, and the issue became one of freedom rather than truth. When Joseph attempted to reinstitute the consecration of properties at Far West, Beck charged that no monarch on earth ever had supreme power over his subjects more than they over the inhabitants of Caldwell County. On the Sunday after the apostates were driven from Far West, Sidney Rigdon attempted to explain the treatment of the dissenters. He preached on the Republican basis of their expulsion, admitting that certain characters in the place had been crying you have broken the law, you have acted contrary to the principles of republicanism. In actuality, Rigdon claimed, the reverse was true, when a country, or body of people have individuals among them with whom they do not wish to associate and a public expression is taken against their remaining among them and such individuals do not remove it is the principle of republicanism itself that gives that community a right to expel them forcibly and no law will prevent it. That was sound reasoning in a nation that had driven out Tories during the revolution. But it was also the reasoning the mob used to justify expulsion of the Mormons from Jackson County. The clash between Mormonism and republicanism was brilliantly summed up in an exchange between John Corrill and Joseph Smith late in the summer. For some time, George Robinson noted, Corrill had been out of step with the great wheel which is propelled by the arm of the great Jehovah. To justify himself, Corrill insisted that he will not yield his judgment, to anything proposed by the church, or any individuals of the church, or even the voice of the great, I am, given through the appointed organ, as revelation, but it will always act upon his judgment. Corrill posed the question, must an individual sacrifice his autonomy to the revealed will of God, or should he decide for himself in all things? In Republican theory, the individual was supreme. In the kingdom of God, was an individual required to sacrifice that autonomy? According to Robinson, Corrill, who had accepted Joseph's revelations while sowing in the church, says he will always say what he pleases, for he says he is a Republican, and as such he will do, say, act, and believe what he pleases. To which Robinson added, let the reader mark such republicanism as this, that a man should oppose his own judgment to the judgment of God, and at the same time profess to believe in the same God. The question could not have been stated more forcefully. How could a believer in God put his own will and judgment up against the will and judgment of God? On the other hand, how could an independent republican yield his judgment to another man? even one speaking for God. The exchange laid bare the source of Mormonism's conflict with democratic society. Mormons believed they were building Zion according to God's commands, to apostates and outsiders they looked like mindless zealots obeying a tyrant. In 1838, the practical form of this question involved submission to law. The Missourians believed that Mormons thought Joseph's revelations put them beyond the law. Since the word of God outranked the law of the land, Mormons were suspected of breaking the law whenever the prophet required it. Joseph had indeed grown impatient with what he called vexatious lawsuits, and repeatedly said he would not submit to such harassment any longer. His April motto pronounced woe to those who invent or seek out unrighteous and vexatious lawsuits under the pretext or color of law or office, either religious or political. Corrill remembered Joseph saying that he had been before courts some twenty-odd times. They had never found anything against him, and that he would submit to it no longer. His feelings differed little from those of thousands of rural Americans who felt justice was defeated in the courts through the lawyer's devilish management of mysterious rules that the defendants could scarcely comprehend. But to worried observers, these impatient eruptions sounded ominous. When Rigdon proclaimed that he would not suffer people to come into their streets and abuse them, nor would they suffer vexatious lawsuits. It sounded like a scoff law policy. A lawless spirit ran through the Danite schemes, Beck thought. They consider themselves accountable only at the bar of God for their conduct, and consequently acknowledged no law superior to the word of the Lord through the prophet. In later court hearings, Rigdon's declaration that neither will we permit any man or set of men to institute vexatious lawsuits against us, to cheat us out of our just rights, if they do, will be unto them was interpreted as a fixed policy to flout the law, rather than a frustrated outburst from people harried endlessly in the courts. Through the summer, 
The Mormons were perplexed about how far to trust the law and when to take the law into their own hands. Behind Mormon actions during the Mormon War was the memory of Jackson County in 1833. None of the Jackson citizens' complaints against the Mormons had been brought to court. Missouri citizens had not trusted the law but treated the Mormons like wartime enemies expelling them without due process. The church had turned to the governor for redress and been told that, unlike the citizens who drove them out, the Mormons must rely on the courts. Individual Mormons must be taken to court and required by due process of law to compensate the Mormons for their depredations. Non-Mormon citizens could circumvent the law, Mormons could not. With the threat of mob attacks rising in the summer of 1838, the Mormons teetered on the boundary between law and war. They feared they would come under attack again, especially when the influx of Mormon immigrants made it impossible to restrict settlement to Caldwell County. The governor told them that neither the courts nor the state militia could give assistance to such a hated people. How should they react to an attack? Could they rely on the courts that had always failed them? Should they allow themselves to be forced out again as before? What should they do in the face of an aggressor who annoyed, harassed, and attacked. They had lived in the South long enough to know that Southern officials ignored the crimes of rioters. Judges and sheriffs closed their eyes to the crimes of the people. As one student of mobs has written, the more mob violence accelerated in deadliness in the South, the less likely authorities were to interfere, or if they did, they took the side of the mob. The free black who killed a deputy sheriff in a scuffle in Street Louis in 1836 had been burned alive while 2,000 people looked on. A city alderman declared he would shoot anyone who interfered, and no one did. Judge Luke Lawless discharged the perpetrators on the grounds that doing the popular will could never constitute a crime. In the South in 1835, 79 riots took place in which 63 people died, 7 or 8 by prolonged torture. In only four of the 79 cases was there even a hint of official interference or inquiry. The saints lived in a world where rioters acted with impunity. Aware of the realities, Joseph decided that the saints could not back down again. They could not allow themselves to be driven repeatedly from place to place. He endorsed the bellicose declaration of Sidney Rigdon at a celebration in Far West on July 4, 1838. The saints made a grand occasion of the holiday, parading around Far West raising a tall liberty pole, and conducting a ceremony at the temple site. Danite officers sat on the stand, alongside Caldwell County militia officers, a sign Joseph acknowledged the role of both in protecting the saints. Rigdon, the orator of the day, reminded the saints of their sufferings in this supposed land of liberty. Our cheeks have been given to the smiters, and our heads to those who have plucked off the hair. We have not only when smitten on one cheek turned the other, but we have done it again and again until we are wearied of being smitten, and tired of being trampled on. Now the time had come, Rigdon declared, from this day and this hour, we will suffer it no more. That mob that comes on us to disturb us, it shall be between us and them a war of extermination. We will never be the aggressors, we will infringe on the rights of no people, but shall stand for our own until death. The Mormon press printed Rigdon's talk, and Joseph urged the elders to get a copy underscoring the passage saying the saints would not be mobbed anymore without taking vengeance. Although possibly published as a warning, the heated language inflamed the Missourians. Corrill reported that there were one or two sentences to which considerable exception was taken by the people of other counties. Within the church, the militant elements took heart, believing the presidency was in their camp. John D. Lee, one of the Denite leaders, Later said the Davis County stake leaders organized the host of Israel into camps of hundreds, fifties, and tens that summer. Both sides were poised to react when the first event in the Mormon War occurred on August 6, 20, War, August to December 1838, I have received by Amos Reese Esquire, of Ray County and Wiley C. Williams Esquire, one of my aides, information of the most appalling character, which entirely changes the face of things and places the Mormons in the attitude of an open and avowed defiance of the laws, and of having made war upon the people of this state. Your orders are, therefore, to hasten your operations with all possible speed. The Mormons must be treated as enemies, and must be exterminated or driven from the state if necessary for the public peace. Lilburn W. Boggs to General. John B. Clark, October 27, 1838. 
Joseph's happy prospects had faded quickly in Far West, hope for the new land, its beauty, its expanse briefly invigorated him, and then the struggle with the dissenters, the Danites, and the growing animosity in Upper Missouri darkened the picture. As if borne down by troubles during the summer of 1838, he mysteriously recedes in the records. Sidney Rigdon preached the sermons. George Robinson's minutes credited the presidency with leading the church. Judging from the records, Joseph was uncustomary passive, leaving a power vacuum for Sidney Rigdon, Sampson Avard, and Lyman White to fill. Little direct evidence remains of Joseph's thoughts and feelings, little he did went on record. When war between the Mormons and Miss Orians broke out in the fall of 1838, Joseph remained in the background, more buffeted by events than directing their course. He favored resistance to the mobs, but others took the lead. The militants appear to have called the shots. When action was required, they headed the troops. Near the end, when the Mormons Missouri Zion was in tatters, Joseph emerged again as the central figure. By November 1838, an army of Missourians was camped before Far West ready to drive the Saints from the state. Joseph was the one to surrender and became at once the target of the state's prosecution. Gallatin, since politics usually underlay the conflicts between Mormons and their neighbors, it was fitting that an election ignited the clash in Missouri. As Mormon numbers increased, the non-Mormons watched local government fall into the hands of people they saw as deluded fanatics. A powerless minority of saints could be tolerated. A majority in control of elections could not. The Mormons constituted at least a third of the voters in Davis County in 1838, and more were coming. The Missourians wanted the Mormons out before the county was engulfed. William Peniston, a local Whig politician and colonel of the county militia, instigated the fight. He had asked for Mormon support in his candidacy for the state legislature and was disappointed when the Saints threw their support to the Democratic candidate on August 6. Election Day in Gillotin, the Davis County seat, Peniston's flaming speech, as John Corrill called it, incited the hundred or so old settlers at the polls to stop the Mormons from voting, even though no Mormon candidates were on the ballot. Responding to the call, the mostly southern locals tried to scare off the two or three dozen Mormon voters. One Missourian announced that Mormons should not vote no more than the Negroes. The Mormons refused to be intimidated and when one of them was challenged as he approached the polls, a fight began, after a few blows, a Mormon gave the Denite signal of distress, and others joined the fray. The combatants banged each other up with clubs and rocks, and then the Mormons withdrew. Rumors flew. Word reached far west of two or three murdered Mormons lying in the streets of Gillotin and the settlers threatening to take vengeance on the Davis Saints. A small party of volunteers, with Joseph among them, hurried to Adam on Diarman and more collected through the day. After learning that no Mormons had been killed, the group conferred about the next step. Coral thought the saints made a mistake at this point, instead of returning home again, as they ought to have done, they took a notion to make the citizens agree to live in peace, and not come out in mobs. The Mormons were most worried about Adam Black, a hostile justice of the peace. Knowing the Gallatin fight would eventually get into the courts, the Mormons wanted his assurance of impartiality. On August 8, a party of about 50 mounted Mormons led by Samson Avard called on Black and required him to sign an affidavit to deal even-handed justice. After objecting to the intimidation, he later called Avard a mean man. Black wrote a statement agreeing to support the constitutions of the state and of the United States, swearing he was not attached to any mob nor will not attach himself to any such people, and so long as they the Mormons will not molest me. I will not molest them. That evening a few of the cooler heads in Davis County called on the Mormons to calm their fears. The next day, the parties entered into a covenant of peace to preserve each other's rights and to allow offenders to be dealt with according to law and justice. Everyone knew that if justice broke down, war would come next. None of the accounts of the foray into Davis County put Joseph at the forefront of events. The horsemen from far west went under the command of militia officers and the Danite chief Avard with Joseph in the pack. Joseph later said that Samson Avard invited him to go along, he did not commission Avard to lead the party. Nor was Joseph among the number who first visited Adam Black. Joseph sat outside by a spring while the others talked. He was brought in only at the end of the judge's request. Black, however, held Joseph and Lyman White responsible when a few days later he brought a complaint to Austin King, the circuit judge in Richmond 
Ray County, naming Smith and White as heading the group that intimidated him into signing the statement. Joseph was thought to personify the Mormon's terrifying lawlessness. The officers who delivered the writ for his arrest on August 13 expected Joseph to resist. A man who spoke for God would naturally consider himself above the law. Joseph's refusal to be tried in Davis, where a fair judgment was impossible, started a rumor that he refused to submit to all legal processes. The bellicose whites comment that the law had never protected him and he owed them no obedience was thought to characterize all Mormons. The frightened Missourians could not believe that Joseph would submit once his safety was assured. An investigating committee from Chariton County, delegated to find out if intention was justified, found that both Joseph and White were willing to give themselves up to an officer, to administer law, but not willing to be taken by a mob who were threatening their lives daily. After the election fight on August 6, Nothing could halt the growing animosity. People all over the region were ready to take up arms. Peniston and Black solicited support from seven adjoining counties, many of which sent investigating committees. As far away as Jackson County, a meeting of citizens declared that they know the Mormons to be a set of fanatics and impostors and that they are a pest to the community at large. A committee from nearby Livingston County reported that men were collecting from 11 counties to take White and Smith. Robinson worried that this looks a little too much like mobocracy, it foretells some evil intentions, the whole upper Missouri is all in an uproar and confusion. Hoping for government protection, on September 2, the Mormons wrote to David Atchison, their Clay County friend and the elected commander of all troops in northeast Missouri, before their request for protection arrived. Atchison had been called out by the Adjutant General of the State Militia to quiet affairs in Davis County. Atchison reached far west on September 3 and persuaded Joseph to submit to a trial in Davis County. Atchison stationed a militia company on the border of Caldwell in case trouble arose. Under Atchison's protection, the Prophet and White appeared before Judge King on September 7 and were bound over on a $500 bond to appear at the next term of the Davis Circuit Court on November 29. His task completed, Atchison withdrew his forces, but a few days later, on September 10, Judge King ordered him back. Not satisfied with the court's decision, marauders continued to harass outlying Mormon farmers, using a rumor that the Mormons were in league with the Indians to justify the attacks. The threats grew so ominous that Joseph ordered all Mormon families in Davis into Adamondi Arman. Reed Beck felt that the Davis citizens, backed by small parties from other counties, were determined to rid the county of Mormons. At the same time, the Davis citizens, fearing reprisals, also abandoned their farms. When Atchison returned, the county appeared deserted. Alexander Donifan, a brigade commander under Atchison, arrived first. He found the Davis vigilante camp six miles south of Adamondi Armen, under the command of Dr. William W. Austin of Carroll County who had interrupted anti-Mormon action in his own county to rally to the support of Davis. Though they claimed to be acting in self-defense, Austin's company refused to disband at Donifan's request, though Donifan believed they would not attack while his force remained. In Adamondi Armen, White, who was preparing his forces for a siege, showed a similar reluctance, but eventually professed entire willingness to disband and surrender up to me every one of the Mormons accused of crime. Atchison doubted the peace would hold. From the state of feeling in the county of Davis and the adjoining counties, he wrote the governor on September 20, it is very much to be feared it will break out again, and if so, without the interposition of the commander-in-chief, the consequences will be awful. Calm prevailed for a moment. Whatever may have been the disposition of the people called Mormons, before our arrival here, General Hiram Parks wrote the governor, since we have made our appearance they have shown no disposition to resist the laws, or of hostile intentions. Atchison reported that there is no cause of alarm on account of the Mormons, they are not to be feared, they are very much alarmed. But appearances could be deceiving. Atchison understood the Mormon resolve not to be driven out again. If an attack is made upon the Mormons in Davis County, for the purpose of driving them from that county, it is very much to be feared that the Mormons, to a man, will assist the Mormons of that county. Through September, the Missouri officials tried to deal with the conflict through the judicial system, hoping to prevent war. Judge King insisted on bringing accused criminals to hearings before regularly constituted courts. Atchison and Donifan aided King in finding the accused, 
and the Mormons, trusting the two friendly generals, eventually cooperated. In late September, the action shifted south to Carroll County, where the Mormons had settled in DeWitt near the Missouri River. The Mormon presence had been opposed from the time the Saints moved there in July. The Missourians had supposed Mormons would confine themselves to Caldwell County and were dismayed to find them spilling over into Carroll. The question of Mormon immigration was put on the ballot at the August 6 election and only eight votes in the entire county were cast in favor of letting Mormons move in. From then on, the saints were bullied and threatened. In late August, vigilantes under William Austin gathered outside DeWitt in a quasi-siege. Austin's company had moved north in September when news of the Davis County struggle reached Carroll, and then returned late in the month after Atchison persuaded them to withdraw. Under Austin's leadership, the vigilantes once again deployed themselves outside DeWitt and on September 20 demanded that the Mormons leave. After talking to the vigilantes leader, an investigating committee of Missourians from Chariton County wrote back that to use the gentleman's language, they are waging a war of extermination, or to remove them from the said county. On October 1 Austin underscored his ultimatum by burning a house. On hearing the news, Joseph hurried to DeWitt to confer with the saints and the Mormons sent an appeal to the governor. The emissary reported that the governor told them to fight their own battles. Samuel Lucas, an old enemy of the Mormons, wrote the governor that a fight would obliterate the Mormons, it will create excitement in the whole upper Missouri, and those base and degraded beings will be exterminated from the face of the earth. If one of the citizens of Carroll should be killed, before five days I believe that there will be from four to five thousand volunteers in the field against the Mormons, and nothing but their blood will satisfy them. The Carroll citizens called upon other counties to send men to help expel these detestable fanatics. Hoping to restore order, Judge King ordered General Hiram Parks to the scene with the intention of dispersing the mob, but Parks's forces were badly outnumbered and untrustworthy. If he took any action to defend the Mormons, Parks believed his own troops would desert him, and anti-Mormon reinforcements would pour in from the surrounding counties. Nothing seems so much in demand here, to hear the Carroll County men talk, as Mormon scalps, as yet they are scarce. Seeing the hopelessness of the DeWitt Saints' plight, Colonel George Henkel, the Caldwell County militia officer in charge of the Mormon forces, realized he must surrender. Austin's men kept firing on the Saints, some were starving as a result of the siege. Others were losing cattle and having their houses burned. Finkel negotiated with the vigilantes to buy out Mormon property and let the saints depart. In mid-October, the DeWitt Mormons limped northward with a report that the mob was headed for Davis. Atchison told the governor that Austin's company pulled a cannon with them, and the same lawless game is to be played over, and the Mormons to be driven from that county and probably from Caldwell County. The expulsion from Carroll came as a shock. Joseph feared that the anticipated campaign to expel all Mormons was about to begin. In Davis, houses were being burned and cattle driven away. Previously, the Mormons had agreed to buy out the anti-Mormon citizens in Davis. The return of the vigilantes would stop the acquisitions and end the peace. General Parks, who had been on the scene in late September, believed that if the property exchange stopped, the determination of the Davis County men is to drive the Mormons with powder and lead. Three days after the DeWitt Saints arrived, Joseph rallied his forces in Caldwell. The Mormons heard reports of mobs converging from all points of the compass. At this point, rather than relying on Rigdon to speak for the church, Joseph himself stepped forward. Coryell said Joseph repeated the policy he had voiced for months. They, the church, had been driven from place to place, their property destroyed their rights as citizens taken from them, abuse upon abuse practiced upon them from time to time, they had sought for redress through the medium of the law, but never could get it, the state of Missouri refused to protect them in their rights, the executive had been petitioned many times, but never would do anything for them, while they were at DeWitt, the governor refused to do anything for them. Now the Mormons would take care of themselves. General Parks asked the Mormons why they had 500 men under arms. He was told they intended to defend that place, they had been driven from DeWitt and other places, and here they were determined to stand and die, rather than be driven from that place. Albert Rockwood's diary for October 15th reported, a meeting was called this day to make arrangements for the defense of the brethren in Davis Company. Our lives, honors and fortunes are pledged to defend the Constitution of the USA and our individual rights and our holy religion.
the strong bands of union appear to be wreathed around the heart of every man and woman, come life or come death come what will here we stand or here we die is the will of the Lord. Militant self-defense meant driving out mob members from Davis and confiscating their property. The Mormons, in short, were to wage war on their enemies, as the Missourians had waged war on them. As the legally organized militia in Caldwell, the Mormons had a right to mobilize in self-defense, but to carry operations into Davis, they needed authorization from Circuit Judge Austin King, and they only had a call out from a Caldwell County judge. The Mormons later claimed that General Parks advised them to defend themselves, but that was probably a rationalization after the fact. To maintain legal coloration, they marched under the command of the appointed Caldwell County militia officers. Joseph removed Avard from his command to enforce military order. The people in Far West were put under martial law. Those refusing to fight had to contribute supplies. Warren Foote, whose family had just arrived in Missouri, said Joseph was very plain and pointed in his remarks, and expressed a determination to put down the mob or die in the attempt. Those who were thought to be aiding the enemy were forbidden to depart. John Corrill, who believed the campaign would fail and wanted to escape, could find no way. Thomas Marsh and Orson Hyde fled in the night. Mormon strategy went beyond protection of their own people to attacking suspected mobs. Mormon militia were to confiscate the property of hostile Davis citizens and force them to move, thus destroying the vigilantes' home base. Enemies only were to be attacked. The confiscated property was to be deposited in the bishop's storehouse for the use of Mormons who had suffered losses in earlier battles. Coral knew the campaign was doomed. Mormon depredations would bring down Missourians from surrounding counties to crush the saints. Colonel Hinkle begged Joseph to halt his disastrous course, but he pressed on, perhaps thinking the God of Israel would come to their rescue. He talked of the stone in Daniel's prophecy rolling forth to crush all other kingdoms. The Bible offered countless passages to prove that God would give his people victory. General Acheson reported after the Mormon raids on Davis that it seems that the Mormons have become desperate, and act like madmen. The Mormon forces from far west marched to Adam on the Armen on Tuesday, October 16. An unseasonal storm on Wednesday dropped six inches of snow, and the army threw snowballs at one another. On Thursday, October 18, war parties were dispatched to Gillotin, Millport, and Splorn's Ridge in Gillotin. The company under David Patton removed the goods from Stolling's store, and the building was burned. A tailor's shop received similar treatment. Elsewhere around 50 buildings were burned. Within four days, Joseph's uncle John Smith reported that we have driven most of the enemy out of the company. The Mormons claimed the action was entirely defensive and not as violent as rumored. They said the Missourians torched their own buildings and blamed the Mormons. They had recourse to this stratagem. Hiram Smith later swore in an affidavit, to set their houses on fire, and send runners into all the counties adjacent to declare to the people that the Mormons had burned up their houses and destroyed their fields. The day after the raid on Millport, James Turner, a Missourian, came upon a small group of horsemen looking at a burning building in the town. I went up to Millport in company with young Mr. Morin, directly after our arrival, I saw Joseph Smith, Jr., Hiram Smith. Lyman White and two others, ride up. Mr. Cobb, the male rider, and several of the Blackleys, came up also. Cobb observed, see what the damned Mormons have done. Speaking of the burning, Hiram Smith asked how he knew it was the Mormons. He said they had burnt Gillotin. Some of the Mormons replied, that Gillotin was burned by the mob from Platt. Uncertainty about the identity of culprits continued into the trial of the Mormons accused of depredations. The prosecutors at the court hearing following the conflict could not produce a single eyewitness to Mormons burning houses. But some Mormon burnings likely did occur. William W. Phelps overheard an agreement between Joseph and White to burn buildings, and Parley Pratt, one of the company leaders, acknowledged. It is said that some of our troops, exasperated to the highest degree, retaliated in some instances by plundering and burning houses, and bringing the spoil to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, whose provisions and clothing had been robbed from them, and upon the whole I am rather inclined to believe it was the case, for human nature cannot endure all things. The church's representative at the U.S. Senate hearings a few years later admitted that small parties on both sides were on the alert and probably done some damages. Many witnessed Mormon forces raiding enemy supplies for the bishop's storehouse in Adam on Armen, 
in retaliation for the previous destruction of Mormon property. The week after the Mormon raids, Davis County was a battle zone. Mormon families were driven from their farms by retaliating citizens, and Lyman White and others continued to plunder non-Mormon houses. White, whom General Acheson had earlier characterized as a bold, brave, skillful, and, I may add, a desperate man, had been hungering for war since Zion's camp. He is reputed to have said that the Mormons would soon be knocking at the gates of Street Louis, as if the armies of Israel were destined to conquer the whole country. John D. Lee later said Davis fell into chaos for a week, the burning of houses, farms, and stacks of grain was generally indulged in by each party. Lawlessness prevailed, and pillage was the rule. In a subsequent encounter, a band of Mormons, hearing of the Cannon Carroll County vigilantes were hauling to Davis, surprised them in their encampment. The field piece had been buried in a road, but a routing hog uncovered a portion of the ordnance, and the Mormons dug it up. A few days later, on October 24, the Mormons learned of a group of armed men approaching in a threatening posture. They actually were a contingent of the Richmond County militia under Samuel Bogart but they looked like a mob on the prowl. The misapprehension proved to be a serious mistake. David Patton was sent out to drive them back, and as they approached the Missourian encampment on Crooked River in Ray County, the two groups exchanged fire. Patton was mortally wounded, as were two other Mormons, and a Missourian died in the fight. The skirmish at Crooked River led to the charge of treason against Joseph Smith and the Mormon leaders. Resisting a band of vigilantes was justifiable but attacking a militia company was resistance to the state. Joseph disappeared from view during the military action. He had emerged to encourage Mormon forces on their departure for Davis, and he and Hiram had accompanied the troops to Adamondi Armen, leaving Rigdon in Far West. But Joseph did not command troops or bear arms. A hostile witness at Joseph's hearing said that it was not usual for any of the presidency, composed of President Smith and his counselors to take arms and go into the ranks. Joseph was said to have gone with Patton's company to Gallatin on October 18, but in the reports he is assigned no role and his location during the raids is unknown. The affidavits describing the Mormon attacks said nothing about him on the field of battle. The military bands were led by Patton, White, and Seymour Brunson. In Joseph's own account of events, he sympathized with his suffering followers. My feelings were such as I cannot describe when I saw them flock into the village almost entirely destitute of clothes, and only escaping with their lives. Albert Rockwood, a militant eyewitness, thought the Mormon action a success. He noted on October 23, a week after the Mormon troops left far west for Davis, that the mob have been dispersed by the brethren nor have they had any assistance from the militia, neither do we desire any. He did not know that reports of the Mormon raids had already reached the governor. William Peniston, the Mormon's old Davis enemy, was the first to write about the plundering and the burned houses. These facts are made known to you, sir, hoping that your authority will be used to stop the course of this banditti of Canadian refugees, and restore us to our lost homes. From October 21st to October 24th more than a dozen affidavits and reports by military and civil officials poured in, many of them addressed to Boggs in Jefferson City. General Acheson warned the governor that the conflict was beyond the scope of the law. The great difficulty in settling this matter, Acheson wrote on October 22, seems to be in not being able to identify the offenders. Without specific culprits on either side, no prosecutions could take place. Yet the citizens demanded action. I am convinced that nothing short of driving the Mormons from Davis County will satisfy the parties opposed to them, and this I have not the power to do, as I conceive. Legally, I do not feel disposed to disgrace myself, or permit the troops under my command to disgrace the state and themselves by acting the part of a mob. If the Mormons are to be driven from their homes, let it be done without any color of law, and in open defiance thereof, let it be done by volunteers acting upon their own responsibilities. By this time, the governor was not listening to Acheson. Peniston had warned Boggs that people were accusing the general of political juggling in hopes of getting the Mormon vote. Acheson was relieved of his command, and Boggs took action contrary to his general's advice. On October 27, the governor wrote General John B. Clark, Acheson's replacement, that events of the most appalling character entirely changed the face of things. The Mormons were in the attitude of an open and avowed defiance of the laws and of having made war upon the people of this state. Your orders are, therefore, 
to hasten your operations with all possible speed, Boggs declared. The Mormons must be treated as enemies, and must be exterminated or driven from the state if necessary for the public peace. Their outrages are beyond all description. When the Mormons were expelled from Jackson County in 1833, Boggs the husband of Daniel Boone's granddaughter, has been lieutenant governor and a leading merchant in the county. Though not involved in the mobs himself, he had not defended the Mormons either. Elected governor in 1836, he promoted internal improvements and founded a state bank. In 1838, having observed firsthand the turmoil the Mormons caused, Boggs saw expulsion as a solution to an old problem as well as a response to the immediate emergency. However he felt personally about the Mormons, Boggs could not resist the popular will. He was caught in the predicament that Alexis de Trocqueville perceived as the classic dilemma of democratic society, the majority ruled even when it trampled the rights of a minority. No agency of government could stand against overwhelming popular opinion. As Trocqueville could have predicted, the Mormons had no redress, no matter how grievous the crimes against them. Northern Missouri citizens were fixed on expulsion before the governor gave them legal support. On October 30th, a party of Missourians, still unaware of Boggs's order to Clark, attacked a small settlement of Saints at Horns Mill 15 miles east of Far West. The commander later claimed they were fired upon, but the Mormons were totally unprepared. The attackers killed everyone who could not get away, including children leaving 17 dead. The conflict had gone beyond threats, whippings, plundering, and burning. Now children's blood had been shed. At a hearing before Judge King in Richmond, a military officer estimated that the whole number of the Mormons killed through the whole difficulty, as far as I can ascertain, are about 40, and several wounded. There has been one citizen killed, and about 15 badly wounded. Surrender. The war rapidly concluded after the Horns Mill Massacre, on October 30th. Joseph Smith found an army of Missouri militia men drawn up a mile and a half south of Far West, temporarily under the command of Samuel Lucas of Jackson County, the ranking officer until General Clark arrived. Joseph spoke bravely of taking a stand, but when he got news of the Horns Mill attack, he foresaw the same fate for Far West and Adamondi Armin. John Correll, Reed Beck, and George Hinkle from the Mormon side entered into negotiations with Alexander Donifan acting for Lucas. Both Beck and Coril claimed Joseph was eager to sue for peace. Coril said he was told to beg like a dog for peace, and afterwards Joseph said he would rather go to state's prison for twenty years, or would rather die himself than have the people exterminated. On October 31st, Lucas presented terms to Hinkle and required him to bring Joseph and other key leaders into the Missourian camp. Failing that, Lucas threatened to reduce Far West to ashes. As legal support for the threat, he showed the Mormons the governor's order. Lucas gave them an hour to decide and prepared his 2,500 men for battle. Seeing the Missouri forces approaching, the Far West leaders hurriedly complied. Near sunset, Joseph and four others walked the 600 yards between the Mormon lines and the advancing militia and put themselves into the hands of their enemies. Joseph thought he went to negotiate, as the head of the opposing forces, but Lucas wanted prisoners charged with crimes against the state. He had told Hinkle that Joseph would be taken captive if the peace terms were accepted, if they were turned down, he would be returned to Far West and the Mormons would take the consequences. Instead of negotiating, as he should have since the terms were not yet accepted, Lucas dealt with Joseph like a prisoner of war. A guard of fifty men escorted the Mormons through lines of jeering soldiers, who were delighted to have captured the infamous prophet. As Joseph said, instead of being treated with that respect which is due from one citizen to another, we were taken as prisoners of war, and were treated with the utmost contempt. Parley Pratt said that these all set up a constant yell, like so many bloodhounds let loose upon their prey. A Missourian later remembered the five Mormons were about as badly scared set as I ever saw, save for Lyman White, who stood like a lion. Without a sign of fear about him. That night Joseph slept in the rain on the ground, surrounded by an armed guard. That was far from what he expected, and he ever after thought that Hinkle had betrayed him. Seeing no alternative, 
Joseph acceded to Lucas's terms, the Mormons were to give up their arms and leave the state. Those accused of crimes were to be surrendered and tried. Mormon property in Missouri was to be confiscated to reimburse the Davis citizens whose houses had been burned. The Mormons were to give up everything except their lives. Hinkle thought the demands beyond reason and wanted to seek better. He argued they were being asked to give up their most sacred rights as citizens of a Republican state. Joseph with little faith in Republican rights, sent word to comply anyway, with 2,500 Missouri militiamen camped outside of Far West, he had no stomach for battle, the Mormons were to give up their Zion, Lucas, the Saints old Jackson County enemy, seeking drumhead justice, held a court-martial the night of Joseph's capture, Joseph was convicted of treason against the state with no opportunity to defend himself, and with the other prisoners, he was sentenced to be executed the next morning. Lucas was halted in this illegal action. Joseph was not a militia member and thus was not subject to court martial, only by the refusal of the saint's friend Donifan to carry out the execution order. Donifan would not even execute the four prisoners who were militia and subject to a military court. On November 1st, Far West surrendered. The soldiers searched the city for firearms, threatening and ridiculing the saints. A few days later, a force dispatched to Adamondiaman accepted the surrender of the Mormon leaders, who followed Joseph's instructions not to resist. The Mormon men came one by one to a table where they signed away their property to the state of Missouri while militia men stood by and struck anyone who protested. By this time the Mormons were willing to go. Marauders were attacking outlying farms, molesting women, whipping men and killing animals. Rockwood reported that orders from the governor to exterminate the Mormons, the brethren I hunted as wild game and shot down, several have been shot in sight of the city, women are ravished and houses rifled, one woman has been killed within less than two miles of this city, we are here as captives strictly guarded by the militia no person is allowed to go out of the city. The militia made no effort to protect the Mormons. Judge King told the Mormons to bring charges in court returning now to law as the suitable recourse for offended parties and overlooking the governor's declaration of war. Despite the coming winter, the saints had no desire to remain in Missouri. Captives, Lucas brought Joseph and the other prisoners, Sidney Rigdon, Lyman White, Parley Pratt, Amasa Lyman, Hiram Smith, and George Robinson into Far West to let them pick up clothes and supplies for their imprisonment. Guards accompanied each prisoner to his house and stood by while goodbyes were said. Emma and the children clung to Joseph and cried. A guard pushed Joseph's son aside with a sword, saying, God damn you, get away you little rascal or I will run you through. Then the men were loaded on a wagon and hurried off to Independence accompanied by 300 men commanded by Brigadier General Moses Wilson. Lucas wanted the prisoners out of reach of the Mormon forces. In Independence, the prisoners received good treatment. Joseph wrote Emma on November 4, two days after their separation, saying that we have been protected by the Jackson County boys, in the most genteel manner instead of going to gold jail we have a good house provided for us and the kindest treatment. Any form of respect won his goodwill. Warmed by his captors' kindness, Joseph did not condemn them, but he was uncertain about his own fate. What God may do for us I do not know but I hope for the best always in all circumstances although I go unto death. To Emma, he wrote, I have great anxiety about you, and my lovely children, my heart mourns and bleeds for the brother, and sisters, and for the slain of the people of God. He needed his family's support. Those little children are subjects of my meditation continually, tell them that Father is yet alive, God grant that he may see them again. O Emma for God's sake do not forsake me nor the truth but remember me, if I do not meet you again in this life may God grant that we may meet in heaven, I cannot express my feelings, my heart is full, farewell O my kind and affectionate Emma, I am yours forever your husband and true friend. The prisoners remained in independence for only four days. When General John B. Clark took command from Lucas, he immediately returned the prisoners to Richmond in Ray County, where the court of inquiry would be held. Clark mistrusted Lucas's motives in carrying the Mormons to his home county and wanted the prisoners in Richmond before the judge with the right jurisdiction. On the morning of the inquiry, Joseph was still in a hopeful mood. He wrote to Emma that the prisoners were chained together in two-foot intervals. Brother Robeson is chained next to me. He has a true heart and a firm mind. Brother White is next. B.R. Rigdon next. Hiram next. 
Pali next to Masa next, and thus we are bound together in chains as well as the cords of everlasting love, we are in good spirits and rejoice that we are counted worthy to be persecuted for Christ's sake. He was sure he would be acquitted and return to his family. There is no possible danger but what we shall be set at liberty if justice can be done. Mainly he wanted once more to convey his love for his wife and children, O oh my affectionate Emma, I want you to remember that I am a true and faithful friend, to you and the children, forever, my heart is entwined round yours forever and ever, O oh may God bless you all Amen I am your husband and am in bands and tribulation. The inquiry before Judge Austin King of the Fifth Circuit Court in Richmond ran from November 12th to 28th. The nearly 50 prisoners were accused of participating in the raids on Davis County or the attack on Samuel Bogut and the Richmond County Militia at Crooked River. For two weeks, the court heard testimony from over 40 witnesses blaming Joseph for instigating the Mormon raids and setting up the Danites as a secret government. The majority of the state witnesses were or had been Mormons. Joseph sold allies Thomas Marsh, Orson Hyde, and John Whitmer spoke against him along with the negotiators he had trusted, George Henkel, John Corrill, and Reed Beck. Sampson Avard said the Denite Society was all Joseph's doing. Only seven Mormons testified or submitted affidavits on behalf of the defendants, most of them for Lyman White. Mormon witnesses were likely to be arrested themselves if they tried to testify. One Mormon, Ebenezer Robinson, who wrote after his disaffection from the church, said that the trial was a one-sided ex-party affair. As our witnesses were treated so badly, and intimidated to such an extent it was considered useless to attempt to make an extended defense. Their attorneys advised the Mormons to hold back their witnesses until the actual trial. Producing them now would allow Bogart to drive them out of the state. The testimony put Joseph squarely at the center of a plot to erect an independent government that planned to wage war on the state of Missouri. Outside the courtroom. A hostile crowd muttered threats and intimidated the witnesses. At the end, the court found probable cause to charge Joseph and five others with overt acts of treason. Another five, including Parley Pratt, were charged with murder because a Missourian was killed at Crooked River. The rest of the accused Mormons were dismissed. Outraged. The prisoners complained bitterly to one another, save for Joseph who was silenced by a toothache and pain in his face. Because the Richmond jail was crowded, on December 1st the group charged with treason were sent chained and handcuffed to Liberty, the Clay County seat. Two weeks later, Joseph wrote a long letter to the church from Liberty Jail. By then he was fuming. Brief criticism of Hinkle and Corrill in the November 12th letter expanded into pages of outrage. Joseph was angrier with the dissenters who turned on him at the trial than with the militia mob. He ransacked the scriptures for precedence. He cited Herman, who sought the life of Mordecai and the Jews. Those who have sought by their unbelief and wickedness and by the principle of mobocracy to destroy us and the people of God like Herman shall be hanged upon their own gallows. These men like Balaam being greedy for a reward sold us into the hands of those who loved them. We classify them with the company of Korah and Dathan and Abiram. In a more secular vein, he called them ill-bred and ignorant so very ignorant that they cannot appear respectable in any decent and civilized society. In the end, Joseph delivered the traitors unto the buffetings of Satan until the day of redemption that they may be dealt with according to their works. Joseph denied wrongdoing in Davis County. He was innocent, he said, and only the testimony of traitors had prevented his acquittal. The Moors had conspired to plunder to starve and to exterminate and burn the houses of the Mormons. These are the characters that by their treasonable and overt acts have desolated and laid waste Davis County. The one Missourian death, at the Battle of Crooked River in Ray County, he said resulted from the Mormons' defense against an enemy that sprang wolf-like on the Mormons and then retreated into the brambles. The accusers, Joseph insisted, represent us falsely, we say unto you that we have not committed treason, nor any other unlawful act in Davis County. He showed no regret for mistaken policies or any sense that the church had erred. He was outraged and innocent. The letter urged the brethren to be not afraid of your adversaries. Contend earnestly against mobs and the unlawful works of dissenters and of darkness. Go far from breaking his spirit, 
Defeat and imprisonment made him bolder. Reprise. How responsible was Joseph for the debacle in Missouri? The December letter helps answer the question by shedding light on his attitudes toward the saints' enemies in the preceding months when the spotry diaries reveal so little. The letter gives clear evidence of Joseph's willingness to do battle against the attacking Missourians and of his impatience with dissenters among the saints. The letter leaves little doubt that he would have favored the expulsion of Cowdery, Phelps, and Whitmer in June when the leading brethren in Far West signed the ultimatum. One can also picture him rousing the Mormon militia to defend themselves against the invading mob in October. Go tell the army to retreat in five minutes or we'll give them hell, he later recounted. When he was insulted, betrayed, or attacked, anger poured from his heart. On the other hand, the letter is a rhetorical flourish not one advocating offensive action. The dissenters are left in the hands of God. No actual revenge or sabotage is advocated. When it came to violence, Joseph was a man of words. In 1834, he had mobilized an army to march on Jackson County, but stopped short of an attack. Four years later, he urged the defense of Davis, but did not carry a gun in the Mormon raids. How aggressively he wanted his troops to act at Gillotin and Millport is unclear. He certainly wanted Mormon enemies removed, but would he have fought to remove them or burn their houses? He believed his people could rightfully confiscate property and compensation for their own losses to the Missourians but no more. He is not known to have ordered any greater violence, as the December letter said. He believed the Missourians burned their own houses and blamed it on the Mormons. His military instincts were defensive. When it was time to attack, he pulled back. As the militia approached far west on October 30th, he talked militantly, but recommended surrender. Any Mormon aggression beyond these limits probably occurred without his authorization. Whether Joseph Smith was guilty of treason in 1838 remains moot. He was no more guilty than the mobs that had driven the Mormons out of Jackson and DeWitt. Joseph thought the saints acted only in self-defense. Was there no legal justification for resisting attacks when the government refused to help? The editor of the street, Louis Republican offered a judgment on the Missouri conflict, it does not appear, from anything which I have seen, having the semblance of truth, that the Mormons offered any resistance to the properly constituted authorities of the county, civil and military. They did desire to protect themselves, their families and their property, from the licentiousness of a mob, and they did, furthermore, retaliate upon some portion of that mob, for burning Mormon houses and Mormon property in one county, by doing a similar act of injustice in another. But Squire Black, and those who acted with him, in retailing the enormities of the Mormons to the governor, singularly enough, forgot to mention that their patriotic band had been before them in scattering their firebrands. Yet Joseph must take responsibility for the Mormon raids on their Davis County enemies. His angry rhetoric stirred the blood of more militant men. After the Davis raids, Rockwood wrote his father that the prophet has unsheathed his sword and in the name of Jesus declares that it shall not be sheathed again until he can go unto any county or state in safety and in peace. Words like that licensed Lyman White's desperate plans. Joseph's approval of Rigdon's salt sermon with its strong threats against dissenters had justified the Danites' expulsion of the Whitmers, Cowdery, and Phelps. Later Joseph repudiated the Danites, speaking of many false and pernicious things which were calculated to lead the saints far astray, wrongly taught by Dr. Avard as coming from the presidency. Had the presidency known of these corruptions, Joseph insisted, they would have spurned them and their authors from them as they would the gates of hell. But by giving them places of honor at the July 4th celebration, he acknowledged their legitimacy. Joseph had enough power to be a target for an ambitious character like Cavard who recognized that loyalty to the prophet was an asset. Joseph's hold on the saints could be turned to advantage by making that loyalty the basis of a private militia under Avard's control. He won support by purporting to represent the prophet and making submission to Joseph the heart of the Danite pledge. Considering that Avard was the chief witness for the prosecution at the Mormon hearing, he appears to have acted with consummate cynicism. After he was cut off from the church the following March, he gave no signs of ever having sincerely believed. He was astute enough to recognize Joseph's influence and to use it for his own ends. We cannot tell how clearly Joseph understood that power had slipped from his hands in that year. In retrospect, it seems possible that White and other militants took the prophet's call for self-defense to extremes Joseph would not have approved. With only partial backing from Joseph, 
Avard organized the Denite band in the form Joseph later denounced as a combination of frauds and secret abominations. He may not have understood his error in 1838, but later, in Nauvoo, he kept control of the key institutions. He served as mayor and took command of the Nauvoo Legion. Under his direction, the Legion restricted itself to parades, ceremonies, maneuvers, and speeches. No engagements ever occurred. No Lyman White was permitted to take the saints into battle. Whatever Joseph learned in 1838, the need for restraint was not the lesson all Mormons took from the Missouri conflicts. The war scarred the men who had battled with mobs and militia. Many left Missouri defeated and embittered. Alonson Ripley told Joseph that when I reflect upon the cause of your afflictions it is like fire in my bones, and burns against your enemies. To the bare hilt those who were butchered at Horn's Milkrieth for vengeance I from this day declare myself the avenger of the blood of those innocent men, and the innocent cause of Zion. Ripley was ready to strike if attacked again. For half a century, the war poisoned Mormon memory. 21, Imprisonment, January to August 1839, Your humble servant Joseph Smith Jr. Prisoner for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the saints taken and held by the power of mobocracy under the exterminating reign of His Excellency the Governor Lilburn W. Boggs. For as much as we know that the most of you are well acquainted with the wrongs and the high-toned injustice and cruelty that is practiced upon us whereas we have been taken prisoners charged falsely with every kind of evil and thrown into prison enclosed with strong walls surrounded with a strong guard who continually watch day and night as indefatigable as the devil is in tempting and laying snares for the people of God. Therefore dearly and beloved brethren we are the more ready and willing to lay claim to your fellowship and love. Joseph Smith and others to the church, March 20, 1839 Emma visited Joseph in Liberty Jail three times before she left Far West in mid-February 1839. In early December, she had traveled the 40 miles to Liberty with six-year-old Joseph III and Feb Rigdon, Sidney's wife, and their son Wycliffe. The women found their husbands locked in the frigid, smelly cellar of a tiny jailhouse, suffering from bad food and poor ventilation. Within three weeks, Emma returned with the wives of two other prisoners. Joseph asked for quilts, which Emma lacked herself but got from a neighbor. In January, she again returned to Liberty with Mary Fielding Smith, Hiram's wife, and Mary's sister Mercy. The visitors and prisoners sang and prayed through the night, and Joseph blessed Joseph III. Joseph dispatched counsel to his flock whenever he could. Brethren fear not but be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The first presidency wrote from Liberty in early January. Neither think strange concerning the fur tree trials with which we are tried as though some strange thing had happened unto us. Remember that all have been partakers of like afflictions. Therefore rejoice in our afflictions by which we are perfected and through which the captain of our salvation was perfected also. Joseph's system of government by councils proved its worth in his absence. All through December. The High Council with Brigham Young presiding met to strengthen one another and fill vacancies. In January, Joseph told Young and Heber Kimball, the senior apostles after the death of David Patton and the defection of Thomas Marsh, the twelve were to manage the church, and with council support, Young supervised the Caldwell Exodus. Joseph also instructed Young and Kimball not to leave the state themselves. He felt bound by a revelation requiring the Twelve to plant a cornerstone for the Far West Temple on April 26, before departing for Britain. He was less exacting about the gathering, as there was no place to go. English converts could stay in England for the time being or migrate to the United States. America will be a Zion to all that choose to come to it, he said, meaning that. For the moment, all the continent was secure against coming calamities. A few months later, he shrank the gathering to places of refuge and safety that God shall open unto them between Kirtland and Far West. Meanwhile, the missionary work was to speed forward. The conversion of the world need not stop, but under wise management can go on more rapidly than ever. Joseph worried about his upcoming trial. Although he spoke confidently of acquittal, his life was at stake. If convicted of treason, he would be executed, and the likelihood of exoneration was slight. On January 24, the Mormon prisoners petitioned the state legislature for a change of venue and a new trial judge. No county would be sympathetic, but a fair trial in Upper Missouri was impossible. Judge King, who would likely preside, had already publicly pronounced the defendants guilty. Hoping for some relief, 
The prisoners requested that their case be heard on a plea of habeas corpus. The Clay County judge refused the pleas of all but the ailing Sidney Rigdon, who spoke for himself from a cot. Winning over the court with his eloquence, he was released on bail on January 25. He stole away at night ten days later, fearing the Missourians would kill him if he were caught. In March, Joseph again appealed for a writ of habeas corpus, this time to the Missouri Supreme Court. He complained that he had been held nearly five months, at times in chains, without justification. Joseph denied wrongdoing. The supposedly treasonous statements attributed to him were false, he did not promulgate such ridiculous and absurd sentiments. Witnesses who heard his speeches would support his claims if allowed to testify. Furthermore, Joseph said, he had nothing to do with burning in Davis County, that the prisoner made public proclamation against such things, that the prisoner did oppose Dr. Revard and George M. Hinkle against the vile measures with the mob, but it was threatened by them if he did not let them alone. The statement tacitly acknowledged the struggle for control in the Mormon camp. In the heat of battle, hawks like Havard and White had taken command and perpetrated vile measures against Joseph's wishes. None of the petitions brought results. By mid-March, Joseph had lost faith in his lawyers, who, he believed, had not petitioned vigorously enough. Fearing a fair trial was impossible and a lynching likely if they were acquitted, the prisoners attempted to escape as though prisoners of war. They bored holes in the foot-thick oak walls until the auger handles gave out. A friend unwittingly dropped a hint that aroused suspicion, and they were discovered while working on the outer stone walls. From then on, every visitor was searched for escape tools and kept from talking alone with the prisoners. The six men, Joseph, Hiram, White, Caleb Baldwin, Sidney Rigdon, until his release in late January, and the six-foot-six six Alexander McRae, were confined in a room about 14 by 14 feet in a small rock building with walls four feet thick. The lower floor, where the prisoners were housed most of the time, had two small grated iron windows and a trap door to the floor above. The men slept on dirty straw on an earthen floor. McRae remembered food so filthy that we could not eat it until we were driven to it by hunger. When they fell to vomiting after a meal, Hiram suspected poison. After the attack, he said, we would lie some two or three days in a torpid, stupid state, not even caring or wishing for life. Joseph said only that the food was scant, uniform, and coarse. Outside the windows, curiosity seekers jeered them. Hiram said that we are often inspected by fools who act as though we were elephants or dromedaries or sea hogs or some monstrous whale or sea serpents. The guards were worse than the curious. The prison was a hell, Hiram wrote Edward Partridge surrounded with demons if not those who are damned. Dot. Where we are compelled to hear nothing but blasphemous oaths and witness a sin of blasphemy and drunkenness and hypocrisy and debaucheries of every description. Earlier, at the Richmond jail, the guards, whom Parley Pratt described as a noisy, foul-mouthed, vulgar, disgraceful rabble, had boasted in the prisoners hearing of defiling Mormon women. They went on for hours with obscene jests, dreadful blasphemies, and filthy language. Finally after midnight, his patience exhausted, Joseph rose and thundered at them to be silent, or either they or he would die that instant. According to Pratt, the rebuke quieted the guards. Writing years later, Pratt remembered the majesty of the prophet standing in his chains in a dungeon. By late March, Joseph wrote Emma that my nerve trembles from long confinement, making it impossible to write with a steady hand. He asked her not to think I am babyish for I bear with fortitude all my oppression. And the same for the others, not one of us have flinched yet. Prison letters, with Joseph confined, the saints moved east to Illinois and eastern Iowa. Generals Clark and Lucas had given them permission to stay in Caldwell County until spring if they planted no crops, but roaming vigilantes forced most of the saints to depart in midwinter. Bishop Partridge thought each family should manage its own escape. Brigham Young decided the families should cooperate. Young's committee resolved to stand by and assist each other to the utmost of our ability in removing from this state. By pooling their property, the saints could help all the worthy poor until there shall not be one left in the county who have a desire to remove. With no agreed upon destination, the saints ended up scattered along the Mississippi River from Cokeuk, Iowa, to Quincy, Illinois. The largest group accumulated in Quincy, the largest town along that stretch of river. Emma was housed with Judge Cleveland just outside of Quincy, 
Brigham Young's family was nearby. Joseph followed the saints in his mind as they struggled east to Illinois. My heart bleeds continually when I contemplate the distress of the church so that I could be with them I would not shrink at toil and hardship to render them comfort and consolation. A packet of messages from Quincy arrived on March 19, one from Emma and another from Joseph's brother Don Carlos, who wrote that all the Smiths had made it to Illinois. Bishop Partridge reported kind treatment by the Illinois people. The next day Joseph wrote a lengthy reply, unburdening his feelings in an effusion of instruction, reflection, and emotion. In a single day, he dictated a letter to fellow prisoner Alexander McRae that comes to 16 printed pages. All five prisoners signed the letter, but Joseph's mind and heart were on the pages. The words came rapidly from his lips without calculated organization. No paragraphs break up the flow, sentences merge frequent misplaced and the misspelled words show the rush in which the dictation was scribbled down. Yet parts of the letter rose to a level that merited later canonization in the doctrine and governance. Joseph's wrath spilled onto the first few pages. He could not forget the blasphemy and drunkenness and hypocrisy and debaucheries of every description, nor the cries of orphans and widows. The blood of innocent women and children now stains the soil of Missouri, but oh! The unrelenting hand the inhumanity and murderous disposition of this people it shocks all nature it beggars and defies all description. It is a tale of woe a lamentable tale yea a sorrowful tale too much to tell too much for contemplation too much to think of for a moment. He prayed God to avenge the sufferings of the powerless, in the fury of thine heart with thy sword avenge us of our wrongs remember thy suffering saints so our God and thy servants will rejoice in thy name forever. Then. After calling down the curses of heaven on his enemies, he spoke with equal passion of how sweet the voice of a friend. The fierceness of a tiger and the vivacity of lightning receded from his mind, he said, until finally all enmity malice and hatred and past differences misunderstandings and mismanagements be slain victims at the feet of hope. Despite mistreatment by the governor, courts, and militia, Joseph did not become cynical about government. The March 20th letter shows him moving toward greater political involvement. He saw more clearly than ever that constitutional rights were the saints' best and perhaps only defense. The beauty of the United States Constitution was that it guarantees to all parties sects and denominations and classes of religion equal and coherent and indefeasible right. Hence we say that the Constitution of the United States is a glorious standard it is founded in the wisdom of God it is a heavenly banner it is to all those who are privileged with the sweats of its liberty like the cooling shades and refreshing waters of a greater rock in a thirsty and weary land. True, the saints had been deprived of protection, but the fruit is no lay precious and delicious to artist. He realized, as the historian John Wilson has noted, that citizens can only make constitutional principles work by entering the political arena. By the time he wrote, Joseph had conceived a strategy for the saints to claim their rights, the story of persecution had to be told. He urged the people to gather the facts and present the whole concatenation of diabolical ill rascality and nefarious and murderous impositions that have been practiced upon this people that we may not only publish to all the world but present them to the heads of the government in all their dark and hellish hue. The story would appeal to potential friends who might support the Mormons even if they were skeptical about Mormon beliefs. Joseph thought that the Mormons constituted only a fraction of the Missourians, probably basing his hopes on sympathetic newspaper accounts, and that the number of sympathizers had grown. As nigh as we can learn the public mind has been for a long time turning in our favor and the majority is now friendly. Rallying the support of sympathetic non-Mormons might persuade the government to grant justice to the saints. Ironically, persecution moderated the saints' relationship with the rest of the world. For conversion purposes, the errors in other religions could be emphasized, but for political purposes, goodwill was more important. Potential friends had to be treated respectfully. In the Liberty Letter, Joseph urged the saints to respect other religious beliefs. He had never advocated forceful imposition of Mormonism, but here he said Mormons must guard against becoming antagonistic or aggressive. They must be aware of those prejudices which sometimes so strongly presented themselves and are so congenial to human nature against our neighbors friends and brethren of the world who choose to differ with us in opinion and in matters of faith. These people, Joseph reminded the saints had every right to their own beliefs. Our religion is between us and our God their religion is between them and their God. Of course, 
common faith bound the saints firmly to one another, but our faith gives scope to the mind which enables us to conduct ourselves with greater liberality toward all others that are not of our faith than what they exercise towards one another. Toleration and respect approximate nearer to the mind of God. While in prison, Joseph mulled over the problems of the past year. The Missourians were to blame, of course, but he now saw that the church had erred, and he had made mistakes himself. The wrong men had gained the upper hand, an aspiring spirit has oftentimes urged men forwards to make foul speeches and influence the church to reject milder counsels and has eventually been the means of bringing much death and sorrow upon the church. He did not say which speeches he now considered foul but he saw that undue militants had brought death and sorrow. The rejected milder counsels were presumably his. He had mistakenly yielded to those who favored vile measures. Thinking of the Danites, Joseph cautioned against the organization of bands or companies by covenant or oaths by penalities or secrecies, which weakened pure friendship. Joseph resolved not to repeat his own errors. He pledged himself to disapprobate everything that is not in accordance with the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and is not of a bold and frank and an upright nature. From now on, he promised, the leaders will not hold their peace as in times past when they see iniquity beginning to rear its head for fear of traitors or the consequences that shall flow by reproving those who creep in unawares. They would reprove without fear of offense. Henceforth, he would be always ready to obey the truth without having men's persons in admiration. Apart from the leader's mistakes, Joseph saw that the church had been in error. The tone and spirit of their meetings had been unworthy. Beware, he warned, of a fanciful and flowery and heated imagination, perhaps a reference to Sidney Rigdon. The things of God are of deep import in time and experience and careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts can only find them out. Joseph was trying to define an emotional posture suitable for the pursuit of divine knowledge. What was the right walk for a man officiating in the priesthood? Thy mind O man, if thou wilt lead a soul unto salvation must stretch as high as the utmost heavens, and search into and contemplate the lowest considerations of the darkest abyss. The saints had to rise to their revelations. How much more dignified and noble are the thoughts of God, than the vain imaginations of the human heart which were too often ignoble and crude. How vain and trifling, have been our spirits, our conference our counsels, Joseph wrote, to low to mean to vulgar to condescending, for the dignified characters of the called and chosen of God. As a poor man from a poor family, Joseph was sensitive about inequality. He worried that some saints tried to raise themselves above the rest while neglecting the poor. Remember those in bondage and in heaviness and in deep affliction he urged them. Those who aspire after their own aggrandizement and seek their own opulence while their brethren are grinning in poverty cannot benefit from the Holy Spirit. We ought at all times to be very careful that such high-mindedness never have place in our halts but condescend to men of low estate and with all long-suffering bear the infirmities of the weak. The things of this world and aspiring to the honors of men corrupted the priesthood. Repairing their mistakes, however, did not deal with the underlying question. Why had God allowed the Missourians to abuse the saints? If this was his work, where was he? The succession of failures, beginning with Jackson County and continuing through the far west surrender, was too much for John Corrill, the steady, clear-headed Missouri leader. At the end of his 1839 account of early Mormonism, Corrill explained why he abandoned the movement, when I retrace our track, and view the doings of the church for six years past. I can see nothing that convinces me that God has been our leader, calculation after calculation has failed, and plan after plan has been overthrown, and our prophet seemed not to know the event till too late. If he said go up and prosper, still we did not prosper, but have labored and toiled, and waded through trials, difficulties, and temptations, of various kinds, in hope of deliverance. But no deliverance came. Everything Coril said was true. The great work had met defeat after defeat. None of the Mormon settlements had lasted in Ohio or Missouri. Joseph's seven-year stay in Kirtland was the longest in any gathering place. At Far West, the saints survived barely two years. The gathering led to one disaster after another, as local citizens turned against the expanding Mormon population. Joseph lost old friends and trusted supporters. Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, Frederick G. Williams, William W. Phelps, Orson Hyde, Martin Harris, and Thomas B. Marshall left him in 1838, 
worn down by failures and perceived missteps. Six of the seven, all but Whitmer, returned to the church before they died, and Phelps and Hyde within a few months. But the events of 1838 brought these faithful souls to the breaking point. In March 1839, as Joseph was about to be tried for his life, the demoralized saints were strung between Far West and Illinois. If ever there was a moment to give up the cause, this was it. Joseph puzzled over the saints suffering in the cause of God. Why had they been defeated? He never questioned his own revelations, never doubted the validity of the commandments. He did not wonder if he had been mistaken in sending the saints to Missouri or acquiring them together. He questioned God's disappearance. Where was he when the saints needed him? O oh God where art thou and where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? How long shall thy hand be stayed? Joseph asked the question over and over. He had assured the saints early in his imprisonment that God was with them in their afflictions. Yet he asked again in the Liberty Jail letter, How long shall they suffer these wrongs and unlawful oppressions before thine heart shall be softened towards them and thy bowels be moved with compassion? One long passage near the end of the letter turned the raw Missouri experience into a theology of suffering. The passage interwove Joseph's ongoing feelings about his own past with the struggle in Missouri. The opening sentence, The ends of the earth shall inquire after thy name and fools shall have thee in derision, was the way he felt about his life from boyhood. He was both noted and derided. He and his family had felt the sting of social insult from their time in the Palmyra cabin and now more than ever he was publicly scorned. But in the very next line was the answer, The pure in heart and the wise and the noble and the virtuous shall seek counsel and authority and blessings constantly from under thy hand. He would be honored and respected in the society he was creating himself, a society composed of the virtuous and wise. Traitors and enemies tore at this fabric and tried to wrest this society from him but only for a small moment and thy voice shall be more terrible in the midst of thine enemies than the fierce lion. Meanwhile he would pass through tribulation, be put in peril, accused falsely, torn from his family, cast into the pit, sentenced to death, and all nature conspire against him. And why? If fierce winds become thine enemy if the heavens gather blackness and all the elements combine to hedge up the way and above all if the very jaws of hell shall gape open her mouth wide after thee know thou my son that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The abuse, the injustice, the horror all were for experience. The son of man hath descended below the more art thou greater than he? Christ had gone through worse and so Joseph must submit to. The voice of God told him to endure it well. Experience was an unusual word to answer the problem of evil. Nothing was said about purification, or the greater glory of God, or redemption. The word experience suggested life was a passage. The enduring human personality was being tested. Experience instructed. Life was not just a place to shed one's sins but a place to deepen comprehension by descending below them all. The Missouri tribulations were a training ground. And for what? Experience implied a future elevation or condition. An earlier revelation said the saints must needs be chastened, and tried, even as Abraham when commanded to offer Isaac, for all those who will not endure chastening, but deny me cannot be sanctified. Joseph did not use the term here, but the reasoning brought back into view the earlier word fullness. In an earlier revelation, Joseph wrote that humans grew from grace to grace like Christ. Here growth into a fullness comes from suffering. Those who would be like Christ must suffer like Christ. Return the day after dictating the letter to the church, Joseph answered a letter from his affectionate wife. Emma had written, her hands stiffened with hard work and heart convulsed with intense anxiety, concluding, I hope there is better days to come to us yet. In reply, Joseph promised that if God will spare my life once more to have the privilege of taking care of you I will ease your care and endeavor to comfort your heart. He spoke of the children and of his dog, Old Major. At this low point, he could promise little. If the heavens linger it is nothing to me I must stir my bark safe which I intend to do. He closed yours forever, adding a pitiful postscript, Dear Emma do you think that my being cast into prison by the mob renders me less worthy of your friendship? By early April, the prisoners had learned that they would be transferred to Davis County for the long-awaited trial and then to some southern county where a less prejudiced jury could be assembled for the final trial. Writing Emma, Joseph was unsure what to expect but knew we cannot get into a worse hole than this is. He thought of her and the children continually. I would gladly walk from here to you barefoot, 
and bareheaded, and half naked, to see you. You should not let those little fellows, fidget me, tell them further loves them with a perfect love. But after these assurances of devotion, he again struck an uncertain note, I find no fault with you, at all I know nothing but what you have done the best you could, if there is anything it is known to yourself, you must be your own judge. If either of us have done wrong it is wise in us to repent of it, and for God's sake, do not be so foolish as to yield to the flattery of the devil, falsehoods, and vainly, in this hour of trouble, that our affections be drawn, away from the right objects. Joseph gave no indication what was worrying him. He said only, my heart has often been exceeding sorrowful when I have thought of these things. Emma, he urged, should not be self-willed, neither harbour a spirit of revenge, but against whom or what he did not say. Please, he begged, never give up an old tried friend, who has waded through all manner of toil, for your sake, and throw him away because fools may tell you he has some faults. He spoke as if Emma harboured resentment against him. At this point, the manuscript page is torn away. On April 6, Joseph and the other prisoners left Liberty Jail, under a 15-man guard, arriving in Gillette two days later. On April 10, a grand jury met in the front rooms of Elisha Creek Moore's house. It returned indictments for arson, riot, burglary, treason, and receiving stolen goods. Judge Thomas C. Birch agreed to a change of venue to Boone County and the prisoners set off for Columbia in a two-horse wagon with Sheriff William Morgan of Davis County and four guards. While traveling east through Chariton County, the prisoners escaped, perhaps with the guards' connivance. The prisoners had long suspected they were an embarrassment to the state because the vigilante action and Boggs's extermination order would cause a scandal if widely publicized. At the same time, the prisoners believed the mob still sought to lynch them, whatever the outcome of the trial. Considering themselves prisoners of war in a hostile country, they had attempted escapes before, this time they succeeded. Hiram said Sheriff Morgan agreed to get drunk and look the other way. With two horses they had recently purchased, the five men headed for Illinois, traveling the back roads under assumed names. On April 22, 1839, they arrived in Quincy. After nearly six months of separation, Joseph and Emma were reunited. One of the new apostles, Wilford Woodruff, noted in his journal that Brother Joseph greeted us with great joy was frank open and familiar as usual. Sister Emma was truly happy. In Joseph's absence, several leaders questioned the advisability of gathering the saints after the disaster in Missouri. Gathering aroused antagonism. Shouldn't they settle in scattered smaller groups rather than in a single large city? The leaders' uncertainty about an overall strategy prevented them from contracting for land while Joseph was in prison. With his return in late April, debate ceased. Joseph later said, I cried Lord what will thou have me to do? And the answer was build up a city and call my saints to this place two days after his arrival, a council commissioned him to locate land in Iowa on the west bank of the Mississippi and urged the saints to move to the town of Commerce on the Illinois side. The saints were to gather as before, with Commerce at the center. For months, Mormon leaders had been negotiating for property. Besides Commerce, the most likely site was directly across the Mississippi and Lee County, Iowa where Isaac Gilland, a local editor, purported doctor, and land dealer, owned a large tract. Joseph was drawn to Gilland's proposal of 20,000 acres for $2 an acre with nothing down and the payments stretched over 20 years. To an impoverished people, those terms seemed heaven sent. The land could be occupied without raising cash, and the debt paid off later as farms became productive. Gilland presented himself as a friend to the church. Besides offering favorable terms, he wrote to the governor and the attorney general of Iowa, asking that the saints be treated fairly. Joseph wrote Gilland a long letter from prison about Mormon beliefs, and in July, he was baptized. Whether this was to ingratiate himself with potential customers or out of sincere belief is unclear. Gilland offered the saints easy terms because his title to the Iowa land was clouded and was not settled until the United States Supreme Court intervened in 1850. Gilland was selling part of the 119 thousand acre half-breed tract designated by Congress in 1824 for the abandoned children of Indian women and white trappers, traders, and soldiers. Under pressure from speculators, Congress permitted half-breeds to sell their property, resulting in many conflicting claims. The legislature of the Wisconsin Territory, where the tract was once located, 
appointed a commission to settle the title controversies, but Congress organized the Iowa Territory in 1838, and with the tract in the new jurisdiction, the commission was dissolved. Miffed by their dismissal, the old commission members sued for pay in the form of land titles from the tract, complicating the picture. When the Mormons signed the contract, so many claimants were vying for the land, Glenn scarcely could be said to own it. Joseph appointed a stake of Zion in Lee County, Iowa, naming it Zaranla after the Book of Mormon City, but the settlement never flourished. Migrants avoided the dubious titles and were rebuffed by the previously settled Iowans. The largest Mormon growth occurred across the river in Hancock County, Illinois. The Mormons were attracted to a two-mile-long peninsula jutting into the Mississippi River on an arc just north of the Des Moines Rapids near Cokeuke. Iowa. The site had long been considered a promising place for a commercial town because of its proximity to the rapids, a natural point for upriver trade. The town laid out there was named Commerce. For steamboat navigation, the Mississippi was divided into three legs. The first leg, extending from New Orleans to Street Louis, allowed for large cargoes on big steamboats from the Louisiana Gulf. The second segment, from Street Louis to the Des Moines Rapids, was dominated by the river Port Quincy where pork and corn flowed for transport in smaller vessels to Street Louis and Southern Ports downstream. The third leg extended from the 12 mile Des Moines Rapids to the lead mines round Galena in northwest Illinois, because navigation over the rapids was only possible at certain seasons. Commerce had the potential to become the leading port of this third leg, comparable to Quincy just downstream, because bluffs came down to the river's edge on the Illinois side, the peninsula. The only land at water level for miles, was an attractive site for a port. Seeing the potential, visionaries founded the town of Commerce in 1824. Two Connecticut speculators, Horace Hotchkiss and John Gillett, platted a second town, Commerce City, alongside the first. Joseph first bought land on the peninsula from Gilland and a farmer named Hugh White. Through the summer Joseph also entered into contracts with Hotchkiss and Gillett for 500 additional acres including all of Commerce City and most of Commerce. Eventually the church owned all but 125 acres of the peninsula. Hotchkiss and Gillett offered sound titles but at a high price. Even though land was not moving during the Depression following the Panic of 1837, Hotchkiss drove a hard bargain. The total cost, including interest of 8%, came to $114,500 dollars to be paid over 20 years at a rate of 3 thousand dollars a year most years with balloon payments of twenty six thousand comma two hundred and fifty dollars at the tenth year and twenty five thousand dollars at the twentieth the burden of that debt weighed on joseph through most of his norvu years he originally hoped to pay much of it through donations enabling him to provide town lots for the poor at a minimal cost when donations fell short he was forced to repay the loan through land sales which meant that the financial solvency of the church depended on high immigration rates. To concentrate the population in Norvu, Joseph eventually closed down seven stakes he had planned elsewhere in Illinois and urged all the saints to come to the stakes at Norvu and Zarahla. The Norvu landscape did not captivate Joseph as Independence and Far West had done. Instead of rhapsodizing about the Garden of Nature on the banks of the Mississippi, his history said the place was literally a wilderness with only one stone house and three log houses. The land was mostly covered with trees and bushes, and much of it so wet that it was with the utmost difficulty a footman could get through and totally impossible for teams. Water seeping out of the bluffs along the eastern edge of the Marcy Peninsula required the saints to dig a drainage canal, and even then the land was too wet to permit cellars. The wet spots and the nearby river were a breeding ground for mosquitoes. Commerce was so unhealthy, Joseph's history said. Very few could live there. The saints suffered from a terrible plague of malaria in 1839, and the next two summers were even worse. Joseph did not invest any of this landscape with religious history as he had in Far West, where Adam was said to have dwelt, nor did he call Norvu Zion as he had Far West. Even though he was giving up the campaign to recover Jackson County, Norvu was not an equivalent. It was called a stake of Zion, like Kirtland or Zaramla not Zion itself. The most enthusiasm he could muster when proposing a stake at Commerce was to say he believed it to be a good location, and well adapted to the circumstances of the saints. Yet here, in this compromise location, Joseph built his most successful city. As his history put it, 
no more eligible place presenting itself I considered it wisdom to make an attempt to build up a city. He laid out a plat roughly on the pattern of the previous cities of Zion but without a central public square at Water and Main, two broader streets that crossed near the lower end of the peninsula, Joseph eventually built a store, a hotel, and a mansion to mark the commercial and cultural center of the city. Within five years, the population would grow to 15 thousand in Norvu and the immediate vicinity. When Joseph died in 1844, Norvu was as large as Chicago. For at least a month after his escape from Missouri, Joseph's energies were depleted from his long imprisonment. Hiram spoke for all the prisoners when he wrote that I feel my body broken down and my health very much impaired. For ten days that month, Joseph traveled around the countryside just visiting the scattered saints. In mid-July, malaria struck and for weeks he ministered to ailing Mormons, anointing their heads with oil and laying on his hands to bless them. The disease struck Joseph too. On one memorable day, he forced himself to rise and set out to heal the suffering saints. Wilford Woodruff noted, there was many sick among the saints on both sides of the river and Joseph went through the midst of them taking them by the hand and in a loud voice commanding them in the name of Jesus Christ to arise from their beds and be made whole and they leapt from their beds made whole by the power of God. El Darela Gafordham was one among the number and he with the rest of the sick rose from his bed and followed Joseph from house to house and it was truly a time of rejoicing. Joseph kept thinking the disease was dissipating but it dragged on until September. Woodruff took a course of Thomsonian medicine, a healing system based on the belief that the stomach determined one's health. The body could be healed by emptying and warming the stomach, so Woodruff took emetics and steamed 15 minutes in order to cleanse my system. Joseph later preached a sermon against the belief that only the wicked suffer from disease. It is an unhallowed principle to say that such and such have transgressed because they have been preyed upon by disease or death for all flesh is subject to death. He had seen too many good people suffer to believe otherwise. Through the summer, Joseph and Emma and the four children occupied a log house in commerce with one room on the ground floor and one room above. Joseph's parents lived in the summer kitchen which was connected to the house by a shared roof. Even these limited quarters were filled with guests. During the malaria epidemic, sick families moved in with the Smiths, sleeping in bedrolls on the floor, forcing Joseph and Emma to move outside into a tent. The High Council, sympathetic to Emma, voted in October that the Smiths be exempt from receiving in future such crowds of visitors as have formerly thronged his house. The Twelve a non-Mormon attorney who was acquainted with Joseph during the prison months said that he possessed the most indomitable perseverance. The Twelve learned the truth of this observation when Joseph required them to leave for England as commanded in a revelation, even though the Mormon war left their families in a desperate plight. All of them lost property and were struggling to gain a foothold in Iowa or Illinois. Joseph needed their help more than ever. But the commandment had to be obeyed. Heber Kimball had spent nearly a year in Great Britain in 1837 and 1838, assisting in baptizing some 1500 converts, and during the good times in Missouri, Joseph planned to send a larger contingent of apostles and missionaries. Now, when a new city was getting started and strong leaders were needed more than ever, Joseph sent away his most trusted followers to fulfill a revelation. The revelation had instructed the twelve to leave from the town square at Far West on April 26, 1839, easy enough when the saints controlled the place. After the expulsion, a visiting Mormon risked his life by entering the state. Joseph told the twelve they must obey anyway, and they did, leaving Illinois secretly on April 17. Seven of the twelve apostles and about twenty church members stole into the deserted Far West Square before dawn on April 26 and conducted their business. The council excommunicated nearly three dozen dissenters who had testified against the church leadership or abandoned the saints. Two new apostles were ordained. Alpheus Cutler, the Far West Temple's master builder, supervised the placement of a foundation stone and each apostle prayed in order of his seniority in the quorum. Then everyone slipped away in the early morning light. For the next three months, Joseph instructed the men who would go to Britain. After a two-year hiatus, the flow of doctrine began again, perhaps because of poor record-keeping, 
it appeared that Joseph had stopped revealing doctrine after the Kirtland Temple dedication in 1836. Nothing of note was added to the corpus of beliefs or to ceremonial practices in 1837 or 1838. But a letter from Liberty Jail noted that I never have had opportunity to give them the church the plan that God has revealed to me as if he was storing up revelations. When Joseph met with the Twelve in 1839, the newly appointed apostles John Taylor and Wilford Woodruff began taking notes. Their records show a prophet whose mind still overflowed with information about heaven and God, though he seemed wary of telling all he was thinking. Church members had to be prepared first. He told the Twelve everything revealed to him would be revealed to them, and even the least saint may know all things as fast as he is able to. Bear them. Joseph spoke to the twelve about angels with an easy familiarity that must have thrilled his hearers. He told the apostles that when an angel of God appears unto man face to face in personage and reaches out his hand unto the man and he takes hold of the angel's hand and feels a substance the same as one man would in shaking hands with another he may then know that it is an angel of God. An angel's hand could be felt because angels are resurrected. An angel of the devil, who never had a body, will extend his hand but when one grasps it nothing will be felt. Thus, he may be detected. The instructions implied that the twelve would find this rule useful when angels appear to them. Joseph's theology was as independent and idiosyncratic as ever. A sermon in June set out to address the Christian doctrine of election, traditionally a problematic theological principle that raised the question of how to reconcile God's election with the moral agency of human beings. If God decreed who was to be saved, what part did human effort play? Joseph's sermon, instead of proposing an answer, finessed moral agency and discoursed instead on the Holy Ghost. In Joseph's version, election was about how the Holy Ghost changed one's composition. The problem for him was how Gentiles became Israelites. The Holy Ghost, which, he explained, had no other effect than pure intelligence affected Israelites and Gentiles differently. The Holy Ghost is more powerful in expanding the mind enlightening the understanding and storing the intellect with present knowledge of a man who is of the literal seed of Abraham than one that is a Gentile. Working in non-Israelites, the Holy Ghost had first to purge out the old blood and make him actually of the seed of Abraham before the intelligence could flow. Election in Joseph's mind involved adoption into Abraham's progeny and gaining the resulting blessings of intelligence. Nothing was said about divine decrees or the place of good works in salvation. He did cite the scriptural phrases about making your calling an election sure, and being sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, along with John's reference to another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. The second comforter, he explained, came to those who hungered and thirsted after righteousness and lived by every word of God. Receiving that second comforter made one's calling and election sure. When believers had shown themselves determined to serve him at all hazard, then they would receive the other comforter, no more or less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When any man obtains this last comforter he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him or appear unto him from time to time. Joseph's long quest to prepare his people to see the face of God appears here again in the form of Christ dwelling with a believer. He will manifest the further unto him and they will take up their abode with him, and the visions of the heavens will be opened unto him and the Lord will teach him face to face and he may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. That emphasis on intelligence, a perfect knowledge of the mysteries coupled with the promise that hungry souls would see Christ, was classic Joseph Smith. The day must come when no man need say to his neighbor Know ye the Lord for all shall know him from the least to the greatest. He gave tips on how to receive revelation, a person may profit by noticing the first intimation of the spirit of revelation for instance when you feel pure intelligence flowing unto you it may give you sudden strokes of ideas that by noticing it you may find it fulfilled the same day or soon and thus by learning the spirit of God and understanding it you may grow into the principle of revelation until you become perfect in Christ Jesus. Joseph's doctrine of election, unconcerned about justifying the ways of God to man, described the flow of pure intelligence to the worthy, avoiding the theological conundrums of Calvinism. The other distinctive topic that summer, Joseph's expanded view of administrative organization in heaven, had no connection to conventional Christian ideas. From the beginning of the church, he had been fascinated with administrative structures, 
especially the ranks of the priesthood and the organization of councils. The Great Priesthood Revelation of 1835 summoned up an organization that involved every priesthood holder in a Baroque elaboration of quorums and councils. In his 1839 teachings to the Twelve, Joseph tied these councils and priesthood keys to patterns in the heavens. The priesthood is an everlasting principle and existed with God from eternity. He meant that the keys and councils of the earthly church descended from the persons who governed in heaven. Adam, Joseph told the apostles, obtained the first presidency and held the keys of it. Just as the Latter-day Church had a president, Adam was president of the earth. After Adam, who was also the archangel Michael, came Noah, later known as the angel Gabriel. At some time in the future, Michael Adam, also known as the Ancient of Days, would hold a council as president of the human family where he would report to Christ on the work done on earth. As president, Adam passed along keys to those who presided under him, Noah, Moses, Elias, Peter, James, and John. They in turn conveyed the keys to the modern saints. Joseph had long taught that the order of the Latter-day Church emulated the order of the ancient church. Here he revealed the connection to heaven. The little church in commerce descended from the eternal order of the angels. Future church president John Taylor scribbled down these words as Joseph spoke to the twelve. Later, Willard Richards, another apostle, copied them into his notebook. Intellectually and spiritually, these men lived in the world Joseph created. His teachings were fresh in their minds when the twelve left in the late summer for New York City on their way to England. Brigham Young and Heber Kimball, sick with chills and fever, could scarcely crawl into their wagons and wave farewell to their wives and children. Neither blamed Joseph for imposing impossible tasks on them. They felt privileged to go. History, in his spare moments in June and July, Joseph wrote his history with his clerk, James Mulholland an Irish immigrant who had kept a scanty journal for Joseph since the previous fall. Joseph had begun the history in April 1838, starting with his birth and continuing to the reception of the gold plates in 1827. He now picked up where he had left off, carrying the account down to September 1830. After Mulholland's death in late 1839, a new clerk took over, and the history continued. Beginning in 1842 it was published serially in the church newspaper Times and Seasons. Joseph had always been conscious of making history. After 1828, he was scrupulous about writing down the revelations and tried to preserve letters. When the Mormons were leaving Missouri, Mulholland passed many church papers along to his sister-in-law and Scott who carried them for days in large handmade cotton bags fastened with bands buttoned around her waist. Scott gave them to Emma, who carried them to Illinois. When she walked across the Mississippi ice in February with two children in her arms, the bags banged against her legs. These documents were available to Joseph as he began dictating again in 1839. In some respects, he told a story he had told before. The 1838 text was written in the same register as Joseph's brief 1832 history. His first formal attempt to describe his early revelations down to 1828. Both accounts tell the story of a confused boy visited by the powers of heaven. But the 1838 and 1839 history was a new work, written in a different spirit. The 1832 account, written when Joseph was just 26, tells of a lonely adolescent occupied with spiritual agonies, trying to account for his fabulous experiences. The 1838 account has a more confident public tone. Joseph, still the perplexed youth, is also the prophet about to usher in the last dispensation. The 1838 and 1839 history marks Joseph's emergence as the preeminent figure in the Mormon story. Previously he had been reticent about his personal experiences. Judging from tracts, newspaper articles, and accounts of sermons, missionaries rarely mentioned him. But his importance grew. His life fascinated Mormons and outsiders alike. He had to account for himself to one curious traveler after another. Intrigued newspaper editors published stories about him. In 1843 he was the subject of a biography. Joseph opened his 1838 history with a reference to the many reports which have been put in circulation by evil disposed and designing persons. He was news. In the 1838 history, Joseph attempted to set the story straight and to promote the cause. Moroni had told him that his name should be known for good and evil among all that nation's kindreds and tongues. As prophesied, he had become a celebrity. Now he turned his story to the advantage of the church. It would be years, however, 
before Joseph's story would become part of the missionary message. When he sent the twelve to England in the summer of 1839, Joseph said nothing of himself in their instructions, save for reminding them that if they suffered, he had suffered too. He was more concerned with developing the twelve into an effective working unit. Joseph cautioned them to forgive one another and be merciful. Don't seek to excel one above another but act for each other's good and honorably make mention of each other's name in our prayers. He did not want the quorum to deteriorate under Brigham Young, as it had under Thomas Marsh. Joseph seemed to understand that the genius of the church lay in the extension of his power to this quorum and to the hundreds of elders teaching in cities and towns all over the country. He wanted to extend his work through the world, not his own personage. By working through the twelve, he multiplied himself, and they extended their reach through the seventy and all the other elders trudging from village to village with the Book of Mormon in their packs. The mission of the Twelve was one of many difficult undertakings that year. The defeat in Missouri notwithstanding, Joseph was still determined to build a city. As he said in his long prison letter, Our hearts do not shrink neither are our spirits altogether broken. Neither their losses nor guilt about the Davis County raids weighed them down. When the Mormons thought of Missouri, they did not remember looting houses or burning stores. They believed that they had acted solely in their own defense. They were the victims. As evidence of their sincerity, they asked for a full investigation. Let the federal government conduct an inquiry and judge for itself. The Missourians had proposed an inquiry but then pulled back when the investigating committee realized that the evidence collected was not of the character which should be desired for the basis of a fair and candid investigation. The saints had no such hesitation. In prison, Joseph had asked the Missouri Mormons to write accounts of the abuses heaped upon them. He was sure that an investigation would vindicate the saints. By the fall of 1839, he was ready to lay the case before the President of the United States. 22, Washington, September 1839 to June 1840, Smith, the prophet, remained in Washington a great part of the winter and preached often in the city. I became well acquainted with him. He was a person rather larger than ordinary stature, well proportioned, and would weigh, I presume, about 180 pounds. He was rather fleshy, but was in his appearance amiable and benevolent. He did not appear to possess any harshness or barbarity in his composition, nor did he appear to possess that great talent and boundless mind that would enable him to accomplish the wonders he performed. John Reynolds my own times, 1855 Joseph started for Washington, D.C., on October 29, 1839, riding in a two-horse carriage with Sidney Rigdon, Judge Elias Higby, and Oren Porter Rockwell. Higby, 10 years Joseph Sr., has been elected judge in Mormon Caldwell County, though he lacked formal legal training. His common sense and personal composure suited him for negotiations with Congress and the President. Rockwell, an early convert to Mormonism and zealously loyal to Joseph, would come into his own later as a Western scout, hunter, and gunman. On the Washington trip, his job was probably to protect Joseph from vengeful Missourians. Rigdon had considered a Washington visit before Joseph escaped from prison. He planned to ask state legislatures for resolutions in support of the saints, and then request reparations for the Missouri losses from Congress. He may have been thinking of an old state's rights tradition that assumed the states could pass resolutions on national issues. By fall 1839, Joseph and Higby had decided to accompany Rigdon, and, in the end, they bore the burden of the Washington mission. Rigdon suffered a recurrence of the malarial fevers from the summer epidemic making travel impossible. The party rested at Springfield for five days but then pressed on without him. Unfortunately, the letters of introduction from Illinois leaders were written for Rigdon, and he had to append endorsements for Joseph and Higby. The letter asked President Van Buren and the heads of departments to place all confidence in them as gentlemen. Rigdon caught up with the party in Columbus, Ohio, but by that time they were far behind schedule, and Joseph and Higby hurried on by stage leaving Rigdon, Rockwell, and Robert Foster, a physician who had joined them to look after Rigdon, to follow later in the carriage. Passing through the mountains in the stage, Higby and Joseph had an unnerving experience. While the driver took a glass of grog in a public house, something startled the horses and they bolted. A terrified woman, fearful the coach would roll over, 
tried to throw her baby out the window to save its life. Joseph stopped her and then opened the door and climbed along the outside to the driver's seat. Higby jumped out hoping to stop the horses but only injured himself. After a three mile run, Joseph finally brought the horses to a halt. The relieved passengers commended him for his courage, discovering at the journey's end that he was the Mormon prophet. Petitions, in Washington, Joseph and Higby found cheap accommodations at the Gadsby Hotel on 3rd Street and Missouri Avenue. By 1839, Pennsylvania Avenue had been paved with macadam, but the city was still raw. Livestock were corralled on the mall in front of the Capitol waiting their turn at the slaughterhouse. Sheep, pigs, and geese roamed the streets, as they did in most American cities. Charles Dickens, who visited the city in 1842, noted the spacious avenues that only want houses, roads, and inhabitants. Washington was still a city of unfulfilled pretensions. On November 29th, the day after their arrival, Joseph and Higby knocked on the front door of the White House. They may have had an appointment a possible reason for hurrying ahead, but in those days appointments were not necessary. The porter received guests and decided whom to admit. President Martin Van Buren, a Democrat from New York, customarily saw anyone with political influence and he doubtless knew of the influx of Mormon voters into Illinois. John Reynolds, an Illinois congressman, likewise conscious of the Mormon vote, accompanied Joseph and Higby upstairs to the parlor and made the introductions. At the White House, Joseph and Higby found a very large and splendid palace, surrounded with a splendid enclosure, decorated with all the fineries and elegancies of this world. Van Buren had redone everything during his occupancy, repainting, repapering, re-varnishing, even gilding the chandeliers. Critics later charged Van Buren with extravagance, calling the White House a palace as splendid as that of the Caesars, and as richly adorned as the proudest Asiatic mansion. Joseph and Van Buren had plain origins in common, but Van Buren, the son of a farmer turned tavern keeper, had outgrown his past. During his long career in politics, he developed a taste for high living, mingling with New York society and drinking fine wine. Small and dapper, he was well dressed and courtly in manner. Though liked by almost everyone who knew him personally, he failed to win over Joseph. Joseph asked Reynolds to introduce him as a Latter-day Saint, which brought a smile to Van Buren's face. His demeanor changed when they got down to business. After looking over the letters of introduction, the president looked up with a half frown. What can I do? I can do nothing for you. If I do anything, I shall come in contact with the whole state of Missouri. Van Buren's first reaction was political. He faced a difficult election in 1840. The Whigs would choose their candidate, William Henry Harrison, the next week, and Van Buren would be nominated by the Democratic Party in May. Missouri was one of his strongholds, and he had to calculate the political damage from helping a small, unpopular sect. Joseph and Higby did not like Van Buren not even the way he looked. In a letter home reporting their eyewitnesses of His Majesty, they derided his ordinary features, frowning brow, and considerable, but not well-proportioned, body. They were to see Van Buren two months later and hear his famous declaration about their cause being just and still he could do nothing for them, but already Joseph and Higby knew they would never vote for such a frivolous man. They turned next to the Illinois senators and congressmen who were ready to assist an influential constituent. The delegation heard the two Mormons out in one of the Capitol's committee rooms. Senator Richard Young even lent them money, which Higby repaid by crediting Young's account with a Quincy merchant. Impressed, Joseph and Higby reported that the gentlemen from Illinois are worthy men, and have treated us with the greatest kindness. Congress was less impressive. Overall they felt there was little solidity and honorable deportment among those who are sent here to represent the people but a great deal of pomposity and show. There is such niching disposition to display their oratory on the most trivial occasions, and so much etiquette, bowing and scraping, twisting and turning, to make a display of their witticism, that it seems to us rather a display of folly and show, more than substance and gravity, such as becomes a great nation like ours. The Illinois congressman helped Higby and Joseph plan their presentation to Congress. The 678 petitioners requested compensation ranging from 63 cents to $505,000 for their losses in Missouri. One congressman took the well-worn position that the Mormons should seek redress in the Missouri courts. The others saw that would not work. Ultimately, 
Senator Young offered to present the Mormon petition to the Senate in public. With their petition on its way, Joseph and Higby had no further business until the hearing. Joseph left for Philadelphia by rail about December 21 and did not return to Washington until the end of January. Growing Mormon congregations in the Middle States were eager to see the prophet. In New York, Mormon preaching had filled the thousand-seat Columbian Hall three times a Sunday. Other branches were thriving in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Joseph spent a few days in Monmouth, New Jersey, with a branch of 90, and near the end of his Pennsylvania stay preached in Brandywine, just west of Philadelphia. Joseph spoke to sophisticated general audiences as well as to the saints. In Philadelphia, he electrified an audience of 3,000 with the story of his visions and the recovery of the Book of Mormon. He was learning to adapt to his listeners. President Van Buren had asked Joseph and Higby what distinguished their faith from others. Joseph had answered that we differed in mode of baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. Higby commented that we considered that all other considerations were contained in the gift of the Holy Ghost, code for the revelations and spiritual gifts. Earlier, Joseph had presented his religion to Isaac Galland in the broadest, most liberal terms. Mormonism is truth, he told Galland, who had pretensions to some education. The first and fundamental principle of our holy religion is, that we believe that we have a right to embrace all, and every item of truth, without limitation or without being circumscribed or prohibited by the creeds or superstitious notions of men. Joseph meant new revelation but the word truth emphasized the generosity and openness of his religion compared to orthodoxies fenced in by creeds. We believe that we have a right to revelations, visions, and dreams from God, our Heavenly Father, and light and intelligence, through the gift of the Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus Christ, on all subjects pertaining to our spiritual welfare. The wording conveyed the liberation that so many early converts experienced and that made them feel progressive and forward-looking not retrograde. In Washington on February 5, Joseph spoke to a group that included an educated New Yorker, Matthew Davis, an experienced journalist. Davis expected something different from the notorious Joe Smith than what he heard. In a letter to his wife, he reported no levity, no fanaticism, no want of dignity in his deportment. Traits a pretended prophet would surely show. The recently deposed New York prophet Matthias habitually wore a green frock coat and crimson sash. Of Joseph, Davis said, in his garb there are no peculiarities, his dress being that of a plain, unpretending citizen. Joseph purchased three new suits in Washington, he is not an educated man, but he is a plain, sensible, strong-minded man. He is, by profession, a farmer, but is evidently well-read. In the Washington lecture, Joseph underscored beliefs held in common with other Christians. We teach nothing but what the Bible teaches. We believe nothing, but what is to be found in this book. He believed in the fall, but repudiated predestination and original sin. Christ washed away the sins of infants so that all were born pure and undefiled. In this liberal period, Davis was not surprised to learn that the prophet had abandoned Calvinist doctrines. But then Joseph went on to more unconventional principles. God is eternal, without beginning or end, and so is the soul of man, Joseph told them, a view that foreshadowed his radical doctrine of man becoming God. Punishment, on the other hand, since it commences in the next life, will eventually end. Davis was impressed. Nothing Joseph said in the two-hour address was calculated to impair the morals of society, or in any manner to degrade and brutalize the human species. Davis felt Joseph's precepts would soften the asperities of man towards man, and lead to more rational relationships. He had changed his opinion of the Mormons, Davis told his wife. Joseph displayed strongly a spirit of charity and forbearance. There was no violence, no fury, no denunciation. His religion appears to be the religion of meekness, lowliness, and mild persuasion. Joseph insisted more than once that all who would follow the precepts of the Bible, whether Mormon or not, would assuredly be saved. That Joseph claimed the Mormon Bible was communicated to him, direct from heaven, did not diminish Davis's admiration. If there was such a thing on earth, as the author of it, he recorded Joseph as saying, then he, Smith, was the author, but the idea that he wished to impress was, that he had bend it as dictated by God. Joseph told the audience he was no savior or worker of miracles. All this was false. He made no such pretensions. He was but a man, he said, 
a plain untutored man, seeking what he should do to be saved. Everything he says, Davis noted, is said in a manner to leave an impression that he is sincere. Another reporter from a Christian journal heard part of another address the night before to an intelligent congregation, including several members of Congress. Judging from the report, Joseph's lack of formal education did not make him diffident. The reporter wrongly guessed that he has evidently a good English education, and considered him an energetic, impassioned speaker. Because Joseph dwelt on the sufferings of the Mormons, the reporter thought he was dodging the subject of the Book of Mormon, but noted that nonetheless Joseph said he was inspired to write the Golden Bible. Others who met Joseph personally thought less of his intellectual powers than did his Washington audience. John Reynolds, the Illinois congressman who saw much of Joseph that winter, thought he lacked that great talent and boundless mind that would enable him to accomplish the wonders he performed, but neither did he appear to possess any harshness or barbarity in his composition. Peter Burnett, counsel for Joseph Smith during his imprisonment and later governor of California, thought that his appearance was not prepossessing, and his conversational powers were but ordinary. You could see at a glance that his education was very limited. He was an awkward but vehement speaker. In conversation he was slow, and used too many words to express his ideas, and would not generally go directly to a point. And still, like so many educated people who met Joseph, Burnett was impressed. With all these drawbacks, he was much more than an ordinary man. His views were so strange and striking, and his manner was so earnest, and apparently so candid, that you could not but be interested. There was a kind, familiar look about him, that pleased you. He was very courteous in discussion, readily admitting what he did not intend to controvert, and would not oppose you abruptly, but had due deference to your feelings. He had the capacity for discussing a subject in different aspects and for proposing many original views, even of ordinary matters. His sincerity and candor, Burnett thought, gave Joseph influence even with his enemies. After Joseph was arrested in 1838, Burnett saw him among a crowd of hostile Missourians, conversing freely with everyone, and seeming to be perfectly at ease. In the short space of five days, Burnett recalled, he had managed so to mollify his enemies that he could go unprotected among them without the slightest danger. Among his own followers, he was dominant. He deemed himself born to command, and he did command. By comparison, Sidney Rigdon, though a man of superior education and fine appearance, did not possess the native intellect of Smith, and lacked his determined will. Joseph stayed in Washington only a week or two in February. He saw the president again and was told definitely that nothing could be done. Joseph attributed Van Buren's timidity to political ambition, which was likely true, but the president did not have the authority under the Constitution or federal law to intervene in local disturbances unless invited to do so by the governor or a federal court officer. Van Buren's rebuff stung Joseph, and when an interview with John C. Calhoun the powerful South Carolina senator, was no more satisfactory, the prophet abandoned the capital. He wrote home his usual plaintive words of affection, My dear Emma my heart is entwined around you and those little ones. With the help of the Illinois delegation, Joseph and Higby had pared down the petition to the Senate and House, reporting losses of $2 million and appending a long litany of abuses beginning in Jackson County and going through Governor Boggs's extermination order. They pointed out the impossibility of obtaining justice among a hostile population. For ourselves we see no redress, unless it be awarded by the Congress of the United States. The petition was referred to the Senate Judiciary Committee under the chairmanship of Senator Garrett Wall of New Jersey. Since the state of Missouri was being accused of crimes against the Mormons, its delegation was invited to attend the committee's hearings. They had meanwhile written home for information and received the record of testimony at Judge Austin King's November 1838 hearings. Up to this point, the state had done nothing to justify the governor's extermination order and the Mormon memorial argued that the failure to bring extradition proceedings against Joseph was a tacit admission of the state's culpability. With its reputation in jeopardy, Missouri rushed off supporting materials to its congressmen. The Missouri delegation grounded its case as much on religious doctrines as on alleged crimes. Senator Lynn and Congressman Jameson summoned all the energies of their mind, Higby reported, to prove Joseph Smith led the people by revelation in political matters 
causing the Mormons to vote in a block. The Missourians tried to make us reasonable characters by showing that everything both civil and political among us is done by revelation. Higby insisted that this was false. Everyone exercised their right of judgment according to his better judgment, in accord with the democratic principles taught us from our infancy. If they voted together, it was for the party that defended their rights, not because the Prophet commanded them. The Missourians' stout defense put the Judiciary Committee in a dilemma. They could not rule in favor of the Mormons without a full-scale investigation of the war something the Missourians did not want and Congress could not easily accomplish. Eventually the committee retreated from a decision on the merits of the case and instead ruled that redress could only be had in the Missouri courts. It can never be presumed, the committee said, that a state either wants the power, or lacks the disposition, to redress the wrongs of its own citizens. Higby accurately called the decision a defeat. Seeking justice in the Missouri courts was futile. Higby stayed in Washington until the Senate accepted the committee's report on March 23, then headed back to Nauvoo, closing a chapter on Mormonism and Missouri. Joseph and his people would never recover their property. Not until late in the 20th century did the state of Missouri issue a formal apology for the order to expel the Mormons.